Hi parents, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Now, um, we have a very special day today for you. My name is Petra Dito from Victim to Hero. And with me today, we also have this amazing, amazing advocate. Um, you know, if you guys have been following me for a while, you probably have seen me talking about Claudia. You probably seen Claudia on here. And then there's also Rayal. Claudia is from Heroes for Children Rights and uh, Rayal is uh, from the Interference of Child Custody Coalition. Claudia is also a part of that. They also are part of Respectful, uh, Respectfully Pack. These are amazing advocates and I'm so uh, honored and so proud to have been working for them uh, with them for a long time. We've been collaborating on just so many things. And, um, and so one of the big focus that they have been working on is the interference of child custody. Um, now, interference of child custody is um, what happens when someone, usually a parent, but it can be other people, interferes or withhold or um, prevent a parent from having access to the child when it is your time to have your child, your parenting time according to a court order. So the other person is essentially violating the court order uh, and, uh, and it is against the law. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, one of the, and, and I'm not going to just kind of go into everything right now because we're going to break it down. Now, it's a very big day. Um, so, you know, like grab your coffee, grab your popcorn, whatever it is, uh, just take a break and chill. Uh, we have so much packing in today for you guys. Um, so uh we're going to have claudia and Rayal um talk uh, more into like the information about interference of child custody and then they also have a call to action for you guys that you can actually take today and it's actually a, uh, it's going to be really empowering for you to participate but it's also a fun kind of activity so they will explain that in a bit and then after that we also have a range of people that are coming on today we have a whole panel of amazing people and um, unfortunately there are cases that are heartbreaking but it's so important to share these stories so that you are aware of what is going on and how to handle uh, these kind of problems and we know that many parents uh, are not even aware of what this is about um, and you know how to deal with it and even even law uh, enforcement officers and we talked to so many people in the law enforcement the, the lawyers um, and so anyway so today we're going to have a legislator that coming in and share with us about um, the law in Texas and you know what we're working on to change the law there to improve it um, we are also going to have some um, private detective we also have law enforcement officer we have uh, a number of advocates that sharing different kind of information that you've is going to be useful to you. And then, like I mentioned, there's going to be uh, a number of parents that have lost their children and their process and what they have done to recover their children. So um, please just, you know, um, and then if you could help us by sharing this event, let us know uh, if you can hear us okay. Uh, let us know where you're calling in from and please help uh, spreading the word. I honestly can't really tell if, um, People can hear us. Uh, do I see comments in the chat room? Um, okay, I see Mikey uh, from Colorado. Melanie, uh, hi, thank you so much. Anthony, Katie. Um, Melanie and Anthony, where are you guys from? I got Payam from Florida. That's awesome. JP is from LA. Uh, I got Mara from North Carolina. Great, Payam. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, we we have the coalitions on okay you guys can hear me okay great thank you so much pennsylvania boston okay really people from everywhere this is amazing thank you so much so i'm going to pass this on to rael who is going to talk to you guys about uh what inter interference of child custody is about and things like that hi thank you petra it's so honored to be here for sure this is a, an amazing event we're super excited to get this information out um i apologize for, i can't see the comments you'll have to guys let me know right now i'm at a baseball game for my sons um and i think that that speaks to the fact that you know all the advocating that we do is possible in real life um you know i can pop into my car and come do this um if if it happens so we work really hard to try to educate parents um, or family members or anyone um, on the fact that there is a law in every state called uh, regarding custodial interference. 
So it's labeled something different in each state and some of the wording is different, but interference with child custody is illegal and it is a felony in most states, all 50 states, and it has been for many years um, since like the 1970s, each state has had this law. So we try to educate parents to get this aspect of custodial interference addressed in addition to a civil matter. So unfortunately, police officers and district attorneys are misinformed when it comes to this law. And it's just important that we get this information out so that we could share it with everyone. So on our page, Interference with Child Custody Coalition, some of the things that we do is have often, we have webinars and um, events, Zoom meetings, where we try to teach parents to advocate for their own rights. Um, we also offer services to any state that wants to start legislating. We have an amazing model here with Claudia, who's who's been doing the work, uh, you know, a year longer, and the bills in Texas are showing that. Um, you know, the movement in Texas, they have announced, they just announced yesterday that interference with Child Custody Awareness Day um, for today, which is awesome. That video is on our page and we'll have that to show. Um, but that those moves are working and we're just copying them in other states and they're working there too. So if you and your state want to um, make a change like this, we meet with the, with the state and we help them sort of get organized and learn the process and, and start making the same changes. So um, we can start, I you wanna start this, the PowerPoint or talk before Claudia. Um, today we're, we're presenting an amazing opportunity to, to win a prize, um, but also create the awareness that we need. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and, and start the PowerPoint. Um, again, I'm Claudia, I'm out of Texas. Uh, just a little bit about myself that I experienced this as well. And when I learned more about it, I got more involved um, understanding what it actually was. Cause I mean, you, you, you assume that law enforcement is gonna tell you that, tell you the right information. And when they tell you it's a civil matter and it's not, it makes you uh, start to question things and research um, the law and, and start um, asking those questions, if that's what it says, and why isn't this being enforced? Um, after learning it fairly well in Texas, I felt that um, parents across the U.S. needed to know this, because if we can have a movement here in Texas that's pretty strong, then why can't other states do it? So um, that's kind of where it started, but I started expanding a lot of what I do, and not just educating parents on enforcing this crime, but also helping educate parents on, um, on legislation, how to look out for good legislation, how to oppose bad legislation, those sort of things. And so we meet with parents often and we show them basically our strategy on how to get involved. Um, it's not as hard as you think. Um, many of us want things changed, but we, you know, we're overwhelmed and we often think that, you know, we're really not going to make that difference, but you can. We have um, met with so many parents that have just jumped on board and we have teams in, in numerous states and they talk often, they, um, you know, they collaborate with each other. Um, if you think that you can't testify in another state on a bill, you can, you can actually submit a testimony and help that state along the way. And it's just, um, it's just helping that state out. It's not every, every person for themselves. This is a movement that we need to have collaboration and affiliation and that's what we're, we've been doing. And we've been very successful in that. But back to the custodial interference again, uh, as Rael mentioned, it is a crime in every state. This has been on the books for at least over 40 years. Uh, again, like it's in the early 70s is when it started and it's kind of changed along the way, but every state has this. So um, many times when law enforcement come on board, they never knew that this kind of was, was dated so far back. And so it's been around for quite some time. Um, every state law is different. So it's it's uh, it's very important that parents understand what their statute says and if it applies to their situation, because there is particular language in every statute, um, you know, and if there's a, a law that's not working for your state, um, there are things that you can do uh, to amend that. And that's something that you can take part in by proposing an amendment um, to your legislators. But one of the key things is understanding who your legislators are. Um, before I got involved in this and started experiencing a lot of the, the family court issues, I didn't know who my legislators were. I didn't know how to search for my legislators. So um, we, we help parents identify who those, those legislators are. We help parents identify what the penal code is. Um, and we kind of walk them through this strategy and how to get more involved. Um, 
because again, parents are overwhelmed. They're traumatized by a lot of what they're going through in the family court. They, they think that nothing they do can, can change anything, but you know, you can, um, if you're willing and, and, and able to do that and put a little bit of effort into it, you can make that change. And there are so many movements out there that are, are doing things, um, you know, some are, are doing things for, for child abuse awareness and some are doing things for the equal shared parenting movement. And this is just another movement because it's all tied together when we wanna ensure that kids see the other parent as much as possible, both parents as much as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the, um, the, the PowerPoint. And again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we'll address them as much as we can. Um, so this is, let me see what I have here. All right, just bear with me because no, that's good. While you're setting while you're setting that up, um, I will just point out too. There's a difference between civil law and criminal law. So while you're starting that, that criminal law is something like when you report that your car is stolen, the police will come out, they will investigate the crime, um, which is something with someone breaking the law, and that they will then um, bring it to the district attorney and they'll prosecute it and you're just a victim of a crime. So you're, you request a offense report to have a, you know, as a victim of a crime versus the civil where you need an attorney and you go to family court and, and you present your side and someone makes a decision. Okay. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a proclamation to read um, in addition to our child advocacy that uh, this month, excuse me, today, um, we're recognizing interference with child custody awareness. And I would like to read the following proclamation. Where, whereas Heroes for Children's Rights will observe interference with child custody awareness day, on April 8th, 2023, to promote public understanding of family violence through the use of a child and increase awareness of law enforcement to support the victims of this crime. And whereas custodial interference deprives children of the right to love and be loved by their whole family, resulting in a negative social psychological impact on children, and as such, is considered a form of child abuse. And whereas trusted adults in a child's life, that includes doctors, therapists, teachers, school staff, coaches, and law enforcement be willing to speak out and question alienating behaviors such as withholding and inter um so it pause right now i i think um, and I don't think it's quite finished. And for some reason, the video is also not playing. Um, can we try again? Maybe reshare your screen. Yeah, it was. I can see, see screen. her screen, and I think it is showing. Yeah, it is showing on the page, but I, it's paused. Oh, I paused it now. Do I need to play it again? Oh, you just pause it? Because it's yeah, interrupted I, in the middle. Oh, no, it was playing for me. Do I need to replay it again? Um, let's try it. And even when you were playing, it was not playing. Like We can hear the audio, but the video was not playing. Proclamation to read. Um, okay. No, so, that? so no, stop that. Yeah, no, the video is not playing. Um, is the video playing for you? For me, it is. Oh, um, is it playing for you, Rayel? No. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, even Melissa in the chat room said it's um, it, there's a, there was a problem. Thank you so much, you guys, for letting us know. And then Samantha also said the audio is cut out. Uh, JP said it's not playing for us. Uh, we couldn't hear the whole thing. Um, um, Jennifer said, does it also include judges getting charged with it? Uh, uh, I don't think I understand your question because a judge is the one that created that court order. Um, so I don't understand how a judge, like, I don't understand what it means by your question. Catherine said the end was cutting off. Okay, I think that's better, Claudia. It looks like it would play now if you were to play it. I'm gonna just shut up now. 
Okay. I have a proclamation to read um, in addition to our child advocate. Can you hear that? that uh, I'm, I'm month, sorry. Can we, hold on. So, could we maximize that video? See at the bottom, right? Yeah. Could we do that? Yes. I have a Can you hear it now? Um, no, 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 but it's not showing. It's too small. Okay. We, we can't yeah. really see that video. This like, okay. is there any way um, for you to just show the whole thing or no? Okay, it's up, it's up to you. That's okay. Did you start the slideshow and then maximize it? No, the slide is maximized now. In addition to okay. our job. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, I think it's okay. Like, just go ahead and do what you just did right now. I think it's better anyway. Um, oh, the advocacy that uh, this month, excuse me, today, um, we're recognizing interference with child fairness. And I would like to read the following proclamation. Where, whereas Heroes for Wait, Children. Your, your video is not showing at all. Like, you're not sharing right now. Okay. Um, thank you so much, parents, for being so patient with us. <laughs> we, yeah, we knew that would be a Yes, um, I'll put it in. I'll I'll, I'll kind of get it um, sorted out. But in the meantime, we're just going to continue with the PowerPoint, and I won't play the video. We'll just kind of go forward. Okay. Hold on, Justice. Um, okay. All right. So I, I do see Jennifer question now saying, can currently corrupt judges be charged if they interfere with custody and cause trauma to a whole family? Um, now, uh, judges have certain immunity. So to, to prove that a judge is corrupted, if you could prove that, then that's one thing. Uh, if you believe that he or she is corrupted, but if you're not able to prove that, that's a different story, but yes, if you can can prove that, then I guess, and that's a, you know, that's definitely something you should pursue uh, through the criminal court. Um, okay, go ahead. All right, can can you see our slides? Okay, so what we're we're going to start off with is giving a, a little um, understanding of some of the most common questions that we get. Uh, the first being, what is custodial interference? Did you know that it's not a civil matter? Why is it important and what can you do? And here was our press release um, that we, we did in January. Um, we we're getting a little bit more affiliated and um, a little bit more organized with our facts and, and what, we were, um, what we were deciding to do moving forward. So here are some facts. And Ryle, if you want to step in at any time, let me, let me know. Um, did you know that parental abduction is a severe oh, form? I'm sorry, the, the slide's not updated. Um, I, was say, I, I don't see it. I oh, only really see the first page. Okay, hold on just a second. Katie, if you can prove it, then yeah, I, 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 I mean, I'm not a lawyer. It's not, this is, actually, by the way, none of this is meant to be legal advice or professional advice. This is simply advocates that sharing experiences. So definitely get your professional advice uh, for this sort of thing. But yes, if you can prove it, I really think that you should pursue it. Um, it's important because it's not just for you, but for many parents out there, many children out there, obviously. Okay, go ahead, Claudia. Okay, just a second. Am I still on the first slide or on the second slide? I'm having my own. I'm seeing facts. Did you know? Oh, 
Okay, the slides disappear again. Yeah, I'm having some technical difficulties on my end. Okay, I think Rayel can also share the slides now. Do you want to do that? Yeah, and, and something I wanted to point out while she's doing that is a lot of this information you can find, you know, through research. So as Petra mentioned, we're not attorneys. However, a lot of this information is what we found through resources uh, such as uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, the Department of Justice have, have put out information, that sort of thing. So there is a lot out there that you can um, um, look up for yourselves if you're you know, interested in a little bit more uh, of the research for your state. And again, I'm sorry, I had some technical difficulties. Rael's really good at this stuff, so. Um, Robert, yes, this is recorded, so you can watch it again later. Um, and yes, you, you should definitely reach out to Claudia and Rael to talk about your case. Um, they are available, they, they are there, very super supportive, so definitely reach out. Can you guys see my screen here yes. on this? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So let's play this. Let me know if we lose it. Is that on this device maybe? Hold on one second. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have played it. No, you're good. Okay, here we go. So I'm not going to press play because I don't know. Okay. Um, so, number one, uh, what is custodial interference? These are the things we're going to go through in these slides quickly and get to the important stuff where you can um, get the word out. So what is custodial interference? Did you know that it's not a civil matter? Why is it important and what can you do about it? And that's um, a little bit about our, our organization, the Interference with Child Custody Coalition and the things that we do there. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so these are some facts that are just as astounding um, that parental, now this is from the National Center for Faith and the um, Missing and Exploited Children uh, have all, and the Department of Justice have all said this for years that parental abduction is just a severe form of custodial interference. Um, between 2016 and 2020, only 23% of child abductors even had state warrants issued against them. Um, only less, less than 1% of abdu abductions are by strangers. There are over 90% of child abductions that are from the other parent. Um, and 10 months is the average time between a child missing and the time that a state gets around to getting a warrant for their arrest. Um, Claudia, do you want to you want to like switch sides? Do you want to take turns? Or oh, no, go ahead. Okay. You can keep going. Yeah. All right. Um, there's all different types of custodial interference. So depending on your law depends in how it's worded in your state, then that depends what, what's illegal in your state. But the, all different types of custodial interference um, in numerous forms. But it's any interruption to the custody arrangements by either the custodian or another individual is a violation of legal and human rights. Some common examples of custodial interference would be failing to return the child on time following a scheduled visitation, removing or denying the child's medical and or academic information, keeping the child from communicating with the other parent, taking the child without the approval of the other parent, whether from the other parent's home or abroad, speaking negatively about the other parent in order to detach a child from them, denying the other parent's visitation rights or unauthorized visits during the other parent's designated time. So how many states have this law? All 50. All 50 states have a law and most of them are felonies in the United States. 
2021, the U.S. Department of Justice reports that as many as 200,000 uh, 200, children are victims of family abduction each year. The truth is that family abduction can be as physically dangerous and even deadly for the child victims as any other form of abductions. Cases like in Pennsylvania, Caden Mancuso, and in Florida, Grayson Kessler, that were two cases where the parents tried to enforce custodial interference and it was refused and denied and it wound up leading to the children's murder. And now each law, each state is trying to come up with laws um, modeled after the Violence Against Women Act and Keita Mancuso's case. Um, but these cases might've turned out very differently if police would have enforced them when they were initially requested. Um, because April is Child Abuse Awareness Month, we want everyone to know that custodial interference is a major problem and it is child abuse. How can you help? With a little help from your smartphone. So we're gonna ask all of you guys to send off at least an email um, to share this link far and wide and share it with family and friends. Here, we're asking you to send emails to people like your local police department, your legislators, your district attorney, your um, sheriff's office, the police chief, those kind of people that are in the criminal justice system that really need to be aware of these facts. Um, so the first thing you need to do if you don't know who your representative is, is you can go to um, this link. We're going to give you the website to click on so that you can go and all these links are attached. But first, we're just going to go through the steps. So identify your reps on a, on a site like openstates.org, where you type in your address and your federal legislators will come up as well as your state representative and your state senator. Um, then we're going to ask that you find your state penal codes if you're not sure. So a penal code is the same thing that stands for a statute or a law. In Pennsylvania, custodial interference is 2904. In Texas, it's 25.03. So each state has a different number or code and you can find them going to that, that download link. Um, and we're going to present a template and we're gonna ask that you just copy that template, send off the emails to as many people as possible CC us at respectfullypack at gmail.com. Or if it's on a online submission form, you can screenshot it and send it or send the confirmation that you sent it. And we'll tally up and the person, the people that send the most emails of awareness from our template is going to get a prize um, that we'll be mailing to you. So if you go to Hero, Heroes for Children's, oh, I'm just going to open here. That's fine. Um, hero for heroes for children's rights dot org. Um, you know, Rayel, I think I'm going to try to share that. Give me a second. I think um, because I think parents uh, is it looked too small. too small for parents. So I'm going to attempt to share this and see if I can make it bigger. Uh, all right. Share screen for me. Let's see this. Okay. Um, this is truly how advocacy works. Everybody helping out, and we'll get it figured out, get the information out. Thank you. All right. Uh, parents, can you see my screen now or no? Let me see if I can. Can okay, you guys can... see my screen? Like, can you see it bigger I can, now? I, I can see the screenshot. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, I don't see it updated on the stream. Um, like you can see it bigger on the screen now, right, you guys? Okay, okay, parents said yes, so I'm glad. Okay, thank you. It's somehow not showing for me. All right, so yeah, so this is the information right here, and um, Rayel, go ahead if you wanted to say anything else, yeah. Oh, okay, no, I was gonna just show them. If you could go to the Heroes for Children's Rights link, and then we can walk through it right there. All the information is on that page. So you can just type in heroesforchildrensrights.org and go to the page yourself. We can, we can put the link in there. Mine's open, there we go, mine's loading. Petra, are you gonna go to that page or should I? Yeah, I can, oh. I can also share it if needed. 
I think I okay, have which it page? Up. Which page do you want me to go to? Here, here, heroes for okay, children's yes. rights. Oh, okay, yeah. Just one second. So uh, just really quick, what like what Rael mentioned, this is um, a challenge because oftentimes, you know, we'll we'll take on awareness campaigns and it may be a um, changing your light bulb on your porch to a certain color to draw some attention to a, a certain awareness campaign or a certain movement or we'll put a ribbon around a tree to, uh, you know, do the same thing, bring awareness to a certain cause. Uh, but what we wanted to do would be something a little bit more um, of a call to action where parents are actually, you know, taking part in doing something. And if it means sending off an email to your legislators after you identify who they are, um, that would be a little bit more of an effort that come Monday morning when they, you know, log on to their their um, their emails, they'll see an email from a parent or grandparent or aunt or uncle you know, that this is a problem. And that's that's the whole focus of our awareness campaign is it's not just about that light bulb that's turning on. It's actually about taking some form of action to do something. And it's very meaningful. A lot of us get involved in this after our experiences because it's become a meaningful uh, thing to to change, you know, the system or how things um, are, are currently working for us. And, and there's so much harm to to kids that we want to do something that's a little bit more effective than than just that light bulb. And I will have to give a lot of that idea to one of the parents out of Florida because she she actually helped say, hey, why, why do the light bulb? Let's do something that's a little bit more effective. Uh, so here's a website, um, Heroes for Children's Rights. Um, we have a lot of features on here, but if you scroll toward the bottom, our whole template um, is below. And this is what you can copy and paste. We also have um, the buttons that will help you identify where to go to find your representatives. Here are the PINO codes. Um, and this button off to the, the left, email your legislators. This is another additional option that when you click on it, you are going to be asked for your information to identify all your representatives. And you can send out an email to your state, your stu two state reps, your house rep, your state senator, your federal congressman, your federal U.S. senator, and to the White House, to the vice president and the, and the president of the United States, and just send them this email. And it's just basically letting them know that this is a, a problem. This is a, a nationwide problem. And a lot of these um, denials that parents get, this contributes to a lot more issues that we're facing in, in America. And so we want to bring a lot of attention to this issue. So everything that we've created is right here. Um, again, it is a challenge. We're trying to get parents to, to get more involved. And if you can, you can CC respectfully pack, we're gonna keep tally of how many emails we get and, and which parent has submitted the most. Um, if you um, go to a portal for one of these representatives and it doesn't allow you to copy us, if you could, screenshot that and email it to respectfully pack. That's just another way to capture that. Um, we do have um, a few prizes that we were issuing out and those are gonna be uh, sent out from the National Parents Organization. That's one of the organizations that's working with us and helping us recognize and push this movement. Um, I do wanna highlight there are other events that are coming up. There's April 25th, there's April 26th. There's also June 16th uh, and I was ma made aware of that one today. Um, that's probably Pro Se Dad, and that's a, mod a National Modification Day. So again, there's a lot of events that are coming up, and we have a lot of organizations that are helping us. So anyway, back to um, the PowerPoint. Sorry to take over there, but I didn't want to forget some of these things. I'm sorry. Uh, where is the uh, um, the template of the email? I, I don't see. So if see you it. go, yeah, you're right in that box. So you see that that right on top of those buttons that the wording Wait, do you see here it starts oh, okay yep that's it it starts right oh, oh i there. understand it's from here every okay. state yeah. every state in the u.s yep you all right okay that. so okay so what parents should do is to go into your page which is heroes for children rights org yes and then find your legislators you already, first yeah yeah, if you don't already know your legislators, or if you wanted to email your um, city mayor, if you wanted to email anybody that you think should know this, so it doesn't have to be just your legislators. Um, you you find the information and then you copy this. 
and then paste it into the email. And then when you send the email, you can CC respectfully pack um, at gmail.com. And so, or you can buy copy, so BCC respectfully pack um, at gmail.com. And then uh, what it does is help us tracking to see how many emails are being sent out. And then like Claudia just mentioned uh, and Rael mentioned, which is National Parents Organization have been very generous in donating a number of prizes for the people that are really active in participate. And this is so important for you to participate because it is going to empower you. Uh, not only you helping raising the awareness, and these are the people that are matter. These are people that are changing the laws that, that are going to affect you. So, um, you know, definitely let them know what's going on. And then, um, then, then, yeah, and then at the same time, you feel that you're taking the, the right action. And then you, you think that you're nobody, but actually um, they do notice. They do pay attention. And, and when you become active at that, legislator go, oh, this is a person I have to pay attention. So when it comes come to your personal case, they actually do help. And actually we have one of the case today that we're going to interview one of the parents. It's their senator in their state that actually intervene and be able to help bring the child back to him. And so it's important that you don't think that you are invisible. It's so important. Okay, go ahead. Um, um, I did want to point out on this page, there are some hyperlinks. So a lot of the statistics that we pointed out or that are that in this template, those hyperlinks are, are in there. So if you wanted to take a look at what, where we're get, gathering this information from or uh, where it's at, the hyperlinks will take you to the National, Missing, uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's um, research, a lot of their preventive measures, um, a lot of their, just their publications in general. So that stuff is in the template. Um, again, if you have any questions, maybe you joined us a little too late and, and not sure what we're doing. Again, it's, a, it's this is an awareness campaign we're, we're on our devices all the time anyway. And so if you cut and paste this into an email, you know, and send it off to your legislators, that's what, what we're trying to do is to have a nationwide awareness campaign where we're sending out emails. We're actually doing something that can spread the word about this problem. So again, it's all right here. Um, and then we'll kind of instruct you on another extra feature that we created as well. Okay, um, great. Thank you so much. And I think next we are going to have uh, some cases for you. So, um, so thank you so much, Claudia and Rael. They are going to come back later on in the show and wrap this up with a lot more information. So we'll, we'll see them again. And right now I wanted to invite um, two other people to come on right now. So, um, all right. So I did mention to you guys earlier. Um, okay, so I see Mark and Dina. Okay. Um, okay, so I did mention to you guys that we're gonna have cases. Um, so what we're gonna have uh, now is a number of parents um, and they're gonna share their personal cases um, that they went, what they went through. So who we have right now here is Dina, and um, I think Mark is coming up. Mark, I don't know, uh, I can't see you yet. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. I can't okay, see I'm, you. Um, trying to get it working. No worries, yeah, we, we, um, we are technical difficulties yeah, about yeah. today. Okay, you look great, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, guys, this is, um, I, I can't tell you, I, I really don't know how to express how I feel about this particular case. I mean, when I talk to Dina, it's, um, I'm already started tearing up, I apologize. But um, this is a crazy, crazy case. And seriously, um, when people say that fact is stranger than fiction, this is definitely one of those situations. Um, so um, thank you so much, Dina, and thank you so much, Mark, for being here. Um, so Dina is uh, a mother where her daughter was kidnapped, abducted. Um, it's an it's a interference of child custody. And she lost her daughter for so long. And Mark was a private detective that helped 
uh, find her daughter. So we're going to go into the detail. So, so maybe we'll start with Dina. Um, do you want to share with us, with us, you know, uh, when did it start and how old was your daughter when this started? Okay. So Bianca was about 19 months old. And in fact, yesterday marked 28 years. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, since her dad took her for the weekend and, um, he had visitation and, um, we were getting divorced and, um, so it was his weekend and, um, he picked her up. It was a Friday, just like yesterday, April 7th, 1995. And, um, I had a feeling that something was wrong that weekend. Um, I can't explain it. People have asked me because um, I videotaped her playing in the yard right a few hours before she left with her dad. And so luckily I had that that video of her. And um, like I said, it's been 28 years um, since she's been gone. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people along the way have helped me, a lot of strangers. Um, I've made a lot of friends, um, people have helped me out. I've done, you know, uh, Facebook, um, pages and I've gotten a lot of tips that way and a website. And, um, in 2013, I had had a tip that she was in Monterey and going, play, um, she was a student in a music school. She never had any formal, um, education she never went to school and um I found some of her friends she had already left the school with her dad they uh, went back on the run in 2013 um right before I found them or found where they had been living they left that house a few months before and um so they were off the grid for uh, a couple years or many years. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Like, I, I wanted to kind of break it down because that's a lot of information. I just want to break it down a bit. Okay. Um, so um, for, for parents that following and, and just in case you, you didn't um, didn't get a chance to like hear all that, I want to just kind of break it down uh, a bit more. So um, um, Dina's daughter was taken when she was really little and this was over two decades ago, 20, uh, 26 years, uh, 28, right? years. Uh, 28 years ago. And, um, and so at the time, it was just supposed to be a normal custody change. The father was supposed to have the daughter for the weekend, but he took her daughter and went off to another country and went on the run and hiding. And one of the way that he was hiding is by not putting her into the school system they live completely off grid. And so what Dina mentioned earlier is that what she did is she trying to share her story so that she could get any kind of information. And a lot of people are trying to help her. They would, if they get any bit of information through Facebook, they would message her, things like that. So she created Facebook page uh, and social media places to ask people for information and please feel free to jump in and correct me i'm, I'm wrong um I, I know that there's details that i may be uh, incorrect here but but so she set up essentially a network of places to capture any kind of information so he was really good at uh, disappearing he was completely upgrade and in order to do this what he did was horrible as in destroying this girl's life by taking her completely off the educational system. She had no education whatsoever, never went to school, staying home, had no skill set, had no anything, had no social life. She was not allowed to do anything. She was not allowed to be anywhere. And then she was then signed up for some music school. And this is when Dina started to get some information. But by the time, Dina uh, got there, I guess he could tell that that information was out there. So he went on the run again. I think that's where we're up to right now. I just in case I miss anything else. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask, um, she was supposed to get back to you in two days, right? 
Yes, in, in 2021, when I made contact with her. Yes. No, 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 no. When she first got taken away. Oh, he just had yes, he had weekend visitation. I, I had um, sole custody and he had visitation rights. And even though we were separated over domestic violence, you know, I asked that he have uh, supervised visitation and that was denied. So he had regular visitation weekends. Um, so she was with him from Friday to Sunday and um, then a couple nights during the week too. Wow, that's that's crazy. Um, so he took out, uh, did you, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. If I could add also another thing that he was able to hide because he changed his name and her name. And the name he took was um, one of his cousins who lives in California. He stole his identity and changed his name and then changed Bianca's name. Uh, so she didn't know wow. her real name and didn't know that she, you know, was American, obviously. Because she was sorry, so I jumped ahead a little bit. <laughs> no, 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 you're not. No, no, it's great. Uh, thank you. No, please go in and share your story. That's that's what we are here about. So, yeah, so he took her, changed her identity, changed his identity, live off grid, took her up the whole entire society. No schooling, no friends, no support network, no family, uh, except him. And then um, just went on the run, basically. Um, did you did you have any idea that this would happen? Did you ever suspect that this is a possibility that it would have happened back then? I knew it was going to happen and I can't, that's another thing that I can't explain. I just, I knew it was going to happen. I just had a feeling that he was going to take off with her, but honestly, I didn't think it would be for her entire life. I thought, you know, he might do it for a couple months and then come back. I just, I had a feeling that he was going to take her. Wow. And yet you, you couldn't do anything about it at that point. So the moment that he took her away, what did you do right then? Um, I had an attorney for you know my divorce. And so I called him and he advised me to call the police. And so I did and uh, made a report. And then did they do anything? Uh, they went to his house and knocked on the door and his mom told him, well, he's not here. And that was it for that day. There were several other interactions that the police made with his parents. And um, it, at some point they did search their house, but it was, it was months and months later. So they were long gone by then. So they was eventually went and searched his house. Did they find anything useful at the time? No, um, he because he had moved back in with his parents, and so they searched the parents' house, and of course they didn't tell me anything. So I don't know exactly if they found anything, maybe some clothes or something that was left behind. I really don't know. Wow, I'm so sorry. I mean, this is so crazy. Like 28 years. So, um, and and something I think was incredible is that you never gave up. You just keep going. You just keep looking for her. You never give up hope. You just, that's incredible. Like that's incredible strength. And that's just that's the testament to your love for your daughter and in your, your role as a mother. Um, so. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll never give up on her even, even to this day, you know, even as her being an adult, I'm, I'm always going to be here if she wants to be in my life again. So. Yeah, um, so Jennifer says, said, saying, I'm so sorry, just can't even touch this. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's crazy, crazy. And I think Jennifer is also have 28 years or something. Um, okay, so, um, so then, yeah, in the recent year, and let's just leave names and exact location kind of information up like if we can just be general okay so in the recent year in 21 you found some information right and then what happened yes uh, there was an anonymous uh, person came forward and said that 
they thought they knew where my daughter and her dad were living together um, in a town in Mexico. And so a few years before that, I had met Mark, um, who's the investigator. And so I went to Mark and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. And, and so um, he said, well, I'll go. And so he went to the town where they thought they were, or, you know, this person had told us that they were, and um, he found, Mark found exactly where they were living. So do you want to talk about that, Mark? Yeah, that's fine. If um, it's my turn, I don't want to, I don't want to speak out of turn. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Please go ahead, Mark. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So, so um, Dina had contacted me, I guess about a year or, or so before. Um, I had actually been on a radio program talking about another investigation and she called the radio station. They referred her to me. And um, and so we talked and she told me about her case and I, and I told her I'll, I'll look at it, but I can't make any promises. And the only promise I ever make is that I'll do my best. Um, and um, and so we we looked at it and I think over the course of the year, she had already set up a network that was fantastic. There was nothing that I could do better than what she had already established over the course of 20 years. Um, so we worked off of her network, what she had established, what the only thing that she was missing is that she had no one to really go check the tips that were coming in, the information. That was coming in. So <clears throat> over the course of the year, um, you know, I either went to Mexico or I sent another investigator down there just to check out the tips that were coming in. But in 20, I guess 20, was it 2020 or 2021, we got one tip in that was uh, exception it was um, something that you know, had to be checked out uh, extensively. And so I sent initially a, an investigator down there to get some surveillance. Um, we got some photographs and things uh, from the surveillance effort that convinced me it was probably him. Now you have to understand the pandemic was you know, in full bloom at that time. So everybody in Mexico, of course, were wearing masks. It was hard to really identify anybody. But uh, the characteristic that stuck out with, with her ex-husband is that he's six foot three um, and, and he was living in an area where the average height was five, nine, or five, ten. Um, that, was, that was a big help. Um, but once we got the surveillance photos back, I, I I was convinced it was it was probably going to be him, and so um, went down there myself to to check it and verify it and confirm. Even even with the surveillance, we we found him <clears throat> in a shot. Well, we found him. We never saw her. That, that's key to this. Um, we found him in a shopping area, um, but we didn't know where he was living. So uh, we knew a general area. And so um, that was one of the first things I had to do when I got down there was to establish where they were living um, and to isolate that street and then to isolate the exact house. Um, and we were able to do that and identify the, the actual house that they were living in. Um, so from that point- So we'll sorry, I, I just wanted to kind of emphasize again the point that Mark just mentioned. And it just highlight the fact that this child was isolated from completely from the society. Uh, she was not allowed out of the house. She was not allowed to go to school. No friends. No network of anything. And the father controlled everything. This is why when Mark and his people go and investigate, they could find the father, mm -hmm. but they never saw the child because the child was hidden inside the home all these years uh, while he's on the run. You know, anywhere that he went. To, to live, he took her. And so Mark and, and his um, other people in his team went um, throughout that period of time, that was quite a long time, they could observe him, but never once they saw the daughter. Right. Yeah, please continue, Mark. Right, so, so um, we spoke with witnesses who um, knew him 
and had known him for a couple of years, but they never knew that he had a daughter. Um, in fact, one said that he had mentioned a son, but had never mentioned a daughter. They had never seen her. They, they had, you know, been friends for two years and had never seen a daughter. Um, spoke to other witnesses who said that they had seen the daughter, but th that she was not allowed out of the house unless he was with her. And that even when she was allowed in the house, it was um, the walk with him uh, to the corner store and um, things of that nature. Um, when they walked, when they were observed walking together, uh, she had to remain behind him and walk with her head down. Um, and that that sort of thing. It, from everything that I got, from everything that the witnesses told us, um, and the FBI, because I got them involved later, um, and I let the FBI talk to all the witnesses that I found so they could confirm everything. And um, from everything the witnesses told us, um, for all practical purposes, she was still being held captive. Um, she was still, you know, if if he went to work, um, we were told that he locked the door um, and she wasn't allowed out. Um, we were told that she wasn't allowed a phone, she wasn't allowed a computer, um, she wasn't allowed to have any friends. Um, and you have to understand, this girl's now 25 years old. She's lived her entire life like this. Uh, and that's the state that we found her in. Right. And can you imagine that this adult, this full grown adult, is really have the ability of comprehension of a child because she has never gone through any educational system and then because she's so isolated she has the social skill and the ability to make judgment like really the level of a child and and her ability to connect with other people is just non-existent she's she will never see another person as a potential connection because the only person in her life is her father. And I, I don't want to overstate it. Um, she Because I, I got to, when we finally jumped ahead a little bit, when we finally got her, I was able to spend uh, two hours with her before um, she was able to meet with her mother. And, um, and I was surprised because the state that you described is what I expected. Um, she, it was not like that. She was she was uh, more advanced than what you're describing. Uh, okay. she was able, I mean, she she held adult conversations. Um, it was, you know, it, it was just that, um, you know, the education level might not be there, but, but she was able to, to to communicate very well. So, but but that judgment though is is definitely because she. And this is what we see a lot from even um, alienated children that still see their parents. Um, and is that the society will always misjudge these children or these adult child of uh, abduction or alienation. Is that people think that we are okay. I'm saying we because I was one of those child. And, um, and they think that we are okay and they think that we are able to whatever because we are able to show a front that seem functional absolutely absolutely under understand yeah. completely yes and that's that's a lot of what we were dealing with too because you have to understand that he is all she's ever known so when um and i i think we've skipped a lot a lot but um but when i did was able to speak with her you know her father was all she ever knew so she was very defensive in protecting him even though she's lived this whole life you know uh, abuse um and because he was a fugitive she, they lived as a fugitive um, that, that's what i did i protected my abuser absolutely because that's all i knew right. i protected even though she abused me like every single day, physically, mentally, sexually. Like I still, because that's all I knew. So even right. though I was a grown adult and to the society, 
I look like a normal, fully functional human being. And uh, in fact, you know, people consider me successful because I was actually very educated. I had a PhD. I went out there. I traveled places. I, you know, seemed very functional, but yet so broken. So I can't even imagine um, and, and the level of judgment that I had. So consider and then uh, from that point to the moment that I woke up, it just like, oh my God, like I couldn't believe where I was right. mentally. Exactly. So for her. It's all she's known. It's all she's known. So, right. so, and we knew that was going to be an issue going into it, but this was our only shot. I mean, in 25 years, this was our only shot. And so, um, and I, you know, Dean and I discussed it. It was because we were going into arrest her father. And we knew that was going to be an issue because he is all she's ever known. For 25 years, he had convinced her, her daughter that her mother uh, died in childbirth and that her mother was a bad person and uh, you know had died a long time ago. Um, and so she didn't even understand that her mother existed. And so we were about to hit her with all of this at the same time. We're going to arrest her dad and say, Surprise! Your mom's your mom's still alive. I mean, that's that's almost impossible to comprehend um, on someone like that who's lived such a sheltered life. That was that was the uh, biggest hurdle that we had to try to you know to overcome. Um, you mentioned that we skip a lot of stuff, so. Um, I know there's some legal things because, you know, uh, you kind of hinted that um, the FBI got involved. So why don't we walk through that a little bit? Like, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, so once I found him and, and uh, found um, his exact address and was able to verify that and confirm that um, uh, at the time he was, he's, a, he's still a fugitive out of Paris County, Texas, still to this day. Um, at the time, he was also an international fugitive because they had filed um, uh, the extra the extradition uh, warrant on him. And so, I'm sorry, is it, is it is related to the child abduction, or is it unrelated to uh, to no, the it, The extradition was originally filed for the fugitive warrant in Harris County, which was for uh, interference with child custody. So, All right. So this is to do with what Dina did at the beginning, like she called the police and they then started an interference with child custody case, right. and then he then become a, a felon, yes. and he they couldn't find him. So he's okay. So I I really think this is so important for parents to recognize it is a criminal action. It's a criminal offense, and yes. it is is the like in, it depends on the state, but in Every state in the, in the U.S., it is a criminal offense, but that it depends on the state. The level of severity is different. For and some state will break it down to you know the violation, like you know how many times and how long that kind of things for it to become a felony. And then the different class of felonies. But um, some state, you know, there's certain level that is only a misdemeanor. But whatever it is, it's a criminal offense. So it's very important for you to recognize that and. When it is a criminal offense, and I know that Rayel kind of brought up this earlier, is different than a civil case. Now, a civil case is when you have a conflict with another person, and you are both citizens, and you have a conflict. So it could be a family court case. It could be that you have a dispute with your business partner, that kind of thing. That's a civil civil matter. You go to court, and you present your case, and then there's a judge in the middle and trying to decide who is right and who is wrong, etc. But when it's a criminal offense, you are not a party of the case, you are a victim of the case. And the case is between the US government and this criminal. You're not a party of the case, you are a victim that's suffering the crime. And so because this is between the government and the criminal, the government is responsible for all that kind of action in terms of prosecuting the criminal, finding the criminal, things like that. You don't need a lawyer. In fact, because you are a victim, the government actually have to provide you with victim support and advocates and things like that. 
So for you to recognize that this is a criminal offense, and sometimes when you go to the police and raise the matter and say, hey, I have trouble, you know, um, this is my time to have my children, and yet, you know, the child is not brought to me, or when I go to pick up the child, they don't let me see the child, things like that. A lot of the time you will see police and, and detective and law enforcement will say, oh, you know, this is a civil matter, they are wrong. So um, it's very important for you to put your foot down because sometimes they are actually not because they, they trying to be mean to you. They sometimes actually genuinely don't know that. And we have seen a lot of law enforcement officers and today we're gonna have someone who is a law enforcement officer who will come on and let you know that they work as a law enforcement officer for decades and still never knew that this is actually a criminal code. It's in the, in the statute. That's true. Um, right. So when you go and get pushback from the law enforcement, it's very important for you to become aware of what is the law in your state, in your jurisdiction. And that's why earlier, uh, when we, got, we show you guys uh, the template and the link, you can go there and find the code for your area and then become aware of it. And then if you need to print it out, things like that. And then when you deal with law enforcement that are not helping you, you should be able to show them because sometimes they just genuinely don't know. The training is really terrible. They, they have so many other things as well. So they, they forget and things like that. So it, it's important for you to put your foot down. And, and if you have problem with pushback, again, you, you are a citizen and you are a victim. So it's for you to remind them that are you not following your duty to protect because I, I am a victim of a crime here and you know if you have trouble again sometimes you also need advocates coming with you to help assert your rights but a lot of the time it's about putting your foot down and it, it it does help like bringing a bit of awareness bringing in a bit, bit of information and set your boundaries and and you know don't it, it's also important to stay calm because sometimes because if you act too emotional and you break down and you're screaming, it doesn't help either. So, so it's also important to, uh, to, to recognize that you have the power um, and stay calm and in control. And I'm sorry that I jumped in to, to kind of put this in here because I just felt that was an important point. Um, so yeah, so Dina, um, when it first happened, she called the police and the police went and followed the process. So there was an interference with child custody case, and that's why he was a fugitive. And then, so Mark, please continue. Yeah, I just want to say real quick, you're exactly right. I, I spent uh, three decades in law enforcement and um, the training on child custody is, is very minimal. Um, and so the officers just don't know. It's not that they don't care, but they're trained that it's a civil matter and, and police departments don't handle Police officers don't handle civil matters, and um, and so that's where the, the issue. It's a training issue. Uh, so you're exactly right on that. But um, so so when Dina filed her police report, they did the investigation, and they filed uh, a criminal charge of interference with child custody. And because he had fled, he became a fugitive. And once they discovered that he crossed an international border, then a federal uh, fugitive warrant was issued um, for fleeing to avoid prosecution. Okay, so, so that gives the FBI uh, and federal authorities um, the authority to act in foreign countries to, to arrest and retrieve the. So that was all in place. And so um, when I got down there and I, I confirmed, I verified it. I, I, you know, I, I wanted to do all this before I contacted the FBI, so I didn't waste their time. Um, so once it was all done, I contacted them. I had them meet me in Mexico. And um, uh, the agent that, that met with me, I took him to the, to the house, to the, the, the location. He spoke with the witnesses that I had discovered. I let him, I let him completely verify everything that I had already done and, and discovered. And um, and they were they agreed they were ready to go. It's them who found them. And uh, I mean, we're ready to kick the door and go get them, whatever we have to do. And um, so, you know, he told me, you know, I'll call you. Let's let's go back and we'll set it up. I'll call you back. He calls me the next day, and they had a stand down. Uh, they were ordered to stand down because we found that the Harris County had dropped the uh, fugitive warrant uh, or 
the extradition. So there was the chain reaction was that the FBI no longer had jurisdiction in Mexico to make the arrest. Wow. So, um, and you want to talk, you want to talk about a difficult. I mean, going from the ultimate high of having found this girl who's been missing for 25 years, and she's right behind a door. You know, just a one inch flimsy door. She's right there and I can't get her. Um, and they had to stand down. They walked off and left me standing in the streets of Mexico um, with no, nothing I could do. So, and and to make it worse, this was, this happened to be on Mother's Day um, when, when I originally found her. So I had to call Dina on Mother's Day and say, hey, here's the deal. You know, we're not, we're not going to have that hallmark moment, um, but it, it is the first Mother's Day in 25 years that you know where she's at. I know where she's at. Um, that is heartbreaking. And, and I wanted to point out that it was so important that you do, uh, it's incredible because you already done all the groundwork. And this is so important for parents too, is to not just hang your case over to like the police and to trust that they do things. You have to be in the driver's seat of your case as much as you can, like really go through and and then that way when you present your information, it really helps them, you know, moving forward with things. But so you now you've got a roadblock now. You 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 got everything in place. You've done everything you could. You've done your job, and somebody have dropped the ball, yes. and now. So, uh, I, uh, you know, I, 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 and I told Dina in the beginning, I, I, my, my biggest problem is I, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how to stop. So, um, I extended my stay and I, I stayed a few extra days just trying to figure out a way uh, to get him away from her so we could get her. Because we had set up with the, with the U.S. consulate. If I could get her to the consulate's office, they would extradite, um, expedite a uh, passport in her real name. And if she wanted to, because she's an adult now, if she wanted to, then we could fly her home. Uh, that was already set up in place. And I just needed a way to get her there. Um, and so, I mean, I worked, I, I did, we, we, I, we set up different scenarios where we could get him away from the house and it never worked. So I had to um, eventually, you know, a few days later, get back on a plane and just come home. And uh, one of the hardest things I had, or had to do was so. Um, wow, yeah, I, I, I have to say it's incredible how thorough you were. Like you, you did all this work and then you even thought about, you know, contacting the consulate, made arrangement, pre-arrangement. Like, that's so thorough. Well, let me let me say this. A lot of that credit goes to Dina and uh, her friend Kimberly Reed, uh, who had done a lot of this already. And like I said in the beginning, they had a network set up that was fantastic. It was it was everything that I would have done and more. So um, so a lot of that the contacts with the consulate they had they had already made. So that was that was an easy thing to do. Uh, they were aware of the case already, and that was already established. So, um, so that was Dina and Kim, that Kimberly, that that did a lot of that work. So, um, so. I, sorry, I sorry. Let me let me jump in there, and I wanted to emphasize how strong Dina is, how incredible she is. She never gave up, and a lot of the time, parents feel like. Oh, I talk about this too much. I can't, you know, people are gonna think that I complain too much. People, you know, like nobody's listen. But it's so important because she never gave up. That's why when it comes to the consulate, they're already aware of the case. When it comes to anybody, they already aware of the case. And it's also at the same time very important to not be um like like I mentioned earlier, to be so uh, emotion, uh, like emotionally unstable, because then they will consider you such a drama that they won't deal with you. So you have to still be in control. I know it's hard because this is your children' life you're talking about, but definitely have to be trying to, your best to be in control and be really 
logical about things, but don't give up because, you know, having consistently, 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 and imagine in like 28 years, she, she doesn't even know what this child looks like anymore. She doesn't, you know, and I mean, she did get some photos in the middle somewhere, but still, you know, there's so much that has changed, but yet she never given up. Um, I'm sorry for interrupting, please uh, continue. So, um, uh, so I, I flew back home and it, and it took me another uh, few months um, to devise another plan uh, to go back. In the meantime, I actually went back and I think that turned out to be more of a scam uh, than anything. Uh, almost got us arrested down in Mexico, but, um, but we went back, we came back, we got a, another plan together. I worked with uh, some guys that uh, I met at the State Department. Uh, they were instrumental. They couldn't do anything on officially because the, there's no longer a warrant, but um, you know, unofficially, they made some contacts for me that made uh, the meeting happen. So what I had to do, because we couldn't arrest him on the United States warrant, the Texas warrant, um, I, we had to figure out if he was violating any laws in Mexico. And um, once I researched the, the law in Mexico, and I, I realized that he's been living under a a false name and he has a he has a, a an official mexican identification card under that false name and that's a felony in mexico so uh i was like here you know here's 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 our here's our shot so, uh we've we made contact with the police department in mexico uh, they agreed to meet with us um and it was a situation where I was confident that it was going to happen this time. And so I contacted Dina and I said, you need to meet me in Mexico. I'm going to go get her. Um, and so we went back and Dina and Kimberly um, met me there. We went to the police station, were able to meet with the police chief and uh, their, the attorney for the Mexican police there in Mexico. Um, we had a meeting talked about exactly what happened uh, and what we needed to do. And um, and then, we, I mean, basically, um, because of my experience in law enforcement, they let me ride, you know, shotgun, basically, with the police chief. And we went, you know, and I took them to the house, and um, we were able to make the arrest. And, um, and that's the first time that we, anybody's at, you know, ever seen uh, Bianca in 25 years, we were able to see her that day for the first time. Wow. So, uh, we made the arrest. Um, we took him to the police department. We got Bianca. She rode with me and we got her back to the police station um, where she and I and an interpreter uh, met and talked for about two hours because I had to drop this bomb on. And I had to explain um, everything that was going on, and, and uh, you know, uh, it was not an easy thing to do, uh, and it was not an easy thing for her to accept or explain. Um, and she went, she rode the emotions from, you know, being scared to being angry to being, you know, completely bewildered what was happening. Um, you know, she went through all of it, and. Um, and at the end of the, you know, two hours, whatever it was, uh, she agreed to meet with her mom. And uh, so for the first time in 25 years, they, they spent the next hour and a half, two hours together. Um, so, um, and you have to, you have to understand also, we did all this with a hurricane bearing, bearing down on us. Um, so Hurricane Grace was coming in at this time so everything was chaotic and um and within a few hours of that meeting we we took a direct hit from the hurricane so wow. I mean, it was just kind of a wow the whole thing was just kind of a wild uh, it's a wild ride crazy um dina so you finally got to meet your daughter 
for the first time in 25 years. Um, what was it like? Well, it, it almost didn't seem real because the Bianca in my mind was a little girl, you know, under two years old. And now I'm sitting there looking at an adult. And another thing, it was hard because we had masks on because of the pandemic. So I never really got to see her face completely because she wouldn't, she wouldn't even pull it down. She wouldn't take it off. I'm very afraid of the pandemic. Um, She's very afraid of COVID. She's a uh, type one diabetic. She was diagnosed uh, with diabetes when she was nine years old. And I think also her dad used that as a tactic to scare her and sure. keep her compliant, keep her mask on. That was a good way for them to hide in public. Um, so she was really, really scared about that. And, um, so I went, uh, yeah, I was upset because she didn't want to see me, you know, at first. And, um, so I had to wait outside. It, it seemed like forever that I was waiting. <laughs> let me just, let me just add real quick. The last thing as we arrested him and she was standing there, the last thing he said to her was don't talk to them. Don't talk to them. It was like, he demanded, do not talk to them. And so that's what we had to walk her through before she would talk to Dina. So, um, and I don't know that that Dina ever fully understood that because she wasn't there at the time. But, um, but he, I mean, that was his last word. Don't. So the fact that we were able to get her to, to talk at all was amazing. I think, but I, I, and I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, that's okay, because Kimberly and I we stayed back. We weren't we didn't go up to the house with everyone else. We had to stay outside the gate because each street uh, where they lived was gated. So Kimberly and I waited in a car outside of the gate. And then um, once her dad was arrested, um, Mark took a picture and sent it to me. And we were just waiting to hear, can we come in yet? We didn't know. And so then I think they called me because the interpreter was there too. And she talked to me and she said, well, Bianca doesn't want to talk to you right now, but we're all going to go to the police station. And so I said, okay. And so we got there and she was outside talking on a cell phone. And I started to walk up to her because I wanted a reaction from her. I didn't care if I made her mad because I, I thought, you know, she was angry at me and didn't want to talk. That's why she didn't want to talk to me. So I started walking towards her and, and Mark and the interpreter started saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> so I turned around and went the other way and they went inside the building and it seemed like forever that we were waiting while they were talking to her. And then he said, Mark texts me, come on, come up, you know, go ahead and come in. And so um, Kimberly and I ran up there and we all walked in the room and Bianca said, no, just her. And she pointed at me. And so it was me and her and the interpreter. And so she recognized I, you. I, I don't, she said she did, but it's hard to say because, you know, when she, when I talked to her friends back in 2013, she didn't know her real name, I don't think, and she didn't know my name. And so I kind of don't think she had ever seen a picture of me because her fake birth certificate had um, a different name on it for her parents. And so I don't a, know that she really recognized me or not. There's just a bond between a mother and a daughter. I don't I mean, I think that's what that was. She knew. Yeah. Yeah, because she didn't question me when I was in the room with her. She didn't question, well, how do I know you're my mother? She didn't even question that. So she just immediately started talking. Well, how'd you meet my dad? She was kind of testing me to see if I had the same story of probably little bits and pieces of truth that he had told her along the way. And so it was two days before her birthday her 28th birthday and it was actually on mark's birthday <laughs> that we were there <laughs> and then the hurricane was coming the next day too so it was it was a real whirlwind of everything and it was it was hard to know 
exactly what to say, what was the most important things that I wanted to say, because I didn't know if I would see her again, you know, and, um, but I just, mostly I kept stressing to her that she needed to make her own decisions. And she kept telling me, I do, I, I make my own decisions, which I knew wasn't completely true. I know she thought she was making her own decisions, but I know everything was influenced by what her dad wanted her to do. And so I told her, you know, if you want to get married, if you want to have a career, if you want to go to school, if you want to come to Texas to see me and your brother, and she goes, I have a brother. And I said, yes, because I had remarried and I have a son. And so uh, she said, what's his name? And I said, Devin. And I had, he had just graduated a couple uh, months before that from high school. And so I had printed out a few pictures. And so I gave her a picture of him so she could see him. And she really wanted to come back here. Of course, she's hesitant and a little scared and nervous about, you know, the thought of coming to the United States. But, you know, I told her you have grandparents because my parents would love to see you and you have a brother and you have lots of cousins and aunts and uncles and everybody that would like to see you. And and she agreed that, you know, she would like to come here. And that's when I gave her her, um, her real birth certificate. And so I made sure that the interpreter explained to her, she, her English was really good, but, um, you know, there are a few things um, that she would ask the interpreter. So to make sure that she understood. And that's what I told the interpreter when I gave her that paper, I said, this is a legitimate piece of paper with your, you know, your birth certificate. And so it's really important. Um, and you can take this to the consulate and they will give you a passport if you want to come to Texas. And she said, okay. And actually her plan was to do that the next week was to go get her passport. That's what she wanted to do. She, she wanted to cut, she wanted that passport. She wanted to come back. Yeah. And, so this and, is when when she's not in the presence of her father. Right. So she, right. in her own will, wanted to go back and reunite with you. Yes. Yes. And I had brought a um, photo album that I had made of, you know, the pictures that I had of her and us as a family. And um, I had written things in it. And so I gave that to her to look at. And she went through every page and she read everything that was written. And she and the interpreter were going back and forth, looking at it and, and talking about it. And, you know, later on, the interpreter told me that she was impressed that I had pictures of her dad in there, that I didn't cut him out, which, you know, of course, <laughs> the thoughts there don't want to do that, but I didn't. And um, so she was happy, you know, and there was a picture, one picture that I had of me and her dad. And she told me she really liked seeing the picture of us. And uh, I think I think that's actually very considerate because you you have to you have that appreciation where she is, which is she, you know, she loves him. She look up to him, uh, you know, and. Actually, many parents make this mistake when they're being alienated is that they turn around and they attack the other parent to the child in front of the child. And then to the child, it's very difficult for the child to recognize that, oh, you are speaking the truth and that the other parent's abusive. No, that's their favorite parent. So any, even if you're speaking the truth, you're the messenger that's going to be attacked. You're going to be seen as an evil so, you know, by attacking the other parent, you're not helping yourself at all. So if you recognize where she start from, which is where your child start from, which is where yeah. they, they genuinely love that parent and they actually wanted to still maintain that relationship with that parent, et cetera. And so showing that to the child, I think is very important because you are trying to rebuild that connection with your child. So I think that's really important. Yeah, and every, everybody was cognizant of that fact going in. Like I said, we knew that, you know, she was going to be very defensive and protective of him because that's all she's ever known. And so, um, 
when I first met with her to explain to her who she was and what this situation was about, the very first thing I said is, I'm not here to talk bad about your father. I don't know him. I haven't met him. Um, I, can, I can tell you what's in the court record, but that's not what this is about. This is about um, you meeting your mother and, um, and that she's still alive and that she's been looking for you five years uh, and she's right outside. And so, uh, you know, we we made her aware of that. This is not about attacking her because that would just draw her further away from you know, um, where she needed to be. So. It's yeah, so that was important. something else. Okay. That was no, something was, else I was... that I told her when we met was that you know this is over now. You don't you don't have to hide. You guys don't have to run. You know I know where you are and you know everything's okay now. So you don't have to keep fighting. And I said you need to tell him that. And she goes okay, thank you. I will. So she was really appreciative of that too. That I said no more fighting. You know. Right. I was just going to say how important it is that um, Dina, you built a good team around you. And this is so important for parents is um, you need to have a team around you, unfortunately. Um, and even if you are fighting alone, as in like you can't afford a lawyer or anything, you still need to build a good team around you because emotionally you need somebody that is also an advocate for you in time like this. So Mark was very calm. He was very patient. He was being able to like look at it wisely. So like you, you don't want somebody to just go, oh, you know, you should go and attack him. Like, you know, there's sometimes you have friends that mean well, they wanted to be supportive to you. And then they're like, oh, that's a bastard, you know, like such a joke, you know, you should whatever, like it doesn't help your case. So, you know, have Having somebody that's calm, somebody that seems logical, somebody that are willing, people that are willing to speak up when they think that you're not doing the right thing as well, you know. So building the right team around you is very important, whether it's people that you you hire professional professionally or people that are helping you outside of that professional network as friends and family. And sometimes you have friends and family that are that mean really well, that love you but don't know how to do the right thing. It's also important you keep them outside of your team. So, you know, like really building that team is really, really important. And so, you know, when Mark said, you know, this is so important, you know, I, I, I talked to her and make sure that she knows that this is not about, you know, bad mouthing her dad, but, you know, being able to kind of like have that kind of calm guidance is so important. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, please go ahead. I was really fortunate because um, along the way, maybe 2009, 2010, I walked into my congressman's office and I, that's where I met my friend Kimberly and come to find out the same thing had happened to her. Um, her children were taken from her by their father. They were missing for about two years and she did get them back. But she knew exactly how I felt and what I was experiencing. And she just stuck with me the whole time. And so if I didn't have her, you know, for many, many years, um, and she, she kind of knew the ropes and she, she was always um, able to, you know, keep me calm. And, 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 she, uh, and she, was very she was very protective of, of Dina and the situation as well. When, when I first got involved, um, Kimberly questioned me. <laughs> she, she interrogated me. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, what are your credentials? Why are you doing this? Why, you know? And I said, well, she, well, she's a good friend. And and then I thought they were best. You know, had grown up together, best friends. But then I found out that Kimberly had just happened to work for the congressman that Nina went to, and that's how they met. So um, it was just kind of a um, I think it was a God thing, but, um, you know, yeah. they met and, um, they were able to get a lot, a lot accomplished. And, um, yeah. and, uh, you know, I, and I told Kimberly, if I, you know, if I ever needed, you know, to hire somebody, I'd hire you <laughs> because she was that good. And she was very, she's very organized and she's, she does a great job. 
I think we yeah, need I had to have Kimberly friend. on the show because you said she also lost her child and she got the child back. And and with that kind of experience and commitment, I think we need to have her on the show another day. Okay. I think she'd like it. Yeah, Thank definitely. You. Yeah, she has a son and daughter. And, um, and also have a friend who does all the Spanish interpretation for me because, you know, I, we pretty much knew that Bianca was in Mexico. And so I guess I started out many, many years ago before Facebook, I was on MySpace and that's where I met my friend Paula. And so she, once we moved over to Facebook, she kind of helped take over and she did a lot of the Spanish interpretation, the writing and she would talk to people and, and she, she liked to network. And so that was a big help too, because she just networked all over Mexico to spread the, the story. So that helps. Yeah. I mean, that's how we got the, the two tips anyway, were people in Mexico. So if it hadn't been for Paula doing that, I would not have gotten those tips probably. And so I, just been extremely fortunate with the people that have come into my life and stayed around to help that's especially incredible. Mark, you know that's a given <laughs> I mean I I wouldn't have gotten anywhere without him if he hadn't gone to Mexico that's incredible um I, I saw a comment and it's really heartbreaking comment in the chat room from Annie and Annie said I lost my daughter she was murdered last year and then my grand my precious granddaughters then were forced adopted so because her daughter passed the grandchildren got adopted away and then so now she on the same day she lost at the same time she lost three people in her life and she's trying to fight back to try to get her grandchildren but um, she's not has not been able to fight back that's terrible. Like we see so many of these tragic situation. Um, and I, I do want to say that Dina, you were saying about how you think it's so incredible. There's these people that are coming into your life. I think it started from you. You never give up. And so you, if you keep going, you will have the right people coming along. And sometimes you have wrong people, but they will, they will just kind of, it's, they're going to just be gone soon enough. But if you just keep right. going, you will find the right people and, and, and they will stick around. And I think that's a lot to do with you first. Um, yeah, so then then what happened? She she so at this point, we were up to the point where you met her, you get to talk to her for an hour and a half, right? And then she yes. was excited about going back to the US to reunite with you to live a life with you to have a US citizenship, meet to be with her brother and her family. So she's excited about that. She agreed to do that. This this was her choice. Um, while she was not under influence of the father. Okay, so then what happened? Yes. Um, yeah, she was really excited wanting to come back here. And so uh, I gave her my cell phone number and she said that she would come by the hotel where I was staying, that she wanted to come by and talk to me again. I think uh, while we were talking, she was a little anxious because we were in the police station. She knew her dad was arrested. She wanted to check on her dad. And then, you know, she needed to check on her blood sugar and she wasn't feeling real well. And um, I'm sure from all the shock too. And, but she assured me that she would come by the hotel the next day. And um I tried to like, get a picture with her. She said, no, my hair's a mess and we'll do it tomorrow. And I said, okay. And so she ended up leaving. And in fact, they released her dad the same time that we had walked downstairs. And so we were kind of all out in the parking lot at the same time. So we got in the car to leave. And um, that was the shock. Yeah. Yeah. Never expected them to release him. Um, I think because of COVID and because of the storm coming in, um, they were releasing prisoners, they released him. Um, and just as we were all walking out and he got her again. And so um, that was the last time we saw her. Yeah. 
And as I was talking to her, um, I got a phone call on my cell phone from Harris County District Attorney. And of course, I declined the call because I'm in the middle of talking to Bianca. And then a couple hours later, when I got back to the hotel, they called me again and to inform me, you know, that my ex-husband was in custody and um, but he had to be released. So something we left out that he was charged with the interference with child custody, but he was never charged with the kidnapping. And that was the key to extradition was that he should have been charged with kidnapping and he wasn't. And right. so the statute of limitations was already expired on um, the kidnapping. So we couldn't go back. And so that's another, that's the big reason why he was released and he wasn't extradited because Harris County promised me that he would be extradited. But then when we realized there were no kidnapping charges, it, it couldn't happen. Well, they, so they, and I hate to just hammer Harris County, but they, the DA's office really screwed him. And, um, and part of the problem was they didn't want to admit it. So we got several different stories and we had to figure out which, what was true. Um, but they originally never filed a kidnapping charge to a company the, the the other criminal charge of interference um and what we found out later when it was too late was that the interference with child custody is not recognized by international law as an extraditable offense so so they dropped the extradition warrant okay aggravated kidnapping if they had filed that charge because it was also a valid criminal charge for this particular incident, had they filed that charge as a co-crime, uh, um, aggravated kidnapping is, according to international law, extraditable. So what we tried to, what I tried to do is go back and file uh, a aggravated kidnapping charge because he still got her. I mean, in my mind, we can prove that, you know, the the kidnapping occurred in Harris County, Texas. 25 years later, he still has her. But the, the statutes of limitations were expired for aggravated kidnapping. And so we could not file that extra charge that would allow us to extra. Um, and the, the whole problem is once he's released, he's got full control of her again. And, um, and that became the big issue, even though she wanted to come home. She wanted to come visit. She not necessarily come live. She wanted to come visit. She wanted, she wanted, uh, you know, a passport and a real idea. She didn't know she was an American citizen. So um, she was excited about that. Um, and she wanted all that. But once, you know, uh, once he was released and, and got control of her again, she, she's not, she's not going to come back as long as he's got control. Um, yeah, so this is actually a really tragic story because we, you know, we already gone through all this 20, 20 something years gone by, did all this work and then got the child and the child has resumed to her natural loving state, wanting to come back. And then the child's now released back to the abuser back to the control of the abuser and you lost the child again. I mean, talking about the system failure, talking about the system is broken all over again. I'm talking about you doing everything right and still, and like there's, there's failure everywhere. It's just ridiculous, it's heartbreaking because at the end of the day, even today, Dina doesn't have her daughter back. Her daughter is still a captive who still doesn't have her life back and the abuser still win. So Dina has two bills right now in Texas, right? Do you wanna talk about yeah. those bills? Yeah, because we realized like what we were just talking about the kidnapping, um, 
the statute of limitations in Texas on kidnapping, I think is five years and interference with child custody is three years. And so we realized that. Which is insane. Just, yeah, it, it do, that doesn't make any sense for that to be, to be like that. And so someone can hide out with their, their kid, you know, kidnap their own child and just hide out for a few years and then they're scot-free, you know, that, that's not right. And so that's why um, we decided that that needs to change. And so we're asking um, Texas legislator to um, eliminate completely the statute on interference with child custody and kidnapping um, in Texas for that reason. Right, so um, the bills is um, HB 559 and HB 3025. And Mark, you also helped with um, Dina with pushing for these bills, right? Um, I I don't know. I don't remember who are the um, sponsor. Who are the the legislator, the reps that filed these two bills? It's Representative Cody Vasut is who I went to originally, and um, so he filed the original bill, and then he did uh, the three hundred two five to add the kidnapping. And I just found out that we have a co-author, uh, Bris uh, Briscoe Kane, who is also co-authoring now. Yeah. So, so we're gonna try to we're gonna try to get you another co-author today because we have another okay. house rep coming on today from Texas. So we're gonna talk to him oh, okay. about the bill online, see if we can get him to commit to be um, a co-author as well. Um, we're gonna have uh, rep, uh, Richard Raymond. Okay. Um, so, be awesome. Pressing hard, hard. We need we need all the help we can get. Right. Um, and um, I think it's so important because the more support you have on the bill, the, the better chance of it to get through. Um, and then I know that Claudia and Rayel have been. Uh, I mean, actually, I, I should recognize that Claudia and Rayel are, are really the one that helped putting together all these parents that you're going to be hearing today. So I'm really grateful for that. But yeah, they are with you guys as well. So, you know, they are super active as well. So they also can help you pushing the bills as well. But um, parents, if you feel truly touched by the story, you actually can help participate in pushing the bill forward. So when the when a bill, so a bill is a proposal for a law change. Okay, and it has to be filed by a legislator, either a senator of the state or we're talking about a state law. So it's a senator of the state or a, a house representative of the state. Um, and then it once it's proposed, it's called a bill. But for a bill to become a law, it needs to be voted through by both chambers, both the House and the Senate. And in order for it to be voted through, you need to get support from pretty much the majority of both sides. And so you can help for these bills to pass. Yes, these bills are in, uh, Katie, I saw your question in Texas. Yes, these are the bills in Texas. And I'm gonna kind of uh, read the number again. Um, so it's HB 559 and HB 3025. So HB stands for House Bill because it came from a House representative. So it came from the House first. Um, so you can actually help making this bill pass to become the law by calling your state representatives and even if you are not from tech can still actually call them and say i am a victim of this and why this bill i think is important so please vote yes for this so there's a lot that you can do and the more they hear from people about a particular bill the more likely they're going to go oh this must be an important um, matter so we better pass this so you can actually make a huge difference and texas is in session right now which means that this is a time that legislators are meeting to decide which of the proposals is gonna become the law. So this is the time um, for you to contact the legislators in Texas, call as many people as you can. And they have phone number you can call, they're not, they're not mystery. Actually, it's, it's on the government website, you go to the, the Texas state uh, website and you can see all the representative with their phone number. I know it's their office, they're not personally picking up the phone, but all the call are tracked and locked. And, and so you call and sometimes they pick up, sometimes they don't, you leave a message, but you should bring up, this is me, etc. because um, it will get locked into the bill and then they will pay attention. So definitely don't feel like you don't make a difference. You can if you want to. 
Um, Absolutely. And let me point out too that um, uh, House Bill uh, 3025 is also going to be named Bianca in honor of her daughter. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, is there anything else that we should add before you guys go? And I'm so grateful, really, I'm so grateful for you guys to to come and share this story because it's so important for parents to become aware and to see the kind of strength, the kind of diligent work that you both have put in and how determined you are and the strength you still have today to continue to fight so really i'm so grateful but please um like if you have any other things that you think we should definitely bring up before you go oh i just like to say thank you for what you're doing and thank you for claudia because it was great to be able to team up with her and go to the representatives and senators offices in austin and because i i wouldn't have gotten all that done if it weren't for her so uh, i'm really grateful for everybody here Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. And also thank you to, to you know, Texas State Representatives Cody Vasut and Briscoe Chris, Chris, Kane yes. uh, for, for pushing this forward. So, um, but, but yes, absolutely. Thank you for all you. Um, and you guys know what this means? Once they can pass this bill, Dina can go back and then get her husband extradited and they can still go again and try to get Bianca. This is not over. No, that might not be the case. It, it, unless they make it that law at retroactive, then we won't be able to do that under this law. So, um, they, they should, though. Like, why wouldn't they be able to make that retroactive? That's a legal issue that I don't know they're going to be able to push. Right. But we've asked for that, but I don't know right. that that's going to happen. So regardless, right. Um, and Dina's yeah. aware of this, you know, this is, if it doesn't help Dina, it will help other mothers in the future. And that's, that's, uh, that's where she's at. That's where I'm at on this. Um, this never should have right. happened and it should never happen again. And that's what we're trying right. to say. So. Yeah. And you guys are fighting for other children out there. That's what you're doing right now. Yeah. Um, I saw Mara's question, uh, not comment. She said, if Dina and Mark can't get uh, couldn't get a child back, and how can I? This is tragic and unimaginable. I actually wanted you to listen to their story and see the strength and actually see, I, I, I wanted you to see this as an empowering story, actually. Don't, don't look at it like you don't have the power. You should look at that story and see how far they've gone. And with your case, you could have gone much further. So really look at that. And let me just say this to her, don't give up hope. I mean, our case, Dina's case, came down to very specific things that went wrong. Uh, if those things had not gone wrong, we would have her back. So um, don't don't look at this as, as if they couldn't do it, I can't do it. Um, never give up hope. Dina hasn't, still hasn't given up hope. Um, neither have I. And um, it's just, you know, you have to play the cards that that you're dealt, and that's that's what happened, and and we're dealing with it, and we'll we'll continue to deal with it. You know, whatever we can do. But don't ever look at this and go, well, there's no hope, because that's not true. Right, right, and then the other thing too is that um, sometimes it takes time for the child because she's she's an adult now. It takes time to digest. Absolutely. And then she's still going through the process of life to trying to figure out. And and so it's in her. You know that now. You know that she loves you. Yeah. She knows mm -hmm. you exist. She knows that you love her, that you've never given up on her. Those are important things. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what most important is she knows that she's not alone, that she's loved. Right. And, and that... you've done everything you could as a mother for her. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, I'm just you're you're exactly right. That seed has been planted, and that's you know that's what we have to wait for now is just to see. Um, right. That, Sometimes it, it might take a bit of time, but uh, but yeah, you can see that sh she's yours. In in her heart, she loves you. She knows, and she knows that you love her. That's that's the yeah. most important thing and you change her life 
because to know that you change your life. Um, I was that child and I was told that my father didn't want anything to do with me. It took me 40 something years to finally discover that my father loved me. He already passed, it was too late. But that changed my life. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Because the moment I discovered that my father loved me, that is why I'm here today. So, I want everyone to know that it's never too late. So anyway, don't give up hope. And thank you so much, really. I apologize, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank okay. you for doing what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yeah, and Claudia is amazing. Claudia and I walk so many miles in that Capitol building. <laughs> we knock so many doors. We talk to so many people. Like she's amazing. Yeah, um, yes. yeah it's uh, we even have a joke that it's actually blood, sweat, and tear, and it's literally it literally is that. Um, but anyway, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you. Um, have a have a great day. Um, All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to send out the link to, to this to Dina and Mark. And any other questions later, parents, feel free to still post your comment and question. Mm -hmm. And then if there's other things that they can address for you, they will. So I'll, I'll definitely um, share that link to Mark and Dina later. Um, but I, I, I think you guys can find it anyway. It's on Victim to Hero Facebook page. Um, OK, so uh, next. Um, Rayel is back. Um, did you want to jump in, Rayel, before JP? Yeah, is that okay for just a minute? I figured I'm just going to remind everybody. Um, I'll share this screen. If you guys go to heroesforchildrensrights.org, um, let me share it so you can see. This has all the information that you need. And not only do you, will you be, you guys can see, you can see that, right, Petra? Yes. Okay, so right here, here is for childrensrights.org. We've made it so simple. You just scroll down here, right here is the template. So you just copy this uh, to here and you're gonna just copy it and you're gonna put it into an email. If you don't know where your legislators are, you can click right here to find your legislators. You just type in your address and then go to their website and find their email. Um, here, if you click here, you can find your penal codes. So whatever state you are, you can scroll down so that you know. Um, so Georgia's code is 16-5-45, for example, that's the law. And then you send an email, you could put that as the, the heading, you just cc respectfully pack at gmail.com and um, then paste this in there and send it off. Um, you can also go to voter voice right here. All you do here is put in your name, address, and they send this message to all these people. And that's it. Um, and then if you send the confirmation or um, CC us or screenshot it, then we'll start tallying up the votes to see who's going to get some prizes from some of our affiliates. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rayel. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so next up we have uh, JP. Hi JP, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, so I think I can hear you okay. Is there any way for us to increase your volume because I feel like I'm much louder than you. I don't know, parents, can you actually hear him? Like go ahead and say things so that see. Okay, uh, can you hear me now better? Let me try to increase my, my volume maybe. Um, Okay, so I, I can I can hear you. I just want to make sure parents um, can. It's just a little bit soft on my side. Um, okay, JP. So I I do wanted to um to start by saying that um, if we could try our best to avoid mentioning name okay. of anybody involved, uh, mainly just to be diligent just to sure. be sort of cautious uh, i know it's hard because sometimes it's just kind of a habit you just kind of mention name but that's okay uh yeah. but it's just, it's just oh katie said the sound is going out um mark uh lynn said i can hear him said okay good okay so is the sound, sound's not out right um 
And then, um, Rael, can you respond to Maggie's asking for the link that you should share? It's heroesforchildrenrights.org, um, yeah, I think. Yeah, putting it in yes. the chat right now. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, JP, so thank you so much for being here. So JP sure. is a father, um, and his story is also really crazy. So uh, I won't preamble it with anything. Why don't we just go right into it? Like, let's start with, you know, you go ahead. Like, where did, where did it start and what's, what's going on? Right. Um, as I was saying, I mean, I, uh, when I talk to you, to you guys on the phone, um, like anybody, I'm sure in this, on this call, the situation that we all go under are so complex that we could talk for hours. So I'm going to try to give a cliff note or ESPN version of it. So basically, I've dealt with a custody battle with my ex-wife, who um, happened to be a working actress in Hollywood, but um, it's only relevant because of a little bit later. Um, and um, so it was ongoing since 2014. And then um, I'm not even going to mention the details of the uh, of sort of the, the custody battle, which I, I had to fight most of it on my own because I ran out of money really quickly. I mean, I was dealing with somebody that was making a lot more money than me, especially at that time. So- um, Sorry, how, how old was your child, your son, right? How old was your son at the time? So when we separated, uh, my son was not quite, he was a year and two months old. And um, she moved out of state for, for shooting reasons. So I was, I managed to actually fight my way back to court by myself to try to get some custody rights. And so I managed to get, um, so child support, so I could travel three weekends out of the month to uh, that location. And it was in Louisiana. And so, so I did that for two years and it was fine. It was great. Actually, I mean, it was, it was decent. It was, we were doing okay. And then um, my son's mom had to come back to, to LA because that that show got canceled or no, she got canceled actually. And then uh, for about a year, we did really well. I mean, to the point that uh, we had a great custody arrangement. Um, it, it, I mean, people didn't know we were not together. That's how well we were doing. And so uh, things went south when in the summer of 2018, um, mom decided to go to another country and shoot another TV show without and giving me a two days notice saying, hey, just uh, figure it out. Basically, uh, I'm going there. And so that's when I had to file. Um, and had I known the implications of that, maybe I would have done it differently back then now that I know. But um, at the time you go to a lawyer and it's like, oh, that's child abduction. You got to file. And I went to the police station a few times and I mean, literally like three times with a friend of mine. And even the policeman said, listen, we can arrest her at the airport or um, which I thought, I don't want my son to see that. Or you just take things um, on a legal standpoint and you wait until she gets there and then we'll, you know, we'll take it from there. So I decided to go for that one. And because, um, again, I didn't want my, my son to go through that trauma. That's just traumatic. And um, so it started the, the long year um, battle in court. Um, I got to bring my son back. So basically what I was doing at the time, I was, um, I, I, I gained my custody, custodial right back. So while she was shooting over there, two weeks out of the month, Basically, I would I would go go there, and I can say the country it doesn't matter, uh, to Canada and pick him up and and fly back. And then the the opposite was true. I would I would go there, drop him off, and fly back. I would just turn around, and I did that for for a year. But then that show got canceled, so she had to come back to to LA. Sorry, um, I I wanted to kind of like slow down for a moment just so yeah. that we don't miss details. Um, okay, so. Um, you guys separated. He was one year old, really young. Mother got a job in another state, took mm -hmm. the child, and then you had to go and file for custody and was able to get, you know, three weekends or whatever a month. And so you were doing that and you guys get along fine. Mother lost the job in that state, came back, 
And so, okay, things are fine. And then mother got another job in another country and decided to just take off and said, you know, that's your problem. Let you know two days in advance and then just took off. So now you said you went to court, uh, you went to the police and they said they could arrest her, but you chose not to do that. So mm -hmm. you went to court and you were filing for what in order to get him back? Um, it was child abduction back then. It was okay. the, the lawyer said that that's what it was, which looking back, I wish I, I, I had done things differently. It could have been done a different way because I think that completely pissed her off uh, for sure. So she, she thought she was not abducting our child, although, I mean, it was a two days notice. I didn't know how I was going to figure out um, how to get there and, and so forth because I'm not American yet. I'm still a legal resident. So um, I'm sorry. So it was a child abduction case. Is this in the civil court or is this a criminal case? No, it was a family court. Um, it was in family court. OK, I understand. Yeah, because when you said you were doing it yourself, that that that's why I was asking. OK, so you went to court, uh, filed for child abduction and then was able to get custody, got the court to give you custody. And she's then comply with that, but she was very mad because now she felt like she lost, right? She felt that you have triggered this ego uh, triggering in her. So now you were able to see your child. And then after a while, mother lost the job in that country. She came back. Okay, this is where we're up to. So, and then what happened? Yeah, so uh, when she came back, we were, we're again, what we're doing okay, uh, but I knew something was up. I just could sense it, something was up because I, I could see the signs. And, um, and then all of a sudden, because um, keep in mind, I was, she was paying me child support because she was making, I think like, like 15, 20 times more than I was making. So the court doesn't think, they think, where's the money? And then they, that's the way they do. And she was not giving me that much, but you know, I, the, but when she stopped doing that, and she knew that I kind of needed that to defend myself also, if the case came to, uh, to court again, and um, I, she, stopped, she stopped paying child support like, I don't know, July, and then I left her three months to figure it out because she didn't have enough money anymore. Um, so after three months, I, I went to the child support services and, and just reported it. I said, listen, and she's, I don't care about the money, but it's, it's like, we need to comply to the orders. That's why we go through all of this, not for somebody to not comply. And then um, within a week, I got, I got slapped with um, um, sexually molesting my child or something along those lines. So DC. Right, right. Sorry. Right. Hold, hold, hold up a second. Okay. So Okay, so mother thought now started to so mother's back to the country. You guys continue with your court order, but then mother now thought, okay, um, I'm making all this money and I'm paying child support, so he has the money. So if I take the money away, it will kind of like damage you and prevent you from having the the resources that you need in order to assert your rights so she stopped paying child support mm -hmm. and you were not able to do anything about that for three months and then you went and finally speak to someone about it and go hey i'm not getting paid for child support and now this is when the campaign of false allegations started out of nowhere suddenly now there's an allegation that you sexually molested your child right okay Please little continue. detail that I need to add to that is that um, before she stopped paying child support, we had gone to court and I, I went on a four day trial against two senior uh, lawyers. So I, I controlled the damages, so to speak. So she didn't find, she was not found guilty for child abduction. And, and at the same time, she gained a little bit of, um, of ground when it came to the custody because we had about 40, 60 percent, you know. And now she, we still stayed within the same amount of time, but she gained what we call um, tie-breaking authority over health and education. And that's important because not only did she take him out of school, went to a completely different school, but also she was, um, she did not have to comply to any agreements with me when it came to choosing a therapist. And that's when things got really bad because what happened is that overnight, um, again, it's hard not to get into too much details, but overnight, um, I was slapped with a child 
molestation, sexually molesting my child. And within, within weeks of that, um, my ex-wife sent my son to the ER uh, for um, tantrums, whatever. And so she actually sent him, because she had the tie-breaking authority, she sent him to a different therapist. She chose three different therapists in town and, um, and then sent my son to uh, the ER at, UC, at UCLA or USC, I think. And, and then from there, he, he went to two weeks in, in a, a child at UCLA for ch- the, um, what is the equivalent? It would be a pediatric aisle, but for children that are at risk like of committing, committing suicide or something like that. So he was in lockdown for two weeks. And um, that was the hardest time probably of my life <clears throat> because I could only see him, parents could only see him one hour a week, uh, a day. So he could see his parents two, two hours a day and he was six years old. So he had to learn how to sleep on his own for two weeks without, the, without his parents for absolutely no reason that he could think of. And so, you know, came that sort of... Um, campaign to to try to get me basically to try to dcfs got involved dcfs said absolutely not the problem of the father it's the mother who's being uh, abusive emotionally and psychologically we got an evaluation done during the trial that really showed that she had like four major issues like psychological issues where i had none you know i had no, nothing to to speak of um and so Despite of that, it was sent to the juvenile court and the court completely dismissed it, just completely overlooked the fact that DCFS, that no mom is the problem. Somehow they managed to do that. And so it, it was sent back to the family court. And then in the family court, in the meantime, I had been slapped with a, um, a supervised visitation based on the allegations. So the judge mistakenly went back to that order, although DCFS completely proved that it was false. So I was, so April of 2019, that was the last time I saw my son and it was under supervised visitation. And I mean, even that, that alone was just excruciating because the judge, the judge decided that, that the, 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 the person that was supposed to do the supervised visitation with me um, had to be a French and English speaking person. And I mean, that was so hard to find in LA. And then when I found one, mom always dis- disputed the choice. So I, I resorted to have it, to having the one she decided, otherwise I was not gonna see my son. So I was stuck either way. And so when uh, when I got that, that person to supervise that visitation, she lied. She couldn't speak French and she made up a story that I was, anyway. So all that was just stacked up against me and it, it, went, it went down that way. And so I stopped seeing Sebastian I mean, my son, well, Sebastian, no, when he was um, six and six and a half, and it was April 6th, I believe, 2019, and um, I haven't seen him since. Sorry. Wow. Like, talking about, talking about a broken system where you were slapped with false allegation of child abuse, sexual abuse of <laughs> your son, and, and you were able to fight that. Mm-hmm. Clean your name, but yet the system still fail yeah. to recognize that. Like talking about broken system, and and she had so much more resources, financial resources. So she had lawyers team behind her, and you were fighting on your own. Uh, and you in a country that is not your first language, let alone mm-hmm. anything else. And you don't have the financial resources. Your and, and here you're emotionally destroyed because you don't get to see your son and you have to deal with the others. And, and then the other thing I wanted to brought up is this is what abusers do is they will go to great lengths to destroy their children mm-hmm. for what? In order to win over their ex-spouse. Like you see the last story, like the mm-hmm. mother lost a child for 28 years and the father destroy this girl's life, like isolated her from the rest of the world and, yeah. you know, no schooling, nothing. And now she has no ability to, to have any income because she had no skill whatsoever. And she's never been allowed outside the house. So the father was going to great length to do what? Just so that he can win over the mother. 
-hmm. you know it's the kind of like the kind of thing the destruction on human life that these people are willing to go out that way to do and and jp just talk about she put her son at six years old into a mental institute essentially yes yeah. so just to punish jp and this child is scarred for life because of that unfortunately like the kind of length that abusers will do and i know you guys in the chat room experience this in your life this is why we're working on a book um and we by we i mean i'm one of the collaborator with other international um people that are working in the field of psychology and mental health uh, and the book is it's, it's about vicarious violence which is um essentially what it is is you seeing you may not be the direct uh, victim of an abuse but because you're experiencing it like through your child so you seeing your child in the hospital you're hurt and you're devastated and you're seeing that abuse you are experiencing the violence vicariously and so that's what vicarious violence is because the reason we, we're writing this book and it's going to release on parental alienation awareness day is because a lot of people refuse to recognize parental alienation even though they recognize vicarious violence and it's vicarious violence is actually in the dsm um it's not in the term vicarious violence, but it, I think it's called uh, secondary trauma or something like that. It's under PTSD. Uh, if you go through that, where they talk about experience the trauma through other people, and they have example of I think fire uh, fighter, you know, seeing victims or you no know, doctors seeing victim of you know trauma, and then they themselves feel the trauma, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what you. JP experience and you guys in the chat room, uh, I would love to hear your experience if you feel your pain when you see your children being abused and feeling like you have you, you're not able to do anything to rescue your children like that kind of trauma is, is on top of the direct attack on you, which is crazy. Um, so Marina said I feel for for you it's still a similar story I am an immigrant as well, and my ex is rich and i didn't commit any abuse and yet um, father imposed bilingual supervisor and i'm god and now kids are severely alienated yeah it's, it's really crazy story and, so, and i think to, to add to that i would say as parents i think we can all agree that we would we would cut our arms or you know our, le our legs for our, our children so so we're okay with the pain that we suffer because we're adults that's what parents do, right? It's sacrificial love. Things that the abusers have no notion of, absolutely not. I think they all suffer from mental illnesses, to be frank. But um, right. the, the, and as we, we go further in my story, and you know what I went through, the fact of seeing my child, um, you know, waving from a distance um, to me when I had to leave the hospital, it's an image I'll never, I'll never forget. And... Um, and and that's pain, that's pain because and, and it's not. <clears throat> I, I don't care what 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 mom wants to do with me. I'm not even angry at her. I'm not even bitter at her. I, I don't I don't try to you know get revenge because two wrongs doesn't make one right. Uh, I, my my life will not be fulfilled if she, if she when if she goes to jail. Uh, it, it's all about the child. And the child is the most innocent thing we have in life. This is this is the next best thing to God. I mean, so um, the fact that somebody would do that deliberately to my child, that is unfathomable to me. And I and I, I from from this experience, I know because I know the story of uh, Mike's wife. She was abused as a child, like actually abused sexually and so forth. So, so there's a point where mental illness needs to be to be taken care of because some people are doing a lot of harm. And uh, maybe not willingly and so forth, but then again, you know, you need to get help and you need to recognize you've got a problem, just like any other abuse sort of or addiction. And, and I think that's where we fail as a society because we're missing the point. And you're right, uh, parental alienation is completely undermining. I mean, I had the, the, the judge who, by the way, got sidelined after this whole story because clearly they must have realized that she didn't know what she was doing. But she almost she scoffed at the fact that we mentioned parental alienation. It was like, what are you talking about? Like it doesn't exist. <laughs> what? 
So um, it's, it's, a, it's a strange time in, in, in uh, the legal system, how backward they are. I mean, either by lack of uh, desire or, or knowledge, or just really just, is it by design? I mean, you just, once, once you have to wonder who's benefit, benefiting from this, because you can't be that bad. And, and I'm European and Europe is nowhere near that. You would never be able to get away with that. And, and I'd like to mention the fact that the well, court system- actually, yeah. I, I, I don't know about that. Like you mentioned, it's better in Europe. But yeah, there's yeah. certain things are better, but mm -hmm. actually parental alienation is a problem, is a worldwide problem. Right now we are streaming sure. to a page, it's called Parental Alienation UK. Mm -hmm. Now, that's in Europe. And we have a huge following in UK. We're streaming to a page right now in Portuguese, mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, huge, massive following there. Massive problem everywhere, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that you mentioned, so actually there's a comment in the chat room by Brian earlier, I think he said, let's not forget that there's an anti parental alienation movement of the academic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, and that's the thing is there's a whole movement of people that are trying to deny that parental alienation is real. And unfortunately, um, they, um, some of it is driven by people with vested interests, you know, the lawyers and then the people that benefit from this. And on top of that, people that are supposedly advocates, but there's a huge amount of funding from the government to fund gender bias and ideology based uh, mm -hmm. movement and so they actually very well resourced because of the funding there's actually i think somebody else in the chat room earlier mentioned there's billions of dollars in funding unfortunately and so um they have vested interest in pushing this and then mm -hmm. on top of that we have another group of people that simply are not aware and when you hear something loudly and then you know when they're touting this thing about child abuse hey, who doesn't want to help Mm -hmm. you know so they think that they're doing the right thing so then when they hear misinformation and they want to do the right thing they get onto the wrong campaign and they get around to the wrong movement and that's why we do see judges we do see lawyers we do see therapists we do see you know um people involved in the child protective agency we do see legislators that got this wrong because they they just don't understand it because the problem is very complex it's so complex that really it takes a lot for yeah. you. First of all, it's really hard to understand it because it seems like fiction. You know, like if you don't experience it yourself, yeah. it's really hard for somebody to comprehend it. And a lot of the time when you talk about it, people just go, well, this is so much drama. No, this can't be true. And there's no way somebody would do go out that length to do X, Y, and Z and all that kind of things, right? So it's just, um, so it's difficult for people to understand. And the next thing is, even if they have good intention to try to understand, it's so complex that it takes a lot for people to get. And that's why, unfortunately, you get people, like you said, your judge, who doesn't get it. And then she went and turned around and empowered an abuser because of that. Um, and, and that's just terrible. Absolutely. Um, right. So, yeah. So then uh, what happened from that point? You... Um, you, you now uh, have supervised visit, and then the supervisor, the visits, the visitation supervisor, um, is not who she said she actually was. She lied. She was chosen by your ex, and um, now she fabricates some other story about you, um, about the time of your visit, and then so then you have some supervised visit, and then what happened? So I had one supervised visitation because she, they made it so Im impossible for me to get my own uh, monitor. So we got that. And then um, during that time, so it was April. So during that time, um, again, I was trying desperately to get a monitor to be approved by her. And um, during that time, never mind that I hadn't seen my son for well, some time now, six months, a uh, mom for nine months. She came up with, based on my son's saying during the therapy session uh saying that if if he told the truth uh dad would kill mom came out of the blue and said something like that which and again uh, keep in mind my son went through five forensic interviews five lapd dcfs the bureau you name it five of them 
So, and every time the first two, he was always saying, no, Papa never did anything, never did it. And then the third one, they started leading questions, which was, I mean, I saw them all. At one point I saw them all. So that was like frightening to see how they were basically abusing my son in those, in those in, in, um, interviews. But um, so during one of those um, therapy sessions, he, he said that, that, that word, that phrase. So that was enough uh, for them to file a restra temporary restraining order against me. So then I was for sure not even allowed to, to, to even contact them. And that restraining order was supposed to be fought within three weeks, like it's legally the case. Well, the judge decided, oh, you have a court, you have a trial upcoming very soon, very close to that day, that three weeks. So might as well bundle everything together. Sure, except that the trial kept being kept being postponed for a, a different reason, but it kept being postponed. And so here I was for another year and a half, basically, um, without without a without a a trial. So I kept waiting, but in the meantime, I couldn't see my, I couldn't defend my, um, my restraining or I couldn't go against it. So instead of three weeks, it kept on and I couldn't see my, my kid. So finally. Right. Yeah. Sorry. I, I wanted to jump in and I apologize yeah. for interrupting. Um, yeah. I know that uh, JP trying to avoid uh, certain details, but essentially this is something that is um, classic uh, behaviors that, that abuser use is that they use a system to mm -hmm. delay and drag things out um, and so they're throwing all sort of false allegation campaign mm -hmm. and getting all sort of different you know um, organization involved that that just completely misguided and even though you might be able to clear your story but now by then you know your case has been dragged out and your children's growing up and this is what we see over and over again you just end up with false allegation after false allegation and, and they get everybody involved and all these different people involved and the more people involved, the more muddle um, the, the water looks and, and the worse the case looks. And in the meanwhile, you don't have any access to your children and the case being dragged out. And um, so so this end up like instead of a, a, having some kind of justice within three weeks, the case get dragged out for over a year. Right, you never end up getting to go back to court for more than a year, right? right? And then the other thing I want to point out is that JP mentioned about leading question for children. Uh, now we had uh, two very important interviews that I did in the past that I don't want you guys to miss. So please go into the video tab of our Victim to Hero Facebook page. So if you go to our Victim to Hero Facebook page, go into the videos tab, there are two videos of experts in the field of children memory. It's so important that they talk to you about how to deal with this kind of situation because yeah, children can be misled and then children can then actually became truly believed in the mm -hmm. full story. And then children can actually go and thought that you actually did, even though even though at the beginning they knew the truth, but because of all these mm -hmm. false uh, memory uh, campaign, they turn around and actually truly, be truly believe that you molested them or you abused them. Yeah. And there's, there's been incredible study in the past. There's, there's some study that even show how um, children, um, and this actually went on the TV and it became a huge thing for a long time, how there's a study that they went and, and did this study. And back then, you know, in the past, you can do study on children you know, now there's all sort of ethic issues that they can't do that kind of study anymore. But in the past, they did. And it went on TV and you can actually still find those videos on on YouTube. Um, but in those two videos that I did, they mentioned those those studies. So you guys can look it up. It's crazy because they show study of how, you know, they have these children that are completely normal and healthy. And then they show the study of how they would do certain thing and 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 kind of leading. And then suddenly these children turn around completely has this like absolutely false memory and it's vivid false memory with details and they truly wholeheartedly believe that that's the truth mm -hmm. so it's crazy and this happened a lot in court so this study actually pointed out how this interview and the more interviews you do the more you solid solidify the false information so you know your your son um your children go through this, you know, investigation by the DCFS, by the, like the CPS, the, the police, by anybody. It's just making things worse, if, especially if they are not experienced. So 
it's really requiring the right kind of people, the right kind. So uh, the two experts that we interview um, actually um, is Dr. Loftus and Dr. I, I apologize, I forgot her name, Mary something. But if you just search for memory, I think like false memory in the videos tab, you'll find those two videos. They talk about how you can like, especially in court, how you can like dissect this to try mm -hmm. to help your situation. So I would definitely recommend looking into that if you can. Sure. Um, and, and I apologize, JP, please continue. No, no, so no. now you, your case got dragged out. So it got dragged out and it got to the point where uh, we finally got a court hearing. Like finally, we're like, yes, we get one judge, a new judge to commit to a date. And um, we are, the date is supposed to be January 20th, 22nd, uh, 2020. So um, at, during the, the, after the false allegations, I, I did get a lawyer who uh, is a, it's kind of like an angel to me, honestly, um, would not charge me an arm and a leg. As a matter of fact, uh, if I were to pay him normally, like a normal lawyer, I, I'll probably owe him hundreds of thousands of dollars, but he's, he, he was not in for the money. He just was pissed off by the injustice. So just like an, seriously an angel. And um, so, um, together, we, we decided to um, for me to do an ex parte to file a document on January 8th to depose her main witness, which was the therapist that said all those things about me, although she never, never met me. Ah. Or like, so we're like, OK, let's go. So I, I go to I tell her lawyer that I'm going to do an ex parte the next day. And I think it was a Monday. And um, she... I go to court, I, I file my document, I'm waiting in the courtroom in, at Stanley Mosque in LA and waiting for my turn. And uh, I get approached by deputies who ask me to, um, to identify if I am who I am. I say yes, and they ask me to follow them outside and I get arrested. So I'm like, and they're asking me if I know why I'm getting arrested. I said, no, but I know I have a, um, contentious um, custody battle with my ex-wife. That's all I know. He said, okay, well, it's related to that. We'll explain when we get to the police station. So I get a, I get arrested in court, <laughs> walk through the whole court uh, handcuffed. And uh, so I, I get sent, sent to a men's central, central jail in, in LA, downtown. And basically what happened is that during that um, time, where I had a restraining order that wasn't being um, dealt with. My ex and my son flew out of state and went to back to Louisiana. And uh, she did what's called forum shopping, which is illegal. Uh, when you have a trial pending in a, in a state, you can't just go to another one and just try, try your luck somewhere else. So, but she did, and she found somebody to pick up whatever she said as truth. And I believe she paid some sheriff, some deputy over there. And what they did is that on, on. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. I, I, mm -hmm. I apologize for interrupting. I, I don't want us to miss, um, before we get into that, um, mm -hmm. I don't want us to miss an important part earlier, which is, um, so you waited, it, it, your case got dragged out for over a year. And then finally mm -hmm. you got a court date. You go to court hoping that you get justice, but you, instead of, getting to get your case heard, you got arrested because mm. she had went ahead and filed a false allegation against you mm -hmm. without ever serving you. So he right. was not served on a case. And because he was not served, it was, uh, it was um, ruled as default. So right. he was then now a criminal, even though he never, never knew about the case, so sure. now they arrested him. So now he's in jail. Yeah. Not only he doesn't get his justice, he's now in jail. Um, so I wanted to clarify that. So now sure. in the meanwhile, she went to a different state and then tried to file a new case over there. Right. Even though the jurisdiction is in California, yeah. you mentioned Stanley Moss. I know that courthouse. It's, it's on Hill Street in the middle of the city. Exactly. Uh, and that hallway that you described, I vividly know what that hallway looks like. It looks like a movie set, a sci-fi movie set. It's marble, long, cold, mm -hmm. hot, 
hallway with light. I really still remember looking at it and think, wow, this looks like a sci-fi set. And here you are, handcuffed, dragged through in front of everybody down that hallway. Oh, and by the way, the family court is all the way at the end of that hallway to get to the other side, to the Hill Street. Oh, yeah. I know this courtroom really well. And not to mention department two is like on the very bottom. So you got to go all the, go all the escalators back to the main, to the main um, entrance. So yeah, yeah. I was only hoping I would not run into somebody I knew. That's really what my thought at the time, like so embarrassing. Talking about humiliation and talking yeah. about your, your yeah. sense of self, yeah. like talking about destruction, like you, like you never got run into the law before, no. like you would, like for any parents, like for any people out there, you would just want to give up on, on anything because it's just like, this is too much, right? Like that's talking about the fear tactic the abuser yeah. is using. Yeah. Well, it's intimidation and bullying, right? That's all it is. So, um, exactly it. And, and if you're fearful and if you're, um, <clears throat> what I believe, you know, God gives you the strength as, as you go, you know, grow your wings on your way down. You just, you just do you because you have to, because it's not about you. It's about your child. So, um, so yeah, it's it, embarrassing. It's, it's um, traumatic in a lot of ways, but, um, but yeah, I went through there and uh, uh, at one point, uh, so I was in, uh, in that jail, we have a lot of uh, gang bangers. I mean, that, that experience alone was something else. And by the way, I'm writing a book about this whole thing because I have to remember it, you know, it's, uh, it's very, it's gonna be cathartic for me, I think. And it's, for, it's also important for my son to understand what I went through for, for him, just because I, I wanna be with him. And um, so after three weeks in LA, I got extradited to, um, to Louisiana, and then I spent 122 days total in jail for them just to realize that they had nothing. So, and you apparently they can't do that. Uh, so you can be, because the thing is, uh, this time she accused me of not just sexual molestation, I supposedly raped my own son when he was one and a half to three and a half. Um, yes, yeah. so this is, went through um, seven years right and and you know your son was having like and this is after she apparently knew that you raped him and had no problem with him like you guys having normal contact all this false allegation only blew up at the end yeah. when she finally really wanted to win and her ego is triggered and she wanted to teach you a lesson but mm -hmm. all those years there was it, it, it was truly that you raped him when he was one there's no way she would have been okay for you to have normal contact with him and fly him back from Canada back to the US all those years. So talking about false allegation, talking about the extent that the abuser will do, and yet the system is so blind. And like how, like she should be in jail. If, if yeah. you think that your child was, was raped at one, Right. And yet you're okay for the raper to see right. him all these years. You should be in jail. Exactly. That's true. That's so that true. doesn't make sense whatsoever. No, not to mention that we obviously between now and then we had a lot of medical, you know, testing that were done on him for, for a variety of different reasons. You know, when he was sick, that you would go to the doctor. And that's the first thing they look at. I mean, as a matter of fact, we went, when we went uh, for the allegations at first, when we went to US, they went to USC, they, didn't, they clearly showed there was no sign of anything, nothing, not even a bruise. Mm -hmm. So that would have been seen right there, uh, even at six, you know, and, and not to mention that, I mean, the, the change of behavior and I mean, all of that, that, those obvious signs that, no, it's just that she was, she knew she was losing the case. So she went for the, um, for the Hail Mary, I think. And, and, um, and so she almost got it. To be honest, and and while I was in jail, I know for a fact that she contacted somebody that uh, used to work there to see if I can get, you know, dealt with. Uh, so, and I know that for a wow. fact. Yeah. So. Uh, wow. So she was um, trying to clean up. Yeah. Well, if it's, it's gone, there was no case anymore, right? Right. She mm -hmm. she will be that would be done. Yeah. Wow. Talking about the extent of. Um, that is insane like the level of insanity the and 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 to be in jail for for four months without anything like uh, i saw my kids that i have i experienced something similar i'm i 
I'm curious too, actually, I'm sure that many parents in the chat room have experienced false allegation mm -hmm. of abuse, of neglect, of sometimes it's in court, sometimes it's with a child protective agency, sometimes with school, sometimes with your family and friends, sometimes it's to you, sometimes it's to the child. Um, there's different level of false allegation. I'm curious to hear your experience, actually, because I'm sure a lot of you experience this. Mm -hmm. um, well, it is a strong card, you know, uh, yeah, right, yeah. It is a trump it's a card. What, it's, sorry. It's, it's a trump card. You know, it's like when everything fails, that's that's a given. Especially, I think. Well, may, I was going to say maybe if you're a man, you, you're probably going to get that more. But but, but but that that may not even be true. I think it goes both ways. But because um, I've I've heard stories too of women being, and I'm like, how, how can that even be? I mean, physically feasible, but. Um, but never mind. It's it's the system is so damaged. It's unbelievable. And um, and yeah, so I. I, I think it's it's with good intention. The, what the system wanted to do is, oh, sure. we wanted to make sure that we protect the victim as quickly as possible. So if there is an allegation of abuse, we have to quickly and swiftly, like, you know, deal with the perpetrator, supposed perpetrator. And then unfortunately, abuser will use that as a tool. So then they use that to create false allegation and then the system effectively go, oh, the child abuse, right? And people are trying to do the right thing. So the system is with good intention, but totally broken and really not functioning um, at all. And it, it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, and, and so, yeah, so that's the system. And then on top of that, like we were talking about before, we have people that have vested interests, and then we have people that are just completely misguided Mm -hmm. with good intention because they hear oh child abuse i want to do the right thing i want to protect children i mean who doesn't want to protect children mm -hmm. so then when they hear they they end up on the wrong side so now you're in jail and and i saw dimitri said i had false allegation trying to end my military career it, wow. it's crazy yeah. um whoa apparently he was accused of ordering her his uh, five years old daughter to rape the three years old cousin, like that's just insanity. Like the kind of like it's, it's fact is stranger than fiction. The yeah. kind of thing that the abuser will, the extent that they will go through, and and it's and, just and something that needs to be said about that is that in the mind of some people, I want to say that the people that will just believe anything they see on TV, uh, in their minds, there's no you coming back from that. Like the energy you're going to spend trying to disprove that is is a waste of time and energy. Uh, because there's nothing that they can hear from you that will make them change their mind. So for anybody that's been accused of anything like that, just keep being a good person. Just keep keep doing what you're doing and, and being an innocent person, living his life. Because if they can't figure it out, it's not, it's not for you to, to try to change that. It's just a waste of time. Uh, I, I noticed that because of, of uh, some interactions that I had with parents that I used to know from the school that my son used to go in. And I, if they don't need to say anything. I just I just see the, the eyes and the looks and it's like, you, you think I'm, I may be guilty of that, don't you? And there's no, no talking about it. It's just I'm moving on to the people that know me, you know, that know who I am. And, and thank God in, in jail, I had a lot of support from around the world because, you know, I, I've lived in different places. And, and it, it was and that was um, that was life changing in a lot of ways for me, too. Never, so you were penalized without ever getting a yeah, chance to absolutely. to have absolutely. yeah like we're talking about in the public eyes and in the yeah. family and friend system you you essentially they, they throw you under the bus without ever hearing you um, but i i do want to ask though to be in jail for four months having never ever had to deal with you know anything before like trying to be always a good citizen always a good guy and then now certainly now you're in jail for four months what was it like and how do you even manage to be today be here talking and like it's incredible strength well i would say this i'd say only by the grace of god honestly um i don't know where everybody has, is on this call as far as their faith but that's that's the only thing that carried me through to be honest because i have every reason to be scared out of out of my wits again i mean la was um gangbangers like i could hear them we they they had chanting going on i mean it was one of those jailhouse rock looking cells like 
I mean, just it's four in there. I mean, it was just, you know, they told me not to go outside and get showered. And so you would do the, the bird, bird bath and all that. But um, so that was three weeks. And that was, I mean, I heard grown up men cry all night long. You know, it's, 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 it's a scary place. Uh, but um, although I, w- I, I never feared for my life because I was okay to lay my life down so that my son could be um, found or that I knew I was doing the right thing. So I was okay with that. I, I re- even remember thinking, and I was uh, 52 at the time, I said, God, if, if this is it for me, if this is it, uh, I'm okay with that. And, and letting go of surrendering to that. Uh, but again, um, I, I, I was... Uh, I, fe- I found so many blessings while I was there. Um, I'll give you a quick, a quick example. The first cell I went into, which um, was, they had, I had two black gentlemen and one Latino, and the, one of the black guys said to me right away, because we, we got a Bible study going on right there, and he said, you're, a, you're an answer prayer. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> so uh, he, he was praying for a believer to be in the cell the next time because they had one guy that left. And so we did Bible studies there. And I never had so much fellowship than when I was in jail, to be honest. Um, there was a lot of horror stories there from hearing what, what especially in Louisiana, because Louisiana, those guys that were in the pod with me, and there were about 24 guys, I think, um, half of them were innocent. I'm convinced of that without knowing their cases. You just can judge people. And when you go into that, that environment, your primitive instincts kick in. So as a man, you or a woman, you, you, you just know how to survive. You know, it's, it's amazing how we instinctively know who is who, what you need to do and not to do. And there's a lot of segregation in there, especially in LA. But, um, but then you get, you get support. You get support right away. The, the, the Christians know they stick together. And like I said, I, I had fellowship every night. We had a Bible study every night. And just um, the support that I got from overseas, from my friends in LA and around the world, really, like letters. And and also I, I, I let my government know that what was going on. So they got on it like right away. So we, my only fear was that the, the, the system was so corrupt that I would they would try to come up with false evidence and stuff. But thank God that I was protected in that respect. So uh, I was. I'm sorry. I, would, uh, I want. I want to get clarification. You said okay. So you're because you're not a U.S. citizen. Mm-hmm. You contacted your. Um, I apologize, JP. Um, um, we're gonna pause this. Is that okay? And yeah. then we'll come back. Um, sure. I do have a legislator that coming on. I, okay. I want to. I know that his his time. Yeah, his yeah. Timeline is short. Yeah. I apologize. No and worries. No we'll words. come back to you. You okay, parents, um, and I apologize for this. Okay, um, and I see you in a bit, JP. Just stay, hang tight. I'm okay. going to, um, yeah. I'm sorry. Hello, Rep. Raymond. Hi there. Um, let me. Am I on there? Yes, we okay. can see you. We can hear you. Thank you so much for being here today. This way, is that better or does it matter? No, you're on the side now. (laughs) Okay. All right. That's that's good. Different services do different things. And so I wanted to make sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so grateful that you're here today. Really appreciate you, especially with such short notice, too. Um, So today, uh, it's actually, you know, what we're trying to do is uh, interference of child custody. Um, awareness day and so far we have had um, some crazy crazy story of parents that lost their children for decades and then because of interference with child custody you know children get taken to Mexico with uh, with their identity chain and you know the other parents held the kid that the parents the other parent had died and the children didn't even know anything of their real identity and all that kind of crazy thing and then they had to hire a detective and find the children and bring back. And then, and then the system failed because there's a, a statute of limitation in Texas. Uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot about this in a, in a, in a bit. But before we go into that, um, I wanted to introduce you to everyone. Um, so we are very honored here. Uh, I think I have, there's a bit of an echo. Okay, we are very honored here today to have with us um, Texas Rep uh, Richard Raymond. Um, 
in the House of Texas. And so the reason we are so honored to have him because he was actually really the the leader, the cheerleader for for parents of our community, because he actually in the last session is is when he actually filed a bill that we are so grateful for, by the way, thank you, um, a bill that is to do with interference with child custody. So interference with child custody, as we mentioned, um, has been in the statute in the criminal in the criminal statute in Texas for a long time, but it doesn't get enforced. Um, and so what Rep. Raymond did is actually file a bill to try to get this enforced by um, um, he put a bill together where you know like instead of uh, because a lot of the time the district attorney office think that oh this is too serious so we. Um, uh, we don't want to like you know put a parent in jail just because the parent keeping the child kind of thing. Um, so what he did is he then um, filed a bill that said, okay, instead of doing something too drastic immediately, why don't we give them a fine, a ticket, essentially it's just like a parking ticket. But you know once it's kind of built up for a bit, and I'm, I apologize, I should let you explain this. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Why don't I let you explain your bill. I apologize, please. Not, not at all. I'm glad, glad to do it. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, can you hear me okay before I proceed? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, can you guys in the chat room hear him okay? Uh, if you can let us know. Can you all hear me okay there? Yes. So last, uh, just, just for years, really a few years working, trying to figure out how we could get more enforcement of uh, the criminal law that we have in Texas, uh, if a parent defies uh, or doesn't comply with a court order, that is, you know, when parents get divorced or when custody is established and the judge approves that order and, you know, the non-custodial parent uh, has, you know, the right to go get the child during certain times and the parent, the other parent doesn't comply, uh, it, you know, um, uh, it's true that, that it appears that uh, law enforcement is hesitant to um, arrest that parent and then for the prosecutors to prosecute the case. They'll do it, I don't know how many times, but certainly we hear uh, more examples of where it's not being done because it's viewed as a, a civil dispute that needs to be go needs to go back before the judge. Uh, if, if one of the parents is not complying with the order, on visitation, then that they need to go back to the judge. But in fact, under Texas law, it's a violation. It's a, it's, uh, it's I'm a, sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting. But uh, isn't that ridiculous? Because they already gone to court, had a court order, which is this piece of paper, and then yet the law enforcement refused to enforce it and said, go back to court to get another piece of paper. Like you didn't respect the first piece of paper. You tell me to go another piece of paper that is the same. Like, why is that? Just, that in itself is kind of ridiculous. And by the way, I saw Samantha said thank you for joining us. I saw uh, JP uh, and Mikey and Lynn and Jennifer. Like everyone's very grateful that you hear Melissa, Mara, and yeah, they all can hear you. Um, and um, yes, and then there's someone that's sharing. Um, your profile um, on the Texas legislature website. Um, okay, so. Please, so I think that, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to, you know, argue it for them. I, I, I guess I can I try to figure out why they do things or don't do things in force or not in force or why they take the position. You know, you need to take it back to the judge and and tell the judge that they're that they're not complying with a court order. Presumably, I think, you know, they're figuring, well, if you take it back to the judge and the judge hears the complaint, well, then maybe the judge will take the child away from you and give the other parent, you know, the, the, make the other parent the custodial or primary custodian, et cetera, right? I, I guess. But in any event, to your point, that uh, there are a lot of uh, parents out there who feel like it's not being enforced. And so I came up with this idea that maybe let's do a city ordinance. So the law that I passed out of the House last year, it didn't pass in the Senate. Uh, we've introduced it again this time, House Bill 969. Um, but if it passes, what it says is cities can, it doesn't say they, they must, it says they may uh, pass an ordinance that if a parent doesn't comply, then the police officer that shows up can look at the order or whatever, 
and make a determination and give that parent a ticket uh, and they can charge up to $500. My, my hope was and is that if that happens and if, if a parent is withholding the child because the other parent is high on drugs or being abusive or doing something wrong, well, then, you know, that I, they should hold them back. But if that's not happening and, and they're holding the child back because they just really don't want it to go, the, the boy or girl to go with the uh, parent, the other parent, then the police officer can make a determination and give them a ticket. And after, my hope is that after two or three tickets, a couple of things would happen. One, uh, it's expensive. And so then the parent who's not complying will begin to comply. But the other thing is, and I, and I came to this conclusion after talking to a lot of district attorneys, is that if a parent gets two or three of these tickets, then the other parent will go to the district attorney and say, hey, this is already two or three times that they're not complying. And, and they've been given tickets and, and, and paid the tickets, maybe at that point, the di district attorney will say, okay, this is a repeat offender, repeat offender, repeat offender, and be more inclined then to prosecute the case because they can still prosecute it. The, the bill that I wrote up and, and that we're trying to get passed does not preclude the, the prosecutors from prosecuting a case like that. Uh, so they can still do it. And my hope is that after two or three times that they would be more likely to then prosecute. So it's kind of a deterrent. It's one, gets a little costly after a while if you get you know, one or two or three of these tickets. Uh, but then after that, it starts to show a pattern that you can take to the DA and the DA, the district attorney, I think, uh, is more likely to, to, uh, to act on it. That's, a, that's the idea. And, you know, in my case, Laredo, where I'm from, the city of Laredo, the city council passed a resolution supporting the bill. So I know that if we pass this bill and make it law, I know the city of Laredo will pass this ordinance. Uh, and then as time was going on, city of Dallas, city of Houston, others showed a great interest in it. So I think that if we pass it, I think a lot of cities will likely uh, have an ordinance that uh, can help us. Uh, you know, make it so that parents are, are more compliant uh, with the court orders on visitation and are less likely to defy the, the order. That's uh, yeah, and I want, right, and I wanted to add in that you did a lot of groundwork leading up to the bill by, you know, working with the city, working with law enforcement, you talked to a lot of people and then, uh, and parents and, um, you know, this year, this session, the bill is coming back, um, you know, on top of what you are pushing, um, you know, I know Claudia has also been pushing a lot. Um, Claudia and I have also talked to like so many organizations and people out there um, to try to bring awareness because you don't want uh, the moment the bill is on the floor for people to try to get to know the bill. You, we want people to get, we want people to if they have any question or concern, you know, you have the opportunity to have conversation before it get thrown out there. So I do want to acknowledge, acknowledge and really appreciate your work to put it to this point. And uh, I mean, last session, it went really well. It, it I mean, went really almost all, all the way to the end. There's, there's some other things that was going on in Texas at the time that, you know, made it a little bit more challenging, but hopefully we'll, we'll get further this time. And I, I do want to acknowledge Claudia's work in this as well. I mean, She's, she's incredible. Um, she worked really hard and tirelessly, talked to so many people. And I remember there were, um, I no longer um, work on the legislation side, but before that, when I was working with her, there's this time that we had just crazy, the number of amount of people that we meet and talk to, like we just have this long list of so many organizations trying to get their buy-in on this. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy and legislators and like we walk the floor of the Capitol building, so many miles in that little <laughs> building. It's just insane. But anyway, thank you so much. So then I know that on top of that, you also talk to the DA uh, office uh, and and go further. This is separate from the bill. Um, do you want to talk about that? Well, just in, again, in, in my county, Laredo is the city, Webb County is the, is the name of the county. And so our district attorney 
uh, Paul Boutron, uh, who is one of my good friends and who's very involved on these issues as well, he and I met with the district attorney uh, because the district attorney's policy was basically if, um, if a parent, uh, you know, didn't comply with the, with the court order three times in a row, three consecutive times, then, uh, then he would prosecute the case. But as we talked to him, we had a long talk with him, went over this issue. And what we saw was happening is like a parent would, would not comply and then the second time would not comply. And then the third time they would comply. So then the next time they wouldn't comply, they wouldn't comply and the third time they would comply. So they were, they were kind of gaming the system, if you will, to not do three in a row. So, so the DA just said, if they do, so his compromise was, if they do three, you know, I think within a year or maybe just three times, I can't remember now, um, he directed his staff to go ahead and prosecute the cases. So, you know, they don't have to be three consecutive times, just three times, and he would move forward with the case. So we feel like that was a, a victory and uh, and I think reasonable. Um, and um, yeah. so. That is so important because um, and, and, and I do want to mention, you mentioned about Paul. So Paul is also a parent that is also a very strong advocate for the community. He has a show called Glove Off, uh, where he interviewed different people and he's also pushing a lot. Um, and, and yeah, he definitely was the original one that helped um, with the creation of this uh, original bill back in the last session. And, uh, you know, when this bill this year coming on um he's committed to go and testify uh with the committee for this so i think yeah definitely uh important to recognize that parents can make a huge difference if you just like take action don't feel like you're too small and then the other thing i do wanted to mention is that um clearly there are two part of it right one is making the law and then the other part is getting that law enforced. So you, you're not only making the law by pushing the bill forward, you're also working with the DA to make sure that the law get enforced. So really, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're going that extra mile to make sure that you, know, you protect the parents and the children. And we are very grateful to you for that. Um, yeah, yeah and, and through the years, uh, again, Paul is really the person who engaged me on this issue. And, um, you know, we believe me i had a lot of meetings at the capitol with da's from around the state district attorneys from around the state and and uh, you know we made progress also in, in getting them to say that they would enforce they would be more diligent in enforcing the law as it is right now i don't know the numbers uh, but i know anecdotally that there's still a lot of cases where you know they're not enforcing it because they they don't want to arrest uh, a parent over an issue like this and prosecute them. But law enforcement didn't want to arrest them because the law, law enforcement said, well, I arrest them, but the DA is not gonna prosecute the case, so why am I gonna bother, basically? And then they would tell the other parent, go back to court and tell the judge what's going on and maybe the judge will change the order. So, you know, we just keep trying um, and hopefully more and more DAs uh, are enforcing the current law, but uh, again, if they, whether or not they do, Regardless whether or not they do, I still think this idea of a city ordinance is a good idea uh, to get bring more attention to the issue and maybe resolve it more often in a less costly way than having to go back in front of a judge or having to go to jail or what have you. Right. Um, I I wanted to mention. Uh, I I'm sorry. I go go blank right now. Um, yeah, so you, you mentioned about, um, yeah, you're meeting with OZ's DA. It's actually very helpful because I remember uh, we were going through uh, and meeting with different legislative offices uh, and talking to them about the bill and trying to get them to vote yes for the bill. And some of them actually asked the question. Uh, I remember they even asked, like, you know, have anyone talked to the DA office? And I remember I text you and asked, and you're like, yeah, yeah, we already talked to them. And that was so helpful because it really changed their mind. We could see it. They like they were concerned, like, are we just changing the law without understanding other potential problem because we are not in the field so we don't understand it and then when they hear that um i mean they they said okay we're gonna go and check but now that you said that we felt a lot better so 
we're going to go and double check. But if, if that's true, like you have our commitment that we're going to vote yes on this bill. And I, I remember that vividly. And that was so helpful to, to have that. So yeah, I, I, I'm so grateful that you go out of your way and do so much groundwork for this. Um, yeah. Well, it's and, important. And it's important to get, you know, we, to have the, the DAs involved because, again, because as, as you pointed out, you have the existing law. And so it's really in their hands right now. So we really, you know, we had a lot of meetings, a lot of talks, a lot of Zooms prior to COVID, during COVID, after COVID. And, you know, um, just you, we had to involve them. And, and it was those discussions that finally, you know, we came up with this and really where it, it clicked in my mind was my city council member, the, the, the one that re represents my district, um, you know, during one of the Zooms said, is, uh, you know, there's something we can do as city council. And that's where I said, oh, well, you know what, why don't we, why don't we let you do an ordinance if that's something you're willing to do. And so that's where the idea just clicked in my mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and parents, I wanted to point out that, um, see, you, you can make the difference because legislators are also human. And, you know, um, Rep. Brayman is a father, so he does understand what it feels like when you lose your children. So, you know, that's why he's going out his way to take care of other children out there, other people out there. So you, you can make a difference, definitely reach out to your legislators and you can make the difference. Absolutely. Um, to not just your, right? Absolutely, your you all need to reach out, you know, to your legislators, um, your state reps, state senators, and, you know, just, if they hear from you, it makes a difference because we have so many things we deal with in the legislature, it makes it a very interesting job. So many different items, so many different issues on so many different topics. Uh, and so when we hear from someone, uh, you know, that we represent, it gets our attention. So definitely reaching out on this or anything else, uh, it, it can have a real impact. Right. Um, so before I go on to the other bills that I, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot with, um, okay. is there anything else you wanted to add about interference of child custody? No, that just, again, we're, we're going to keep pushing this. I'm, I'm hopeful it will pass it this time all the way through and, you know, continue to bring attention to this issue because it is an important issue. Uh, and, you know, the more that legislators hear about it, uh, some of them are already aware, of course, what, what's happening. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, probably uh, they're equally perplexed about what we can do because you can't make uh, police arrest somebody. You can't make prosecutors prosecute a case. So, you know, uh, giving them a, an option like this, I think has been helpful. Uh, and so, you know, we just keep moving forward. Thank you. Okay, so um, I mentioned to you that um, a bit earlier before you came on, we had a case in Harris County, actually, in Texas, uh, a mother, 28 years ago, her daughter was taken by her ex-husband to Mexico, uh, took her completely off grid, never put her through the school system, isolated her. She never left the house. He was living as a fugitive under a different identity, stole someone else's identity, and then changed her birth certificate, changed her name. She was a little child. So now she's an adult, never knew that her mother existed. He told her that her mother died at birth, you know, giving birth to her and that she was a horrible mother, whatever. And then, um, so now this girl, is fearful of life, never got out of the house. He never allowed her anywhere, have no education, have no ability to um, make an, an income or anything, right? Totally dependent on her father. Um, and so they, 25 years went on and the mother never gave up. And she finally was able to, with the help of a detective, was able to find him. And then they, was able to work with the FBI and the local authority to be able to arrest him, but not under um, child abduction or interrogation with child custody, 
but under the fact that he uh, stole identity of someone else. So it's under identity theft and arrested him, but quickly released him. And so uh, now the child's back to the captivity of the, of the abuser. So they got the child for about an hour and a half. And within that hour and a half, this child is now an adult, 28 years old woman with the comprehension of a child who truly wanted to go back to her mother. She was so perplexed to see that she actually have a family, have a brother and you know her mother's alive and loving her and all that. So she was really happy and wanted to go back. But then the father was released. So now she's back in the captivity of the father, but the mother can no longer do anything else because in Texas, there's a uh, statute of limitation when it comes to child abduction cases, it's only five years. And this has been 28 years. So uh, the mother is now filing, um, pushing. So she's uh, behind two bills in Texas right now that was filed by Rep Vasut. Um, and one bill is HB 559, another one is HB 3025, and it's to do with the removing the statute of limitation. Um, they do have, I think, maybe one more sponsor. Um, is there any possibility that you would consider being another sponsor on these bills? I'm, I'm, I know you haven't seen the bill, so you can go and take a look, but would you consider that? Yeah, I considered. I, I want to read them, of course. I hadn't heard of that. Representative Basud, Basud is a very good friend of mine, uh, I think a very thoughtful and a very good lawyer. And so I'll, I'll look at them uh, and I'll ask him about it. Um, and, you know, the likelihood is that I would support them, but I haven't read them. And, you know, just to go on, on the, the brief explanation, uh, there may be more to them. But, I mean, um, I do want to ask about this particular case because I haven't heard of it. But uh, is a 28-year-old is a daughter, uh, does she have uh, intellectual disabilities or what? She's 28 yeah, years she, old. She's an adult. She's, she can... She can go wherever she wants. Uh, yeah, but because you understand, well, maybe it's well, harder you said, for was you she, to... was, she, was she kept, uh, I mean, if, she, if you're saying like she was kept almost like a, a prisoner and never educated, never told any, I mean. Right, and anything. that's the thing is like, when you grow up, and I was that child, when you grow up with an abusive parent who brainwash you, you saw yes. that as your only, and so, if you don't prosecute the father, the child will never be free, even though she's an adult and can make her own decision, but her decision right now is being influenced by him. And so he's never been held accountable. So even if this law is passed, it may not be grandfather retroactively back to her situation, but right. hopefully will help other cases in the future. And, but the situation is ridiculous because this mother went through the length of 28 years searching for the child, never given up, and then was able to get, you know, everybody involved, like talking to the FBI, got a private detective, went across the country, you know, uh, got the, talked to the um, consulate in Mexico, talking to the local authority, you know, all this. So, so, so the, let me interrupt you. So the father, the father took the child outside of Texas? Yes, to Mexico. Okay, well then that's then there should be federal opportunity there, unless you're telling me that federal law has a statute of limitations as well. Because yeah, so it, the it, FBI, it, uh huh, FBI, the FBI was was not able to extra. So it, there was a case of interference uh, of child custody in county of Harris County, and but. Interference of child custody doesn't get extradited overseas, like when it involves international cases. Only ch child kidnap cases can be extra extradited. So because he's gone overseas, um, it has to be extradited through uh, ch kidnap cases. But because back then they didn't know, so they didn't file a kidnap case. So the FBI cannot extradite it, the case. So the FBI cannot doesn't have in jurisdiction until there was a child kidnapped, but she cannot file a child kidnap case because now you run out of statute of limitation. Okay. Well, it's a very unfortunate and very sad story, what you're describing. I mean, and, and where, where is the girl and the parent and the father living now? In Mexico or in the U.S.? In Mexico. Yeah. yeah. And, and they know well, exactly where the father is and, 
yeah, now there's nothing they could do. Yeah. Well, and that's very sad. And um, yeah, I, I would certainly be in favor of trying to prevent prevent that from happening or that it would happen that, you yeah. know, you can enforce it certainly longer than five years, you know. And right. That, so that, I'll, I'll send fair. you the number of the bills later. So if you can take okay. a look, we, we will. Yeah, yeah. So and, I'll, and I'll ask. And I'll ask Representative Basud about it on Monday because, he's, like I said, he's a very good friend. Thank you. Um, maybe I, I'll put you in touch with the mother and the detective that work on the case too, so you could hear more about the case. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm um, I'm so grateful for you coming on today. Um, before you go, is there anything else that you wanted to to share with the parents? Just you know, uh, thank you very much for everything you do. I mean, you're, you're a champion and you work so hard and you bring so many of us together. And, you know, those of us who are on the call now, and, and, um, as you mentioned a while ago, you, I think, you know, every office in the capital, Texas capital, but not just probably not just the Texas capital. Um, and it's people like you and those who are on listening right now, uh, that make a difference and it's hard work because so many times, um, you're really asking of people to step forward after something may have happened to them or they know something that happened to someone close to them and it's resolved by now or it's 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 way in the past and you you know sort of maybe a lot of people just move on but it takes people like you and and those who are listening to determine that this won't happen what you've been through won't happen to someone else and that takes a lot of determination and, and selflessness, really, and thoughtfulness. And I, I appreciate it. These are really important issues. Um, the things that happen to children at a young age where they're deprived of, of love, of uh, interest by parent by their own parents, um, it has a lifetime effect on that person. We know that. And, and so I just, I thank you all for, for what you're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm very happy to be part of of your group. I mean, I've done things through the years, of course, on in, the, in this general area. But you know, when when Paul Bitron reached out to me uh, and asked me to, to to join in and what was going on, um, it was a a bit of an eye opener in terms of how much it was happening. Uh, and the example you just gave, I doubt it's the only time it's happened, and that's terrible. Uh, and so it's that's an eye opener as well. So we have to do what we can. We make a decision, a determination to put this in front of the, the decision makers, my colleagues uh, in Texas and in other states. We can make a difference in changing these laws. We can make a difference. Um, regrettably, maybe not so much in the case of the 28-year-old girl now, but 28-year-old uh, girls in the future so that they don't have to go through the same thing. And so I, I just, I, I appreciate you. I really do. I do. Thank you so much. Uh, this is this is my 29th year in the in the house. Obviously, I find it important, an important uh, position, uh, an important role, an important uh, impact that I can have. But all these years, it's been because of partnerships with with uh, people like yourself and those who are listening. And so I say thank you. Thank you so much. And and definitely, um, it's it's not the only case like you. Like just a moment before you come on, we were talking to a father and we actually still haven't finished talking to him. He's going to come back in a bit. Um, and his son was taken to Canada. And in the chat room, I saw Paul, another Paul said his children were taken to Peru. Later on in the show, we're going to talk to another person where um, his children were taken to Indonesia. I mean, we see these sort of cases all the time. And those are really, they are the severe cases of interference with child custody. And if the law enforcement doesn't, if we don't have a way of enforcing and holding the abuser accountable, we lead to really tragic situation. I think people sometimes underestimate how serious these cases can get to. And, um, and it's definitely, yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Thank really you. Appreciate. Oh, I do want to mention something. I'm sorry, before you go, mm -hmm. is that San Antonio um, actually had a proclamation to recognize today as the international uh, is a, it's a day of interference of child custody day. Um, and, and this is actually the work of Claudia and Rael. Um, and we would love for you to uh, do a proclamation for this day, um, maybe in the next session. But thank Absolutely. you so much for your help. Absolutely.
thank you all and, and uh, have a great Easter weekend. Thank you. Happy Easter. Take thank care. You so much. Bye bye. Um, I think we're going to, um, JP, if you could just hold off for a bit. I do want to bring Ira up for a bit before we get back to you, JP. Um, and Claudia, did you want to say something? Oh, I, actually, I just wanted to thank Rep Representative Richard Raymond because he's done a lot. I know he's met with this quite a bit and uh, we're in contact with his office about the, the bills that we currently have, which is House Bill 969 and Senate Bill 431. Um, he was just very helpful getting those, um, getting support for those, and um, just wanted to thank him. I know he's gone, but just just realize that you can make a difference. It just takes understanding who your reps are and um, reaching out to them. And uh, throughout the last legislative session for his other bill, we just remained in constant contact, keeping that rapport um, so we wouldn't let the momentum die when we were going to be bringing this bill back in. Um, now we have a companion bill. So uh, thanks again. Thanks for helping. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Claudia. And I do see in the chat room, Jennifer asked about if uh, Rep. Raymond has any suggestion for other legislation legislators in other states. Um, actually, we can help you with that. Um, so, you know, just stay tight and Claudia and Rhea will respond to you regarding that. But um, you can actually do a lot and you don't need Rep. Raymond to help you with that. Um, okay, so thank you so much. Okay, Ira. I um, I don't see you yet. I know you're in the in the room. Okay. Wow. <laughs> no. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Wow. You look like you're very stressed out. I'm I, so I, sorry. I'm actually um. So I had to tore meniscus. So I'm doing my leg exercises. The, the swim is kind of good to recover the meniscus. So I've been listening for a while and doing my leg exercises. But no, Claudia, I'm not going to jump up and show you all my fancy tattoos. It's not going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> but anyways, um, thank you for having me. And uh, and let me tell you, yeah, the these stories um, that I've heard from these other men are so much alike, and and the behavior and all that kind of stuff that that occurs in the courtrooms are. So much like the same. It's it's incredible. Um, the mimic I, I wanted to just I just want to jump in and clarify that it's not just the fathers. It happened to mothers just the same. Um, it's 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 tragic, but it's like there's a playbook out there where the abuser will do all sort of thing to bully, to control, to create false allegation, to abuse the system it's just crazy you're right it's like the same story over and over again yes um, it is and i apologize for one more that's over there and the conditions could be better right here but uh just give me a moment here no worries so jp I'm so um I, I wanted to introduce uh everyone so jp is a father um that actually has a big story that we will uh, come back on another day, not today. Um, it's also a heartbreaking story. It's, it's crazy. Um, and yeah, I, I won't give away any about that story right now. So, but JP will come back okay. another day to talk about that. But today, the reason, and, and I wanted to kind of sneak uh, him in right now. I'm, I'm sorry, I mixed up the name. I think I just call you JP. Um, uh, Ira, sorry. Um, so he's kind. Of, I want to sneak him in right now before we go back to JP's story because he's just going to be here briefly in the position of a law enforcement um, officer uh, to talk about the training that he's pushing and things like that. So the advocacy side of of his story, and then we'll come back uh, soon another day to have the full story. And and it's it's like the playbook it's like the same story unfortunately is a little bit um different flavor and different level of outrageous and things like that but yeah so jp go ahead i, I mean I, I apologize please go ahead <laughs> no, don't worry <laughs> about it it's, it's by the way it's four it's four thirty a.m my time so oh, wow. and, and i i just did like um a lot of traveling so i apologize if i'm mixing so so go ahead i'm sorry all right, hold on a second. This um, I had no idea that uh, these landscapers were going to be uh, 
in the next door over there. But if you can, you can hear me, right? Yes. If, yeah. Okay. All right. So here. Can, can, can you guys can you guys hear him in the chat room? Can you let us know if you can hear him? Okay. Yeah. Just go ahead. Yeah. All right. So this is the deal. We're here in Florida. Um, we do have a Florida state statute 787.03 with interference with child custody, which is a third degree felony. Okay, it's already in the books. The issues that we have, and I hear all the other, other uh, parents out there, the frustration um, with law enforcement and the courts. It needs to be brought forth and people need to be educated on it so they can enforce the law. The issue is that many law enforcement officers, you know, and or state attorneys and or judges do not understand that not only can it go criminally, but it, um, I mean, not only can it go civilly, but there is a, a statute that can be enforced. So the group of individuals we, we've established down here in Florida is just amazing. Um, we met with the state attorney here in Palm Beach County. We one of his chief prosecutors. They're on board. Present those cases to them, you know, but we have to get law enforcement to do it. It's all a, a obviously, a, a team effort. Because, yes, I understand one of the, the fathers are saying about, well, the cops are going to say, uh, you know, we're not going to arrest because they're not going to prosecute. And I understand that. And I know the police arrest on probable cause, not beyond a reasonable doubt. And I get that as well. But if we start presenting these cases and we start educating uh, law enforcement and educating the prosecutors, which are educating the judges, um, it, it's going to help tremendously. Um, and I think that's that's the biggest thing right now is the education aspect um, to get this to go forward. Um, my my, you know, I've healed because you know uh, I'm all, I'm lucky. I'm married and I have two great two boys, um, and the my daughter obviously is not part of my life, and that was a child who's been alienated from me, but, and I, and I, I feel for these other fathers and mothers who don't go, don't get to go home and be with their children. I understand that tremendously. Um, but what I want to say is that, is that we're, we have momentum here in Florida and um, we're going places and we have a lot of things lined up. And some of the things that the other people have listened to is that if you want to put together a bill or something, we're putting together um, a training um PowerPoint or presentation that we're going to go to the police academies and teach inside the police academy. So law enforcement officers, when they're doing their, their six or 10 months of training, they're understanding not just the domestic violence, but also understanding, you know, child custody, you know, issues and, and interference and also obviously parental kidnapping. So those are, those are the type of things that we're kind of, uh, you know, working on down here in Florida, but we're willing to share and help, you know, around the country um, as well with uh, with other parents for sure. Um, I wanted to ask. So uh, you, you you're you're a sheriff, right? I'm sorry. What is your position? What is your? I, I work as as a sheriff. I'm a supervisor in South Florida. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And so, well, how long have you been working in the law enforcement field? Twenty. Twenty years. At what 20... point did you finally realize that interference of child custody is a criminal matter? Uh, six months ago. <laughs> Yeah. Which so 20 years in the field. Yeah, 29 years in the field. And I had no 29. idea. 29 years. And I had no idea until it was brought to my attention by uh, an, another great parent out there. And uh, I read the statute. I was like, oh, my goodness. Um, and, and I, too, blame, blame myself for being, I don't want to say ignorant, but not being educated. Because there's so many laws on the books. You know, that there's so many uh, state statutes in every state. And there's so many federal um, charges as well. But um, yeah, but to keep going back and sending these parents and, I, and believe me, it, it hurt me to keep telling them, yes, you got to go back to court, you got to go back to court. And I understand the trauma it takes, the money it takes, the time it takes, the, the, the injustice, the, 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 the stress, the anxiety. I, I get that. I really, really do. I really get that tremendously. So I can't fault myself. I could just fault the fact that I was never trained about this and obviously somebody has to step forth and train um, law enforcement and train prosecutors and train the judges so um yeah so for 29 years i had no idea but i started my career up, up in new york so i did, i'm sure there's something similar in new york obviously parental kidnapping is is in every state that is a statute for that in every state but the um, custodial interference you know there's some things that are still pretty sure if anybody looks it up you know, yes the, it is in every state it's right. in every state Interference so, with child custody is in every state is a criminal offense. Yes, so it has to be put forth for people to um, enforce it for sure, definitely, and and that's what that's what 
you know, the path we're on and, and we're getting momentum, just like some other uh, fathers I was listening to before um, in other states. But I think what we need to do is do this in, in, in large numbers, not just one person here and one person there, because when you get a large amount of people um, together, you know, we, we kind of, you know, turn the wheel and the greasy wheel kind of gets the oil. So, you know, you have one person to go in, they'll say, oh, yeah, it's only one dad. But then when they start realizing that it's not just one dad, but it's hundreds of thousands or even millions around the world that go through this. Because I've been contacted, you know, obviously in other countries, England, New Zealand, um, uh, Australia, that that this too, um, this type of behavior is, is put forth. And attorneys love it because, you know, the attorneys do. They go to conferences and they learn from each other. And the attorneys can play these games like they always do you know, within, the, within the courts. So, um, education, education, education to start from the beginning, you know, is, is the most important thing. And I'd love to hear from the other, you know, parents as well. And to obviously after this uh, conversation, um, to go forth and work this together so we could go places and we could share this information. Um, because the, the elements of the crime are all the same. It doesn't matter what state it is, you know, it, it it's all the same. Yeah. Right. So I saw in the chat room, uh, Leanne said he's in Florida and this is what I needed to hear. And I saw Brian said, I can hear you in the UK. You know, I saw, you know, Jennifer can hear you, Mara. Um, I see, you know, Samantha said judges need this information. Um, yeah, Melissa, thank you. I see uh, someone, Mikey, he's I think from Colorado. Uh, um, and then, um, yeah, and then people wanted to reach out to you uh, for your help as well, Ira. Um, you could and share then, yeah, Mora said, well, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, just a second, sorry. Uh, Mora said, well, thank you, Ira. Um, and then, yeah, so this is the thing. I, I wanted to highlight this, a, a few things, um, because, you know, we just cover quite a lot, so I wanted to kind of break it down a little bit. Uh, one is that, so Ira is in the law enforcement for 29 years and didn't know at all about this, even though he was, I mean, he is a father that was affected by interference of child custody, as well as parental alienation, as well as many other things to deal with, you know, abusive ex-partner. So he he's a victim, he's in the law enforcement and he, he still didn't know. Now he became aware because another parent shared with him and then now he's taking massive action with other people. So I wanted to point out, never underestimate the power of your work. Raise awareness. It doesn't matter how small you think it is. Talk to anybody, talk to everybody, because you never know how far it's going to go. So definitely, definitely. I'm going to share with Ira the video, the link to this video. So feel free to put your comment, your question for him. And then he will check it and, and then he will respond to you because there's people, uh, I rather there's people asking for you. So I'll send you the link to this and then you can see those comments and reach out to those people. And then everybody definitely like, feel free to put your comment question and then we'll definitely make sure that everyone involved can look at it. And then in may, it might be a bit later, but definitely, um, you know, you guys should all reach out. And I, I, I'm so grateful, Ira, because the moment you recognize this, you didn't just sit still, you go, I'm going to make the change. And it's so, it's so helpful for us to have somebody inside like you, you're the supervisor, you're a sheriff, you know, to understand that change can happen because for parents being outside, sometimes they think there's nothing you can do. Okay. There's no training. What can we do? Right. But you, you, it doesn't give you power in a different way. It's simply that you chose to have that power and said, I'm not going to sit still. I'm not going to go and push for difference to be made. Right. And so you're making that difference and you now you're calling people to, to take action. And I, I'm so grateful for that. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward for, uh, to us having a separate conversation about your personal case and parents i'm looking forward I'm like please look out for it because we're going to interview ira and that's another crazy crazy just out there story like insane um and very like very different anyway we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> it later but yeah um is there anything else that you wanted to add before we go no i'm just i just want to tell everybody like everybody said before it's not just about me it's about everybody you know, I, I've 
I say this before, I've had this huge gigantic hole in the middle of my body feeling empty and I couldn't do a damn thing to, to help um, my child. Now my hole is really, really small and it's closed up and, and I still have some frustration. I do. And, and you know, so anger sometimes because things kind of relap of what occurred and especially in my career because I still deal with it on a daily basis because we get calls all the time. And if you think if it just happens here in one county, think about how many calls a day throughout the United States of America that we get calls in regards to child um, interference and custody interference. And it's, it's gotta be thousands, you know, uh, thousands throughout the year. So that's why we need to make an impact. And I think if people start realizing, and I'm not gonna compare this to the domestic violence aspect, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna thank OJ Simpson for putting out the domestic violence, but when that, when that pandemic of domestic violence were ever hit, every police officer went out and the whole um, policies, procedures and stuff occurred because of that incident. Now, if we could get this out and kind of have that same kind of impact, I mean, we're not gonna get that much kind of that recognition. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. But I think if we do it that way and saying, hey, wow, when you go there now, these are the laws. If you have probable cause to believe, you know, either A, you make an arrest and or, you know, you file with the state attorney's office. And, and again, like the other, the other parents said, I, I forgot, I didn't see his name, I'm sorry. We're not, we're not looking to take every parent to jail. We're not doing that. But there need to be consequences that when they do this, there's, there's consequences in, in the criminal courts, not just the family courts, because well, a lot of times judges don't enforce their orders and it's very frustrating. But if you get a slap on the wrist, you know, you get fined, you know, you get contempt, or even if you do some jail time and parents start realizing that, guess what? They're gonna stop. So that's my, that's my take. Um, I'm sorry, I know today was like a crazy day with me working and trying to get on the schedule and stuff and, and my stuff, but, but I appreciate you having me and I really do. And I thank everybody for being on this call. And I thank you too for doing what you're doing. Thank you so much, Ira. Have a great day. Hey, you're welcome. You recover soon. Well, All right, oh, yeah, it's doing well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right, Have a great day. I, I do wanted to recognize that. Um, I'm oh, sorry, Claudia. Um, I, I just been told that actually Chris is the one that let Ira know. And Chris is somebody that you see quite often very apparent that's very active on victim to hero page. Actually, he comment often. Uh, he's very passionate about the subject. Um, so definitely really, really appreciate that. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. I, I see you guys you soon. Um, Claudia, you you were going to say something. Uh, no, I just wanted to to say that they that Florida does have a very active group and it and it's amazing. It's very impressive. They have some upcoming events that they're going to be planning. Um, and I they they meet every Tuesday um, weekly. Uh, so you know if you're in Florida and you want to get involved, they have an amazing group of parents that's just growing every week. So uh, Chris Felder is the lead there and um, such an amazing advocate. So thanks again for, for uh, coming on, Ira. Okay, uh, and then Nicole said, I'm so mad I missed the Zoom. Uh, yes, you can rewatch this, this is recorded. So stay on because we're not done, um, but yeah, you can rewatch this, it's recorded. So you can watch this here, you can watch it on our YouTube as well. Um, yeah, Rayel, did you wanna say something before we go back yeah, to Jim? On our, on the yeah, real fast, the, on the IC3 page, um, the interference with child custody, you, every single state has a group that you can find your state and uh, join the group and, and see which parents are working in your state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so definitely um, there is, it, it is a criminal offense. It's in the statute in every state. And as well as in other countries, because I know that we're casting this around uh, to many countries as well. Um, so, you know, if you need to find information for that jurisdiction, if you can't find it yourself, feel free to put the comment and question in the comment and we will um, get that information to you. So, um, so definitely just, just put the question in there. Um, and then welcome back, JP. I apologize for that interruption. No worries, it was great. I, I love to... Uh... I mean, I love what he said. It was amazing. Thank you. Um, so, so now we have JP back. Now, for people that that missed the the earlier part of it, um, I'm just going to run super fast through it. it basically, uh, he had a very um, contentious custody cases. Contentious is a ridiculous word. Um, so, uh, no, it it just outrageous. It's so his son. Uh, at first, it seemed like they 
um, they were getting along and they kind of had a little bit of, you know, custody change that seemed to go smoothly for a while. But then at some point, the mother decided that she, um, her ego was triggered, I guess, and she started to blow it out of proportion and start to throw in all these uh, false allegation cases. So now we got to a point where, you know, he's supposed to be able to go to court and uh, have his case heard, but instead of that, um, the mother has done something underhandedly and got him arrested for false allegation in a different state. Um, so he's now in jail for four months. This is where we're up to. And instead of giving up, he spent four months in jail feeling like he's willing to do anything to make sure that his son is okay. He's just going to stick by being the good guy instead of letting that intimidation and the fear get to him. And, and, and this, I have so much respect for you, JB, like for really to hold, hold it together and be so strong. Um, so now you're in jail and then you uh, reach out to your uh, consulate or your embassy because you're not a U.S. citizen and you got arrested in the U.S. Um, you reach out to them and do they do anything? Yes, they did. I got to say that um, I'm from Belgium, so it's a very small country. It's like 11 million people. And um, but they they did they did me good in a sense that the consul of Belgium really the consul of Belgium really just got a hold of me. I got I got visited by the assistant in uh, Louisiana that was there. And I was my family and myself, we, we got phone calls. When I was in jail, I got some phone calls from them and, and a visit from the assistant. So they were on it. They actually had a session in the Congress of Belgium to, to they mentioned my name, making sure that they were gonna be watching what, what New Orleans was gonna do and making sure that they were not gonna try to, you know, get this one quickly and then just, uh, you know, just do me wrong basically. So. So I'm sure that put a lot of fire under those people's butts, so to speak, because they knew they couldn't just do anything. And as much as mom and her entourage probably wanted. So that was very reassuring. And I knew that I had support. So um, that really helped me uh, transition into, uh, I mean, granted, it was right in the middle of, uh, of COVID. So um, I went in, it was one world. I, I came out, it was a completely different world. So it was like, it was just a bizarre experience in itself, just just the coming out. But um, it really uh, the the assistant of Belgium that came to pick me up at uh, when it was on May eighteenth uh, or May eighth, May eighth. He um, he asked me the question how how I felt, and and I remember telling him I said it, it just felt like a bad dream I just woke up out of, and it was that long and that quick. When you're in there, you feel like it's an eternity. But but I was out, and it was like just bizarre. Like I felt, it, it, I felt like it was so quick at the same time. And then here I was. So what I did, I I came out of there and and went straight to court in LA. And so when I went to court, uh, because during the four months while I was in jail, mom tried to to transfer the jurisdiction of our case, a family court case, to Louisiana, which he failed. And that was the first. That was the beginning of the end for her, and I'm sure she could have sensed that 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 didn't work out at all, and so and that showed the court what she was trying to do really, and uh, judge in Louisiana was like, no, I'm not taking this at all. I have no reason to. You guys have been, you lived, you're from LA, you everything happened in LA, so no way. Uh, even telling the judge in L in LA basically what she needed to do, uh, this judge in in Louisiana was like very like categorical about it. It's like, no, we're not doing this. So went back to the to that judge in LA. She was um, she actually apologized to me. She said, I'm so sorry I had to go through this. And I was wow. like, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> but um, so what happened is that after that the judge, no understanding finally what was going on. I mean it took her a long time. But um, she said, okay, well uh, mom needs to be back here on the 7th of July with Sebastian and the mom uh, refused to come. Then she had another time, 17. And then three times she summoned mom to come and she never did. And then we finally um, went to trial, to the actual trial we had been waiting for. And granted, I mean, if you're, if you're innocent, why don't you just prove, I mean, you're innocent, right? I mean, I'm supposed to be that bad guy. So let's go, you know, let's, let's just show how bad of a guy I am. 
And obviously she's the one that ran away. So, I mean, if that's not an admission of guilt, I don't know what is. So I was there in, at, at the trial with my attorney, but she never showed up. So right there and then the, um, so that was another judge. Um, this gentleman, uh, I think it was Iwasaki. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, it was Judge Iwasaki. He, he ordered a, a warrant for her arrest. Now, the interesting part is that it, he didn't make it criminal. It sounded like he was a civil. So the DA's office was in charge of finding and picking up my son. And, um, and at that point, um, I, I even mentioned the fact that I, how could it be civil? I mean, it's kidnapping. So it was, it, was, it was really not stated in such a way by the judge that it was criminal. It was more like she refused to obey the order, so we're going to go after her just on that basis. So the the LA the the DA's office kind of took that as that, and they said no, it's civil. So I was kind of dumbfounded by that. So what the DA did, they had to mirror the orders in Louisiana. So I personally think to this day that they messed it up because I mean, outside of a blue horn. Uh, it was so obvious they were coming down together and we knew where she was in Louisiana. And uh, by the time they got there, I think she fled. As a matter of fact, I know she fled because I had a PI there that was working on the case. And um, there was a very much a, a lack of communication between my PI and the DA's office, which was strange to me. Like if we wanted to get my son back, let's communicate. And um, so they, they didn't get her. So they, we, we got to Louisiana and they, they didn't get her. They actually even sent, asked me to, to fly over there to pick up my son and they didn't get her. She, she escaped, of course, she was not gonna wait for them. So at that point, uh, we went back to LA and I started working with the DA's office and the, the detective, but I always felt like, um, I know mom has a, have a sixth sense but somehow maybe dad, when they become dad, they have, they develop this thing as well. I don't know, but I felt like there was something not adding up in this. And I, I, I never felt supported by the DA's office, like the, the people involved. And again, there were ladies, nothing wrong with that, but maybe there's like a bias thinking, well, are you sure? The way she was asking me questions, it's almost like I was going through an, another interrogation or something. I just didn't feel like she believed me really. So the fact is uh, for a little bit, we communicated and now there's absolutely no communication. In the meantime, I was so frustrated by this sort of lack of advancement because mind you, she's a public figure. I, I've got a lot of information on her. I've got IP, I mean, I've, I've got a lot on her through a variety of different sources. So in this day and age, knowing that she gets paid by residuals from her acting, all of that, there's so many ways to, we know phone numbers, everything, you know. So it was difficult for me to understand in this big brother age that we're in, that you couldn't spot somebody like that. So we, we have, um, I've done my research on my, on my own, very different sources, but one thing that I did because I was frustrated that it was not criminal, I went to the LAPD and LAPD made it criminal. Because clearly I have literally those penal codes from kidnapping, custody, um, what is it, custody, um, deprivation and child stealing. And those are all penal codes. I mean, they have their own penal codes. So that's criminal. I mean, if that's not criminal, what is? And, and to this day, I think the DA's office refuses to see it that way. I'm so, sorry, so um, I, I wanted to, Ask you a bit more, like go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I want to go back to a lot of things, but one particular part just now. So the system, I mean, not to mention the system failed you over and over again, but um, you went to court and it seemed like you have some kind of justice where the judge recognized that she fled and didn't bring the son back and over and over again, and then finally go, okay, we're going to have a warrant on her, but yet refused to put it as a criminal mm -hmm. charge keep it as a civil chat completely different situation yeah. now so then you went and was able to move that and change it into a criminal offense okay you said you went to lapd what could you walk us a little bit more into the details of how you did that and what kind of pushback you got or you know sure so because it was civil and i was sure that it was not civil I went to the LAPD, I got a hold of somebody, um, a detective, a lady detective, a Vietnamese descent lady, 
and uh, she 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 talked to me. She was great. She she understood my situation, and yeah, she was like, absolutely, that's criminal. So, uh, oh yeah, I filed a police report. That's what I did. So based on the police report, that triggered that criminal warrant based based on the charges. I mean, it was clear from the judge. So what what really was bizarre is that after that was done, so the DA's office kept saying, well, no, it's we, we're dealing with the civil part of the case. And I guess LAPD is going to deal with the criminal part of the case, which I thought it was strange. So I, I called the, the LAPD and said, hey, who is in charge of my case? And what happened there is that I got sent to different offices, finally got somebody to answer. And the bottom line is that they said, well, the DA's office has got bigger, better guns than we do, so to speak. So they're in charge of it. So we're, we've been, we, we, we've, we've basically lost that, that, that case in a way. But yet the DA's office was saying, well, we just do the civil part. So all of a sudden the criminal case kind of, it looks like it fell through. Like they're not, they're not pursuing that as a criminal case. So it's one of those jumbo jumbo thing that makes absolutely no sense. And even on a legal matter, the DA's office should take it as a criminal case. And they seem to shy away from that. And that's to me probably the reason why they're not going full speed for it. And now I, I don't even have any contact. I, Claudia was great about walking me through the process of getting, I didn't even know I had a victim representative that was assigned to my case. So I, I got a, I try to get a hold of uh, that person. Uh, they gave me his first name. I spoke to him once. He was like, okay, no problem. I'm going to send you my email, my information, my whatever. Uh, never heard from him again. Like it's been a year. And I, I've sent multiple emails. Claudia sometimes is even copied on it, asking the sergeant of the DA's office, the detective, can I please have the name and the information of my uh, victim representative and, and, and so forth. And it's been ignored every single time. I mean, I must have had 10, 15 emails and nothing uh, Have you talked to any legislator in California to see if they could help you with the DA office? Right, that's what Claudia said I should do. And I, I, I totally agree with that. My, my issue is more on the, um, on sort of the timing of it because of my work, it's hard to catch somebody before five. I mean, for me to get anywhere before five, but that's that's next on my list is to actually go uh, talk to my to my representatives and and find out what they they can do because I, I feel like I need to go above their level. I mean, some, like superior level, yeah. Um, yeah in order, yeah. To, yeah. No case is being dropped somewhere. It right. fell through. Yeah. yeah. And, and talking about system failure over and over again, because you got accused, you got it clear with the child protective agency, the court got it wrong. So mm -hmm. now then she played the system, you end up in jail. I mean, that's just outrageous being in jail for four months for nothing. And then they couldn't do anything about it. They, they realized that there's no case. So now that you finally got your freedom back, you thought that that's good, go back to court. Now you thought you got some kind of justice, yet they still got it wrong, put it as a civil case instead of criminal case. Now you have to push further and then finally was able to get to the, into a criminal uh, case and then nobody's picking up the case. Talking about just, it's just relentless in terms of, and yet you never mm -hmm. given up mm -hmm. and talking about that strength. So, you know, like this is so important parents and it's not over your son there's a whole life so the fact that you never give up never give up that's important yeah. it's so important because some parents feel like they can't go on anymore but really think about it it's, it's not over and think about the length that these parents are going through like it's it's incredible and it matters because it doesn't matter when like i, I was saying earlier i found out when i was in my 40s wow. that my father went and he already passed it's not too late. I know it's too late, but it's not too late because it changed my life. It mattered. So don't don't give up. So anyway, thank you so much. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say before um, you go? No, I just think that um, it, it's been difficult for me sometimes to be on some on some group, you know, like um, to hear all those stories because emotionally I thought I was it was already plenty for me to deal with my situation. 
and I've been going back and forth with that. Um, uh, however, and emotionally, I could I could sometimes feel like I just need to clear my head more than just add more trauma hearing all those stories so but but at the same time I, I I'm um, rethinking this because because I hear so many um, good ideas and 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 seeing how people are still moving forward and and we have to change the system so it's got to start with us uh, so nobody that's gone through this can understand and and the one thing I, I, I've come to realize is that um, many of most of all the people that I know that none of them have gone through this. So it's, it's, it's hard to hear their questions all the time. Like, have you done this? Have you done that? And that, that almost infuriates me because it's like saying, what do you think I've been doing all this time? And people that are in my position, like you guys, you get it. You don't need to ask. As a matter of fact, I never get that kind of, those kind of questions from people that have been through it because they know, they know we've all tried everything we can. So, um, so I have rethought sort of my position on that because, uh, because it's not about me, it's about, it's about the children, it's about the parents that are going through this. And, and I think we need to hold tight together. It's really crucial that we use that energy and that um, big synergy together so that we can, we can change things. And on our own, we just, we're, we're done. We, we need each other for that. So, and I was thinking also being in, in, in LA uh, while I was listening to some of you guys, um, I am going to make a huge effort to reach out to, you know, some of the celebrities that have gone through that. There's, they have to be involved in that. They're always so, you know, politically correct and so, you know, whatever the word would be, but they, they that's where you put your money. How about you get, we, all we need is one star, one guy, one super whatever to, to uh, whether it's a, a Brad Pitt. I mean, there's it's only a few, few phone calls away when you're in LA, you, you know, people from like about three phone calls away. So why not? I mean, I have nothing to lose. I don't care. They like me, they don't like me, but I, I'm, I'm going to dedicate to really, and not only that, just also the funding, because what I find, I mean, I think everybody would love to have Mark as his PI. I mean, I can imagine how much he's, he's I mean, there's just a cost associated to it. Outside, when I came out of jail, not only did I have to get back to LA, but I lost my, I mean, so much money. I lost my job. I, uh, my credit score went to, excuse my French, I can say that, to shit. So I'm just rebuilding myself financially. And I've come to a good place now. I'm like, finally, and I've been blessed with that. But it still requires a lot of money. And I think, you know, money is the source of, of that as well. So getting some people to do great fundraising, whatever it takes. But parents need money to, to look for their kids. Because a lot of times we don't get the help we need. And, or get, I think we should uh, get some sort of, and I've talked to Randall about it, just ways to fund those organizations. And that's where the money of the people need to go, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be dedicated to, to, to work on that side of things because I've been kind of going in and out and, and I think it's necessary. So well, it looks like you haven't got anything to do for the last few years. So really get <laughs> on with it. <laughs> right. Right. No, but thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry. You're welcome. No, that, was, that was good. I needed to hear that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but it's so true though, is that it's so it's so crazy that the people around you will never understand if they haven't experienced it. You you will get pushback from family, friends, co-worker, the whole society. They will never get it. That's why it's so important for you to build some kind of insulation around you mm -hmm. so that you can survive those people and then build the network around you to support you. People that are right here in this chat room, in this whatever, because yeah, these are the people that understand what you're going through and they can share their experience and they can empower you. So That's our really tribe, right? That's our tribe. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Really, you. like your strength is incredible. I'm, I'm so grateful that you come and share your story. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, JP. Um, Claudia, did you want to say something before we get Maggie on? Uh, no, again, I just want to thank JP for coming on. Um, I've talked to him recently and uh, his story is amazing, but, but thank you. Thank you for having him on. Yeah, no, I'm so grateful to you and Rayel to line up 
it's this parents, this cases, this story. And uh, everyone, by the way, we have these cases, but at the end, we have also another advocate with a lot of information specifically to do with child abduction cases with, with very specific action that you can take and very important information. So stay tuned. I know that we have a long, big day. We purposely want to build it as a big day because this is a very important topic and we want to raise awareness. So anyway, do stay tuned. Um, uh, Rayel, did you want to say something? Yeah, get your emails in. So far, I think we had three people that have sent them to Respectfully Pack and um, we had 44 emails sent through Voter Voice. So get those emails in now. Thank you. Yeah, there's some really cool prizes, you guys. And then not, not only that, you are making a difference. That's actually more important. But yeah, there are really cool prizes and I'm not talking about like soft toys. I'm talking about things that are gonna be helpful for you. I think there's there's a book that is like just, it, it's it's really an important book in the field. I think, uh, uh, Rael, if I'm wrong, uh, correct me, but I think one of the prizes is actually the book Parental Alienation Science and Law. It's a book that we recommend. It's like the Bible of parental alienation. It's massive and it's not cheap. It's a few hundred dollars. So is that right? We have that, right? That's one of the yes. prizes. Yeah, that's going to be the top prize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and thank you to the National Parents Organization for sponsoring that. Um, really, like definitely parents. So send out. So take the action, send out the, the yeah, that's the book. It's, it's incredible. It has cases, case law. It has information on the science. It's got a lot of information on how to, uh, the treatment, you know, reunification, talking about how to rebuild your relationship with your children, talking about the history, like all the science and law, basically. So really, definitely. And, and it's, an, it's a pretty recent book. I think it's 2020. Um, and it has... 14 authors, all the top people in the field. So definitely um, it's, a, it's a good uh, prize to win. Um, so yeah, thank you. And thank you so much, Maggie, for coming on. Um, okay, so you guys have heard all different kind of stories um, and they all kind of a little bit different. So we now have another story and Maggie here is a mother. Thank you so much for coming on to share your story with us. I'm gonna just let you um, tell your story when it started, you know, and things like that. And um, this is, um, I, I think it's important for us to bring a story like Maggie because this is a very different story as in we actually have a, a good happy ending. Um, so I'll, I'll just give that away ahead because I do want parents to, to know that that there are hope out there. So yeah, Maggie, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, thank you, um, Patria, Rio, and Claudia for the amazing work that you've done. And thank you for all of the other parents. Like I know um, some of them, but I don't know all of their story. So a lot of these stories are very touched and just like so complex in terms of, um, you know, how, how many efforts and resources they have put to get their child back and, um, so um, with my story, so my son, he's gonna be two actually in next week. Um, so when he was one year old, uh, around this month, he was taken by his father um, to, um, to a country in Europe, so France. That's, uh, so his father is a French citizen and he took him without letting me know. And the story, Actually, you know, I, I, I called them in the airport uh, when I realized that he was taking, um, he was leaving with my son, but unfortunately at that time, he was, um, they were around, they already crossed the border. So they already checking and then the, um, the flight was about to depart like in 15 minutes. So I was able to get the TSA ladies um, and air friends um, to get to know where they're about. And they had told me that they check with two French passport and six luggage um, on board. Now I'm gonna share a little bit story with the, my interaction with law enforcement because I've heard um, other story talk before I'm that- I'm sorry, hold, hold on, hold on. I, I do want to kind of break down a little bit so that we don't uh, lose. Um, some important information I, I thought is important information, which was, um, so I just want to kind of walk back through a bit and, and if I'm wrong, like correct me. Um, so uh, her son was one, right? One year old and you had custody of your son uh, and your mother was taking care of your son at the time. 
and her ex-husband turned up and took the child and took off and she then didn't know what was going on and calling him and he wouldn't respond but eventually he kind of happened to slip out like she she finally got him on the phone and he slipped out and mentioned that he's heading to the airport that's when she's freaking out but she didn't suspect anything before that because the child had an u.s passport right in which you have the possession of right so you right. didn't think that he was able to take the child he, that he would take the child to a different country because you have the child passport. What she didn't think of at the time is that he has been sneaky and went around the system and got a different passport for the son in France. And the thing with the French system is that you could get the passport for the child without both parents being there. In the US, you need both parents. So he was sneaky and played the system. And this is why he was heading to the airport, which you didn't think it was going to be a potential problem before that, right? So now you then was able to know that he's boarding the flight. And then, yeah, please go on. So I actually, we were still married. I mean, we're still married right now. We're not legally divorced. Um, so we both have custody, right? There's no court order paper-ish. But he actually, he was able to live with my son under the oversight of my, my mom, who is also on the house. And that's another story because my mom um, was self, self hurting her after I came back from the house because she blamed herself so much. Like, how could she miss that my husband took, took my son with so many like belongings, right? So that's another story. Um, so because we're still married and there's no court paper uh, in terms of custody, uh, even with the negotiation with the law enforcement um, in, the, in the airport and the father um, kind of, lying to the law enforcement saying that he was just going uh, for a vacation for three weeks vacation and he's he's going to come back. So the law enforcement, um, the police, uh, they let him go. Although I was very objective because I I told them there's a one way ticket with six luggage. Uh, apparently that's not a like three week vacation ish. So, um, so anyway, at the end of the day, he was able to abort with a flight. And I was so devastated in the airport that I thought I'm going to find it, but then I was end up being a, a kind of person on the watch for the policeman. They wanted me to be escort. So they don't want me to create drama and they even called 911 to, to send me to the hospital, et cetera. So that was a, a kind of drama and I don't want to lose myself on the site. So I, I got back my, you know, myself together. I went back uh, home. And then, of course, that was like the most saddest day in my life that my, my son was just taken away without any notice. Um, and then the second I went to the family court uh, in, in New York, uh, in Manhattan, filed a custody case. And that's another kind of nail mail because I realized all of the case, especially the custody and the family thing, it's just so packed in a city like New York. And then um, I was assigned to a very new referee and I think she just got on board like 2019 and she doesn't want to decide anything. And then every time she got us a hearing that's like 20 minutes or 30 minutes maximum. And then 10 minutes was looking for the French interpreter because even my husband understand English that he still want a, a French interpreter. And that's like super, super protect here in New York. And then uh, sometimes the French interpreter just did not come. So we cannot even go on the hearing. So time just passed by. Um, but at that time, the court ordered me visitation uh, to France. So as long as I, as long as I got a visa, because I also need to get a visa to go to France, I went to see my son. Um, that was after, that was actually, I know that he didn't come um, for his supposed to be three week vacation. So I was able to see my son in 10 days and then um, under the family, under the watch of um, my husband's family, um, because they, on the counterback, they claim, because I'm not a US citizen, we're just like JP, I'm a, I still have my Chinese passport, and they, where well, the argument is, because I'm a Chinese citizen, I will kidnap my son, go back to China, and my, 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 my husband, he was never able to see my son, so that's their whole argument, right, and, um, so I was in France with my son for 10 days and then somehow they left away, um, you know, back to their countryside. 
And I couldn't, I was not able to see my son again, but I'm trying to find a, a French attorney over there. So I spent a lot of time looking for attorney. By that time, I was also very lucky to enjoy a kind of a mother group over there. So I have some kind of friends support to help me in the near future, because in the near future, I was dragging a lot of these uh, French proceedings, documentation, a lot of things that I don't understand. And so they were uh, able to help me. And some of them actually live in the neighborhood of where my husband and my son live. They actually watch for me, say, oh, your son is okay, that where they're going, something like that. So it was very good for me to have a community over there, right? And they are a mom, so they, they know like the, the struggle and the suffering that I, I have. So at the end of July last year, I couldn't, you know, get access to my son. So I went back uh, to New York and kind of, so I spent some time to reassess my case, like how should I move forward, right? Because my case has been always like civil. Um, I was not aware of any um, criminal part and I didn't know anyone in this forum back then. I didn't know Randall, I didn't know um, Shine the Light. So I don't have any sort of knowledge. And, and that time I was still shocked, like how could my husband did this to me? And I would never imagine that I file a criminal case or oh, my son's uh, or my child's uh, father would have a criminal record. And how how's the relationship gonna, gonna gonna last? So that that's all on my in my thinking. So when I went back to New York, I hired another attorney. Um, that he was he was advising me that I should go through the Hague Convention, which is a civil aspect for um, child abduction. Some of the parents involved in the um, in the international child uh, uh, child abduction definitely know that kind of law. So I'm not going to go to detail. I mean, I'm pretty sure Jay has a better examination than I, I, I do. So then becomes all of the legal proceedings um, involved with the state of the department, then hire the French attorney. Of course, all of these just like a lot of, lot of economic resource and that's totally reliance on whoever is a, uh, is a left behind parent, right? We don't get any resource or help for them that. And if we wanna have, you know, good help in the local country where my where my um, son is located, that involves a lot of research about because you don't know their language. They could totally like freak you for some of the attorney that they might be able to present you, but at the end of they don't. So, but I was lucky to get a good attorney through my U.S. attorney, um, a good recommendation. Um, he's very expensive as well, but again, I I just couldn't give up any chance to get my son back. Um, but that's my plan a, a, right? Because that's the most civilized way. I mean, I got other plan B, plan C, uh, in terms of hiring private investigators, just like other parents would do as well. If, if, if the plan A just like fall through. So, I mean, going to a proceeding in France, I mean, just surprisingly, it moves very fast. I've heard a lot of these other hate case drag for years, but my case was actually, um, when my attorney filed the case, I was able to get a hearing in two weeks. And in and I went there for hearing. And even at the last minute, they were doing a lot of documentation, um, you know, support. And I was doing a lot of translation on my own. It just amount of evidence that needed over there, whoever has been through this process. So I went there in October, my, my case was heard. And then um, two weeks after, that my case had a, a result. So this came actually a lot faster than I, I, I thought. And I thought I was on the right path. And actually, and, and very luckily, I think I was blessed as well that the family court in France, that they, um, um, the court judge, like she ruled out my favor. So she ordered my son to be immediately returned back to New York. And I guess even without everything that my husband um, decided to follow the order. So he sent back um, to my son back to New York last November. So, so, my, um, so before we go on, I do wanted to ask a bit more about the hate convention that you were working on. Um, so yes, your case that's like crazy fast speed, like we, we never heard of cases that get heard so fast and then get decided so fast. Uh, what did you think that helped your case move so fast? I think, I mean, I think first of all, every country is different. Like I know other country moves very slow. And then 
Um, another thing is I was always thinking, get a good attorney, but I know everyone has different financial capability, right? And the good attorney will tell you if you need to file directly in the country or through the State Department, because that's also important. Like my, in my case, the State Department, they have this country officer who is assigned to me. He's pretty responsive. So when he received our documents, he sent to the French authority right away. And then my attorney is also pretty uh, in France that he is also pretty um, kind of um, you know expert on this case. So you also fall up right away. So I think it's about the timeliness, right? We all heard like there's a one year statute limitation uh, for you to get your, your, your try back, um, you know, if you action within one year, right? I mean, you can still get after, but the chance a lot, like, you know, a lot smaller compared you find immediately. Um, so that's also one thing that we take the action, but also it totally depends on the country. Some country, um, that they probably will, will protect their own citizenship, citizen, but I think all of the country will that, but some country might rule favor in favor of the mother, um, that per se, uh, but also depends if you wanna kind of comply with the US as a country. Um, and also most importantly, I think it also depends on the other party. If he doesn't, if she or she doesn't wanna follow the order, it doesn't matter if you win the case, right? Because I know other parents, they win the case all the way to the high court, but they cannot get their child back because probably the other party, they don't, they decide not to follow the court order. So that's all it depends on. Um, but again, any slim chance um, that that's presented here, I think every parent in this uh, forum, right? As long as within their capability, um, I think everyone will do that, try to get their child back no matter how much it, it, yeah. it, it's gonna cost. So there's a comment in the um, chat room, I think from Claudia saying, Maggie, thank you so much for sharing. You acted so fast. I thought um, a very important element of this is that you get on top of your case and you acted really fast. You went to France and then at the same time, you didn't just, like you found your support network, you found this mother's group you, you know, you do anything you could, you reach out everywhere and you don't give up. So that's, that's really important for parents out there is to, I know that everyone's different and everyone's cases are different. So your, um, your resources are different, but do what the best you can, but never give up and really mm -hmm. take action and really, you know, never give up hope and really drive your case. Because when you drive your case, everyone else will follow that help a lot. So I think it has a lot to do with that too, not just the fact that, you know, it's other aspects like in terms of countries and things like that. Um, thank you so much. So then, yeah, please continue. So uh, now we're up to the fact that, okay, you got a ruling and the father complied with the Hague Convention. Oh no, with the, sorry, with the family court in France. Oh, by the way, so do you speak French? Um, so I, I, I learned French a little bit in my old jobs, uh, but I, I think I, I actually get better with all of the core things, but still it's, it's just co so complicated. Um, but another thing I think, go back to what you said about, you know, I act, act fat because I was so upset, right? My, my son just wing off from breastfeeding, right? Like I was just upset how the father did this to me, right? So I had this uh, stress that I have to get him back. There's no way that he can just run away with it like that so that kind of pushed me that actually keep me awake every night like I couldn't just let this like sleep over and I also have a lot of lot of support from my family um so that's also help so after my husband um sent my son back last November so the New York court also kind of mm, follow through because um in the past they were all we we're always like fighting jurisdiction Somehow the local family court just dragged through one again, again, and somehow my husband started winning like popularity, like like the the, the New York referee think like sh the the child's our son jurisdiction might be in France, et cetera. So in our case, it's a little bit complicated because I was not even sure that I'm gonna win the Hay case because we live in France for a couple of months. We also live in New York for a couple of months. So the child kind of lived between like two countries, but of course, when the time add up, like we live in New York more than when we live in France. So, um, and also I've established a lot of evidence here to show that he's habitual residence. It's well established in New York, et cetera. 
So after my son was sent back, um, my husband, he actually appeared in the, in, the, in the court in France again. So he was not happy with this um, decision and he appeared. And which is kind of stupid because my son already sent back, right? I don't know what he's gonna do. Like if even he win the case over there, um, like the French, the French order should, you know, I don't know how it should be justified in New York anyway. And he didn't win that. Like I got another order confirmed from the peer court that, you know, my sons were establishing New York. Um, they're not gonna send him back. Now with the story is I'm him, I was him um, in the custody battle in New York. Uh, we have a trial in the summer, surprisingly, right? Um, but we're actually getting our divorce um, in France. So he sued me in divorce in France as well last May. And then our case was just heard. And then um, because they cannot decide um, the child custody of my son in France. So he's suing me for spousal support. He asked me to pay him money while he never pays any child support, et cetera. So we're still uh, in, in litigation. And actually, as we're speaking, his father is with him uh, because he came over for his visitation. And from my point of view, I think my son needs his father, right? He's still young, he's just two. Um, so I would never alienate my son away from his father. I, I think he still deserves to be part of that, but a part of me still kind of scared about like he's gonna do that away again. Although the court has both um, the passport of, of my son. So Randall helped me with all of these prevention program through the State Department that um, sort of my son can be put on the no-fly list. So hopefully every time if the father try to cross the border with him, we should have received any alerted. So that's that's about like summary. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I I I think it's so crazy because you know your son was only six months old, like tiny little baby. You still, you know, and suddenly. He's got taken to a different country. Now you have to fly over there and try to fight for your son in a completely foreign country that you don't even speak the language that well. And then try to figure out what to do in this strange place. It's crazy. And then still like your life back in New York, like everything just uprooted and back and forth. Every, I mean, the kind of things that you went through is, is insane, the amount of and I know that uh, Maggie mentioned a bit about Randall. We're going to have Randall on later on. So definitely stay, stay tuned because he has a lot to share. And we'll, he's an advocate that has helped so many people, um, like these parents here that you see today. And yeah, really, he's making a huge difference. So we're going to have him on, and he's going to share information that's helpful for you. So definitely stay tuned. Um, uh, is there anything else that you want to share before? Um, we go. And I mean, I, I actually do want you to comment about how you keep your mental strength, because there's this different kind of battle, right? There's a battle in court, but then there's that battle in here that is so important. Very good question. Um, I think there was some time um, when I still waiting for the case to be heard. I was, I think I'm, I'm totally losing it. Um, I don't know. I just lost interest to everything else, right? Because I was so on that. Um, but I think one part helped me with that is first of all, I got a new job. Um, I mean, I lost my previous job because of this thing. Like I was in France for too long and my company decided to not to keep me. But after I came back, I pick up another job, which gave me a different perspective, right? When I was a job, I was so focused that I forget about this thing for momentary, but then on my way back to on my way back to home, I see so many strollers with baby. Like I have this, all of the emotions along the way. So that's just very challenging. But I guess another thing is um, then I joined part of this uh, Shine the Lines with Randall's group. We had this support call uh, on a biweekly basis. And we, we can also reach out to within the community with, any, uh, with anyone. And um, everyone knows all of the story, right? It's because like, if I would explain this to my uh, family or friend who does not know anything about child abduction, they would be surprised. Wow, um, like they would never think a parent taking a child away would be uh, without the other parent consent would be considered as a child abduction, right? You know, he, he or she just was his mom, his dad, he's totally fine. 
That's not the case. Um, they will never understand how much the feeling that we as a left behind parents feel. So I'm just glad that I joined this community, um, that we know each other, we feel each other, that we know each other pen, and then we always support each other, you know, stay in the game. That's also also very, very helpful. And also I spent a lot of time uh, focused on my career, focused on building connections with some of my friends. So um, that's always, you know, hard, but I'm, I, I just wish everyone in this forum, you know, has been go through that, just stay very, very strong. And then, you know, keep the hope someday you will be you, you, re united with your children. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I see so much strength in you. And that's really, really inspiring, you know, going through this and like mm -hmm. trying to juggle everything. And really, thank you so much for sharing your story. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and parents, if you have any question, like she's gone through this process, you know, we're dealing with the court system in France, uh, with the Hague Convention. Convention. So if you have questions, feel free to put in the comment because, um, again, like I said, um, I'm going to send the link to her, the video to her, so that you know, if there's any question that she can address, she she will try to address that for you guys. Um, Claudia said your strength is amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, I think next we're going to have Jay coming on, which is another parent with some uh, other crazy story. Um, so we'll, uh, we're going to hear the story. I'm not sure if Jay, if you could uh, come on. And then after Jay, uh, we're going to have Jaka, I believe. Let me just double check the schedule. I know we have a lot packed on today. Um, yeah, we're going to have Jay, and then we're going to have Jaka, and then we will have Randall. Um, um, and then after that, we'll wrap it. So we still have quite a while, but um, Jay, I don't see you on yet. Are you there? I mean, I see you in the in the call, but I don't see you on camera, uh, and and we can't hear you yet. So if you can unmute and come on, um, okay. Why don't we get Jaka on, and then we'll get Jay later then, because I think there's some potential technical problem. Jaka, are you there? Do you want to come on? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Can you? Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, so Jaka is another parent with another child abduction, unfortunately, story. Uh, we wanted to share all these different stories because they all have different aspects of it and different angle and also different countries because we want people to be aware that this is a worldwide problem. Uh, but yeah, Jaka, uh, please go ahead and just share your story. When did it start and what happened and things like that? Okay, so... Uh... Thank you for having me in here. Uh, the story I can start from uh, December. Okay, hold on. Sorry. So um, I, I think I have trouble hearing you. Parents, can you actually hear him? Because um, I have, tr it's very soft. Do you, uh, Hello? is there any way that you can be a little bit louder, maybe? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that seems a bit better. Like, can you guys okay. hear him in the chat room? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So yeah, so uh, the story I will start from uh, December 2019 uh, when I was still married and uh, we went vacation together with my two kids. Uh, the first one was a girl at the time was 12 or 13 years and the second one is a boy uh, was uh, six years old. So we went to Indonesia to see our family there. And then uh, after that, what happened is one night, uh, just about before Christmas, uh, I mean, not it's after Christmas, in fact, on December 27, uh, uh, she came to the room with her brother-in-laws and then uh, they assaulted uh, me and then took the kids away uh, from me. And since that time, I never seen my kids. So uh, I went back to the U.S. as per the schedule that uh, after Christmas vacation, we came back to the U.S. So I went home in the U.S. by myself. 
and then uh, I talk to a lawyer here how to get my kids back like that. Okay, then, okay, so hold on. Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to break down a little bit so that we, uh, we I want to make sure that it's clear for other people listening. Um, so, Jaka, you were married with mm -hmm. two children and you guys were still married. You didn't know that yes. there was any marital problem, right? You guys Correct. actually were happily taking the children to Indonesia mm -hmm. on vacation. It's a Christmas yes. vacation. You guys are supposed to be there for a while and then you're going to come back to the US, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Nothing. We're completely blindsided. One day, the mother brought her family to the hotel room, took mm -hmm. the children and beat Jaka up and left yeah. him to die in the hotel mm -hmm. room. Yeah. I uh, I went to the hospital and then went to the police department in Indonesia to report the assault. And then, uh, yeah, after that, I home here alone by myself, yeah, to the US. Yeah, that's crazy. Like talking yeah. about abusive behavior and, yes. and hiding everything, completely blindsided you and was willing to let you die and just took the kids. Like, it wasn't like, oh, let's get divorced. Let's, you know, I want the children. It wasn't even that. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, let's go on vacation and I'm going to let you die in a, in a different country and took the children. Mm -hmm. And then so you somehow managed to, you went to the hospital and was able to recover and went back to the US. And then you, you look for a lawyer. Oh. And then what happened? And the lawyer recommended for a, a divorce. That's the way I can get the kids back with me because of the uh, uh, interference with the children. So after I got, I filed the divorce and then uh, I got, finally I got the default judgment from the, the court because the mother never come back here after being served. And a few, uh, they served being uh, multiple times, uh, and then she never come to back to the U.S. with the kids. So the judge gave us a default judgment for the divorce. So based on that paper, uh, I deal with the sheriff in here in the my county in Texas, and then uh, also uh, deal with the uh, uh, FBI. Well, before that, maybe I should mention that I got help from Randall. At the time, I was with I stand parent. Uh, I got help from him to get some direction how to uh, to manage this case. You know, how, to, how I because I have no clue how to handle this, and Randall uh, helped me a lot step by step uh, how to uh, see my kids back. Like uh, contacting the FBI, contacting the congressman, you know, the senator. And one day I was lucky that uh, because at the time uh, we had a trip to uh, Washington, D.C. for the Einstein Parent Conference. I thought it was a miracle. I was sitting next to my congressman, Pete Olson. He, is my, he, he was my congressman. I was sitting next to him. I introduced myself. I told him face to face my story. And right after that, he said, just come see me in the office. So I got so high, you know, because I said, oh, wow. So he invited me to his office in Washington. <laughs> so uh, I went to his office. I, I think, uh, I believe, uh, no, we didn't go to the office, but we set up a call with Randy when we were in Washington, D.C. And then, uh, yeah, he, he helped me. And then he helped to uh, expedite the process with FBI, their office called the FBI to have my case. And then one day in October, 2020, about 10 months later, I got a call from FBI that, hey, we have your kids here. Want to come pick them up? <laughs> I drop everything what I have done. So just go straight to the FBI office, pick up my kids. Yeah, they brought my kids back here, the FBI. That's but, incredible. Uh, and, yes. and I want to clarify a few things. So, um, so because Jaka was still married, 
Um, so there was no court order regarding the children, right? So because without a court order, uh, you can't really enforce interference of child custody because there's no child custody established. They were still Correct. married. I mean, both parents have right to you know access the children and do whatever take them anywhere so the first step that, that he had to take was to actually file for a divorce and file for custody and so that's what he did is he filed for a divorce he served the paper but the mother refused to turn up she was served properly properly served she's aware of the hearing she chose not to turn up because she well i don't know i'm speculating here but I think that because she felt like, well, I'm in a different country. I have the possession of the children. I don't care. So, you know, I'm fine. I have no intention of going back to the US. I have the children, there's nothing you can do, right? So that's why she doesn't feel like she had to turn up or respond to the court. And so that gave uh, Jaka the, the, the case in default, meaning that the judge ruled based on whatever he asked mm -hmm. for. So he ended up with the custody of the children, legally, not physically mm -hmm. yet. The child is still now in a different country. Now, now that he got full possession of the children, legally, he can now file for interference of child custody and child abduction and things like that. So now you went through the Hague Convention, right? Uh, Indonesia doesn't have a Hague Convention. Oh, oh so you didn't. So now it's mm -hmm. just interference of child custody. Yeah. Yeah, so then he, then lucky, he met the congressman, his congressman, mm -hmm. and the congressman heard the story and decided to get involved. And because with the congressman's help, the FBI, FBI extradited the case. And so they were able to recover the children from Indonesia and brought them back to the US. Yes. Okay, so then, then what happened? And and then I got my kids back, of course. And then yeah, I live uh, as a single parent here with my kids till today. You yeah, know, that's that's she, good thing. She's now and, trying to fight custody, right? Oh, she's still trying to fight custody. Like recently, like like just Christmas last year, she filed uh uh what they call uh uh uh, uh what uh child protect. She called it CPS. Yeah. Uh, she made a, a, a false report that I've been abusing my kids. So the CPS can do the investigation, but there is no proof that I did the uh, abuse to the kids. Yeah. Yeah, we see this so often is that mm -hmm. is that they will go and throw in false allegation mm -hmm. to distract the case and abuse the system and use the system in order to abuse you. And that's exactly what she was trying. And luckily, you know, you were able to clear your name. So it, it's good, but really great is parents are being put through hell with, mm -hmm. with this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that's incredible because see parents like reach out to your legislators, you know, mm -hmm. reach out to, and the thing, the other thing I wanted to point out is Jaka, after he lost his children, he lost his wife, who he thought was still, they were in a normal, okay relationship. He never saw that they were breaking up. Suddenly, I don't know where, you know, and he was beaten up. So when he came back, tell us about your emotional state when you got back. How were you? Oh, when I came back, I don't know what to do. I'm just out of job for a while. I cannot do anything, you know. And I spent a lot of money just to fight to the with with help with the authorities in Indonesia that end up with the scam in Indonesia. You know, I thought the Indonesian because I speak Indonesia and I came from Indonesia, I thought they can help, but all of the things is just scam, you know. Uh lost everything and then uh luckily I met with Randall and then uh to fight from the US because we are American. So uh, that that's what I think, you know, with with the support from American government is I spend no money at all. Is is no even one penny. It's very grateful being in here with the help of the government. Yeah. So the system does work sometimes. It's it's occasionally yeah. it really failed miserably, but sometimes it does work. So you mm -hmm. you were trying to 
do anything you could. So you're trying to file for the custody in Indonesia and that mm -hmm. just went horribly wrong. Didn't people took your money and scam and you mm -hmm. didn't get anywhere. And emotionally it was totally destroyed, right? You you couldn't yeah. make progress. Yeah. And so this is the thing is parents, you are the victim of the abuse. And unfortunately it put you in a vulnerable position. There's a lot of people are out there to get you. Everyone were out there wanting to, to make money out of you. They they want to get rich out of you, out of your pain. And so I know that when you're desperate, you wanted to do anything and you were willing Correct. to give up the shirt off your back. You don't care. You know, mm -hmm. you, you everyone go broke. You, you're willing to do anything to get your children back. So I know that it put you in a very vulnerable position. So be extremely careful with who you know, get involved with. And that's why, like, if you can find a support network, find parents that are going through things like you are right now, it's a first place, a good place, because parents share experiences and connection and things like that. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to notice when people that are truly good, they would not have to go and solicitate you. You know, yeah. people that go and sell you and say, hey, I, you know, pay me, I can get your children back. Those are usually not the expert because the expert are so busy. You have to go and reach to them, not the other way around. If they are yeah. going up to you and go and bragging about, hey, come to me. I'm a coach. I'm a lawyer. I'm a whatever expert. Those people, I'm, I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but a lot of the time that's actually a red flag. That's actually a sign that you should be careful. So just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so, so yeah. How do you feel today now in your mental state? Do you feel stronger? Do you feel you recover or are you still not, like not still full hurt? not fully recover? You know, I still feel hurt, you know, it's just still like, like nightmare for me. It's uh, especially on that night when I lost my kids. I I sometimes I regret it. I wish I should fight back so I never have that kids out for me, right? But I didn't fight back at the time, right? It's really, really, uh, uh, I regret that situation. I should fight back, but that's already happened. I got my kids now. And then another thing I want to mention, I guess, when the CPS came, I remember like uh, in January early, they want to talk with my kids. But luckily, I have my, uh, my, my lawyer uh, sitting with me in my home. You know, because I invited my, my lawyer also come just in case, right? And my lawyer uh, talked to the CPS officer that, uh, no, it's not necessary to speak with the kids because they've been uh, 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 alienated by the other parent. So the CPS officer understand maybe because the officer met with the lawyer, not with me, but maybe if just me at home at the time without my lawyer, the CPS officer might talk with the kids. I, I, because I don't know the law, I don't know anything, right? But luckily, my my lawyer prevent the CPS lawyer to speak with my kids. I don't know if the CPS officer speak with my kids. Maybe gonna be a different story, yeah, because uh, they've been so, alienated. Yeah. So your children were alienated. How are they now? They live with you. Are they still behave like alienated children? Yes, yes. There's another challenge that I have right now. They feel like I'm the enemy. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's another aspect. So you, you, even though you physically got the children back, mm -hmm. you uh, emotionally you haven't been able to rebuild your relationship with your children yet. So, um, uh, Jay, just hold off for a second. Sorry, we're gonna finish up with Jaka and then we'll get to your stories shortly. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so we, um, we're going to, we're going to have to, um, so we have had multiple interview on victim to heroes that talking about how to rebuild relationship with your children, mm -hmm. uh, with your alienated children, because they are mm -hmm. very different than normal children, right? And yes. um, a lot of people don't understand that. And people will say, oh, it's just children, they're growing up or they're teenagers. No, 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 that's not it at all. Nothing like that. Alienation mm -hmm. is a completely different set of problem. Um, you have the benefit that the children are not 
directly being controlled, like living with the alienator right now. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of opportunity to rebuild this. So don't give up yet. And I can understand why you're still feeling this way, like you feel still yes. feeling hurt. Um, mm -hmm. One is that it, targeted parents tend to kick, like, like, you know, really put a lot of guilt on themselves. You, you still look back at that day and said, oh, I should have fight harder for my children that day. You know, they beat me up and they left me to die. I should have fight harder. That's the thing is that you don't even realize, you don't even recognize you were the victim. You were beaten up. Like, like you don't even see like how ridiculous that is that you put guilt on yourself. You know, every blame should be on the abuser and that's not you. You should, because you have to forgive yourself first. Because if you, and then parents, I know you do this all the time. Parents always go, oh, I wish I didn't take that phone away because the moment I took that phone away, that's when the children left me. No, no, it's not that phone that, you know, it's not you. The abuser have done whatever they have done that create that situation. You're doing the best you can. So letting go of the guilt is very important. So I hope you can, can look at that and let go of that guilt because you did an incredible job. And despite all that pain and that trauma that you're still experiencing today, you did everything you could to get the children back. And despite the fact that your children still treating you really poorly right now, you're not mm -hmm. giving up. That's like, that's so much to be proud of. Give yourself a pat in the back, definitely get the support that you need, and then look into um, rebuilding relationship because that's really, really important and you can because you have the children right now, you can rebuild that relationship. Don't give up that hope. Um, it, it's tough, but don't give up that hope. And there are tools out there. So like, yeah, like I said, I interview a lot of people. So look into that because we, we talk a lot about that as well. Um, so yeah, but thank you so much for being here thank today. You. Really, really appreciate you. Is there anything else that you want to add before we go? Uh, no, thank, thank you so much for the time. And I wish maybe next time we can talk further uh, with uh, uh, about the alienation, I need help on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, we we've yeah. done a lot of things on um, alienation side of things. Mm -hmm. um, I saw Samantha said thank you deeply for reminding us that some of the consequences we face are from the bad things happening to us, and not because of a mistake or lack of perfection. Um, you're you're a human being. You're doing your best. Like it's ridiculous that when you're the victim of abuse and you turn it around and blame yourself. Uh, it, it should all be directed at the abuser. Um, Desiree said he's a super trooper dad. Keep going and you go, give us all hope to the future. So really seriously, Jack, your story gives so much hope for many people out there. You fought yeah. and you got your children back. I mean, that's incredible. And now you still have a road ahead to rebuild that relationship with your children, but you have them back and they stay with you and despite you were beaten up and left to die. You didn't give up. That is so incredible, so admirable. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, thank I really you. appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rayo, did you wanted to say something before Jake? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna pop in again with that friendly reminder to, to go to heroesforchildrensrights.org and copy the template and send that out to your legislators and criminal justice officials and to go to the voter voice and get the White House those emails so that we can spread the awareness to stop this crime. Thank you. Thank you. Claudia, did you want to add something? Yeah, hi, Jaka. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. It was very touching. Um, I also wanted to point it out that on the voter voice, some um, some parents, when they send it off, their senator or house reps do restrict the limit of wording that's in the message. So just keep that in mind. If you do get some type of error message, you might need to delete some of the information so that it can go through. So we, we've heard from parents about that, but that's just the way that the house representatives or your senators or federal representatives are, their, their email system is set up. So if you need to delete some of that message, please do, and then you can still set, uh, submit it forward. And so we apologize for the little hiccup. That was something we weren't aware of earlier. But please please continue to share. These, these uh, stories are very touching. Um, these parents, are their, their strength is amazing. Um, I'm here trying to you know, keep myself together because um, some of these parents I've talked to personally, and 
Uh, it's amazing what they do, and I'm so happy that they're here. I know this is a uh, an awareness campaign, and if you can continue to share, um, a lot of this word will get out, and more parents will get more involved in what they can do versus all these delays that uh, we often face um, can be kind of over. Um, we can overcome those uh, and working together. But uh, thanks again for doing this, and um, we have a few more to go. But uh, I appreciate you being here and, and hanging in. I know it's been pretty lengthy, but thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. And um, like she said, please stay tuned because we have Jay and then we're going to have Randall, who is an advocate that has helped with these cases and many other cases. So he is going to have very, very important insight to share with you guys. So definitely stay tuned. And, and um, yeah. OK, so Jay, thank you so much for being back, um, be, being yeah. on here. Really appreciate you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, can you speak? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I wanted to me? check with the audience. Can yeah. you guys hear him okay? I think I can hear him okay, but let us know if you guys can hear him okay. Um, and then, yeah, Jay, thank you so much. So Jay is also a parent with, you know, not probably by now know what the situation is, but again, um, Samantha, thank you so much. She can hear, so that's good. All right, so I'm going to just let you introduce your situation when it started and, you know, what happened and things like that. Yeah, so I guess my case can go back to 2019 when uh, it's it had been one year since my divorce initiated, uh, and then there were multiple court orders, um, including the one that I had primary custody of the child. Uh, and then the, uh, there was also a court order that the child should not go out of Washington state. But um, we talk about this a lot. It's, it's probably theoretically, it's always the best to have both parents involved in the child's life. So I landed an agreement with the, with the child's mother that we're gonna see the child almost 50-50. And in that, um, in that legal document, the agreement, we, we had a very clear condition written there saying the child, a child can go to Korea for, or a foreign country for a three week summer vacation, but you have to return the child as scheduled. And if you don't follow that rule, then it's a ma major violation of the agreement, and it will give rise to a lot of civil and criminal um, uh, problems. Civil and criminal. Uh, criminal. I, I think that's the way they, the way it was worded. So it was. It could not have been clearer than that that you cannot just take out the child out of Washington State or the United States and then withhold it. Uh, but this clearly shows the fact that there is a, especially for certain countries, the system is not functioning very properly because the mother took the child for a three week vacation and then made this bold decision to go against the agreement, go against the law and withhold the child and see if she can, how much she can manipulate the system. So, um, Although the divorce was um, theoretic, uh, it, it was essentially completed in the United States because there was an agreement signed and both attorneys signed. Uh, and it was just awaiting for the judge to uh, put a signature there. But based on the, the strict regulations of the law, it was already in force. The, 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 uh, the agreement went into effect and the divorce was over. But she started another divorce in Korea, asking for custody, asking for more money. And this was after she asked for all the um, all the monies that we agreed upon. So she asked me to send all, all my assets to her because I gave up a lot of assets uh, to to be able to see. Right, the so you her. have you have so so I wanted to kind of make sure that we break it down and backtrack a little bit. So you have, uh, you, you've done really, you've done all the homework, you've done all the right thing. You've got a very clearly written custody order that specify and prevent 
this very thing to happen. Exactly. Right? You cannot check. You, you've done all the right things, it's all written. And then she blatantly, just outrageously, just go completely against all that and have think that she's above the law, all the law, and just exactly. took the child to Korea, even though it's spelled out clearly. Yeah, we know that you might do that. And when you do that, this this is a criminal offense, and it's also a civil violation, etc. She go, I'm gonna do it anyway, and she did. So she yes. took your child to Korea and then never give him back. Yeah, exactly. So that's the significance of the problem because each case is a tragedy. Oh. Each case is a tragedy, and each case has unique problems and their own stories, and they're all serious problems. But the uh, the insight that this my specific case gives to ourselves is even if you know everything uh, in hindsight, if you do everything the right way, can it be prevented? In certain cases, the answer is no, because I, I had both attorneys sign everything. She went to Korea. She tried to uh, dis dismiss, fire her attorney in the United States so that she can get no court order served or court uh, litigation served. And then she started everything. Uh, she wanted a fresh new start on a fresh, uh, so a blank slate in Korea with all new, <laughs> all new evidences, false evidences. But she learned through the process how to manipulate the system. Oh, since this didn't work, let's try this and I'll make up more false evidences and we'll claim this. So, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, so hold on. So, um... She, okay, so she, and that's the thing, right? You're dealing with an abuser. So, you know, there's nothing is foolproof. Abusive people will figure out way and will, they will try to do things. And you try your best to prevent things, but she went ahead and did it anyway. But anyway, so she went to Korea. Korea should not have jurisdiction on the case, right? Because you guys were living in the US. So just okay. to clarify, the way the law works is because even my attorney asked this really important question, isn't Hague Convention about jurisdiction? In part it is, but the reality is until the child is back, the jurisdiction is in that country and the country decides with our law, are we gonna return the child so that the child can be treated properly by the right jurisdiction? So in a way, Till that happens, till the enforcement happens and the child is on American soil, uh, it's under Korea's law. So, And then uh, you, you mentioned that she falsified information. What kind of false allegation was there against you? Uh, I don't want to go into details because um, she's, she's uh, stalking me online. So she'll probably be able to see this. And then I don't want this to be misused in any other way. So I, I want to keep the focus okay. on the child. But there were a lot of okay. false allegations about uh, abuse from me. Uh, none of the arguments were substantiated. And it was actually, uh, the case was actually reversed because there were a lot of overwhelming evidence that I was, I was the victim of uh, her abuse, and I just let all those things go, and um, I, I landed an agreement. I forgave her, and then lots of other false allegations happened in Korea, just as a way of threatening me to enter Korea and take the child because uh, once you land there. There's first of all, there's prejudice uh, as a guy. I don't want to make this sound like it's a gender problem, but uh, we can't deny that there, there's a certain element to that. So, especially in certain countries like Korea. So, so yeah. Um, sorry, somebody was calling. Yeah, do you have but, to go? Um, I'll be okay for time? a little bit, but let me just wrap things up. So, Okay. She did go there and she made, she basically what, what it comes down to is the more noise and trouble uh, issues that she makes up, she stirs up there, it, everything gets delayed and it, everything gets messy and it, it clouds the fact that she committed a child abduction.
a kidnap. She's a criminal here, a criminal suspect. Both she's charged by Washington state and both the federal government. But when US government officials were trying to re uh, recover the child, Korean police said, well, this is not a, um, this is not a criminal matter. This is civil matter in our country. So he will have to go through the court to resolve it through civil law. But the civil law doesn't have mechanisms to return the child. So I have eight court orders, including a Supreme Court order in Korea that says you have to return the child. And I did everything I could. Uh, I just went ahead and tried to prove how far I have to go. and. Even after all those steps that I had to follow through, the child still doesn't return. I had to prove it myself by spending four years and um, incredible amount of money and pain and uh, resilience and patience. And even after that, what happened was the enforcement officer that was appointed by the court went to the child and asked the child, hey, do you want to go to dad or do you want to stay here with mom? And it's a cruel question. You don't ask that kind of question to a six-year-old boy who hasn't seen his dad for two years. And think about the burden that the child will have. Imagine the child grows up and realizes that he lost his opportunity to be returned just because of his answer. And these government officials are asking this child that kind of questions. But the problem is most people, although in heart, when people learned about my story when they saw me because I was on a Korean TV show. A lot of people resonated with this story and they, they showed great support and they gave me so much encouragement. But when people just um, get to hear about this superficially, uh, people without knowing the core of the matter, it's very easy to think, oh, it's just like a family issue. Oh, they probably had some dispute and, oh, poor child, they should just reconcile. Why can't they talk to each other? Um, not knowing that we even landed an agreement, a clear agreement, and she's in violation. And that's why agreement cannot work. And there's no way to enforce things. And when people see that, people, it's very new to people. People don't know about the fact that Korea doesn't have an, an enforcement mechanism. So when people know that, I cannot enforce, the general assumption is that there must be a reason. Maybe he did something wrong and uh, maybe the police or government officials are not cooperative for that reason. It's very easy to think that way and not understand how deep the problems, uh, is, the problems are rooted. It's, it's the inherent system that is not working well. And slowly, a lot of people are recognizing the problem because it's not just international parental abduction situations. Even for domestic cases, people are learning the fact that there's no enforcement. So if one person, I think it's very similar to some countries, um, some Asian countries, uh, Korea, if you take the child away and you just decide not to show it to show the child to the other parent, there's nothing you can do. A lot of people, they're just, um, the law doesn't protect the, this, from, they don't prevent this from happening. There's no, uh, the, there's no safety, safety net. I'm so, so sorry. I, I, and I'm, I know you have to go, so I don't want to kind of like, ask too many questions, but I'm, I'm so grateful that you you come and share your story and it's an incredible amount of res resilience and how you just never give up and you push everywhere. And yet still today, you still haven't got your child back. This is yeah. because of someone that's just blatant, blatant, blatantly violating everything and believes that she's above the law. Yeah, thank you so much. And the way I, See my case is I'm not only helping my son Brian because uh, he has to come back. He 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 has a much better life with a much more stable, law-abiding parent like me. Um, but at the same time, he's a representation of the broken system. And if I've come this far for four years, and I, if I give up, the next person will have to go through another four years of process to prove that it doesn't work. So I'm at the front line. And I have to be the person that exposes this 
a flaw in the system, the problem that we have, and make that lead to uh, an actual solution. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much because you're fighting for all other children out there and you turn your pain into action. Instead of just giving up, you take action no matter what. So that's incredible, like right? that's so inspiring. And you mentioned about like putting that kind of pressure on a child and asking the child, oh, do you want to go and live with your dad and just abandon your mother? Like I've met those adult children who live with that guilt. I have met those and I, I know them really well and the kind of pain that they never ever forgive themselves for choosing, making a decision as three years old, five years old, six years old, like it's ridiculous, that kind of question to put on a child. And this is after you've gone through everywhere to the system, like gone through all this court system to prove that the right thing for this child is to be returned to you. And for them to just kind of blatantly ignore that, talking about a failure in a system. That's, um, I see a lot of thank you in the, in the chat room, you know, you're, you're an inspiration, Jay. Jay and um, yeah, this is a lot of yeah. And then Jennifer said, yeah, you you really never can ask a baby that kind of question. So yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to add before you go? Uh, I just want to appreciate everyone who's um, who's working so hard behind the scene. Um, even when we don't really recognize, we don't really know what's going on. There are so many people working on different aspects in our society. And um, I really want to appreciate you and uh, having me here. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate you. Thank you. And Thank yeah, you. please hold strong. Because yeah, we, we need people like you and you're going to get your son, your son back because he's very young. There's still so much ahead of him and you not giving up is so important to him. It's, uh, it's, it's really, yeah. Thank you. Claudia, you wanted to add something? So I just wanted to thank Jay for being here and sharing his experience. Wow. And, and you can just, you can feel your strength and, and what you're doing. And I follow it and share it as much as I possibly can. But thanks again for, for being here with us. Yeah, I think in the chat room, I know that um, um, I think um, there's a link in the chat room that share for the page that you have for him, right? Uh, get Brian back. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, bring back Brian. <laughs> bring back Brian, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, there's a link there in the chat room. Um, so parents, please check it out. Um, I'm sorry, it's, there's a lot of question, comments, so I miss it. Uh, so it's somewhere in the, in the chat, so just find it. Um, and then, uh, Jay, I will share with you the link to this video so that if there's any parents that have questions for you, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, like if you could respond to anybody that you think is appropriate uh, please i know that a lot of parents will have a uh, question that they wanted to ask you know because it really like it's crazy with your story of you know mexico canada uh you know yours a korean story we heard um indonesia and like these are not the only story these are just few that we highlight it's just insane the kind of but these are also very specific countries and specific situations we wanted to share with you because you wanted some specific advice or, or insight from these parents that have gone through it you know this is a plot this is a, the time and the place thank you so much jay thank you Rayo, do you want to add something before we get randall on yeah, I was going to say thank you to Jay and everybody being on, you know, the reason that we push to have this many interviews and we appreciate you traveling so far and being on all day until the wee hours of the morning. Um, but there's so many incidences that get worse and worse and worse when custodial interference isn't enforced. So bottom line, if if custodial interference interference laws that have been in the books for decades have been, would be enforced, a lot of these cases wouldn't be around. There would be some kind of consequence and it's important that we start educating the criminal justice system and, and speak out to our legislators. We've, speak, we've spoken to legislators who said it's not a problem in their county because they've never heard anybody tell them it's a problem. So those are the people to speak out and we made it so easy to go on Heroes 
um, for children's rights.org and just copy the template we put on there with all the facts and the data and the, you know, the plea for support to enforce this law. So if they can just send that out, go to the voter voice link and send it to the White House so we can get this message out. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, Claudia, you wanted to add something? Yeah, uh, just to, to, to kind of top off what um, Rael said, you know, share it with family and friends, because um, when these cases occur, this doesn't just impact the parent that's left behind. This impacts grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins. Uh, so just share it, ask them to fill it out, submit it. The, the more, the better. Um, we have quite a few that have been already been going through. Um, you know, and if the voter voice doesn't work, try the other option of copy and pasting the template. Uh, identifying who your state reps are and sending it off. You can also send it off to your local municipality, your, your city council, your mayor's office. Uh, we were successful in getting a interference with child custody uh, proclamation, official proclamation through the city of San Antonio. And um, it's, it's a first of its kind from my understanding, but it was very meaningful because the language that was read in the proclamation touches on everything that these parents have experienced um, and their stories. So we can play that again, or we can put it in, in the comments so that you could see it for yourself. It's just a two minute video, but when the mayor reads it, it really will, um, you know, it'll resonate with the experiences of what's happening when a child, um, parent-child relationship is interfered with. So again, if you can copy and paste the, the template from heroesforchildrensright.org, if it doesn't, if you can't do it today and do it tomorrow, that would be great. Um, again, First thing Monday morning when they open their emails, we want them to see these messages from parents from all over the United States and all over the, you know, if you have family in other states, send it off and we can get a lot of awareness. Again, this is our first annual. Um, we will only get better from here. Um, again, I did the proclamation in San Antonio. Does it mean that you can't do it? Um, it is April and it's Child Abuse Awareness Month and this is a form of, of child abuse and we're just we're just getting started. We really are. So I appreciate everyone that's been here so far. And um, if you have any questions, just send us a message and we'd be, um, we'd be happy to respond. Uh, but thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you guys. So we now have Randall. Hi, Randall. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Um, hi, Claudia. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Can you hear me? Yes, thank, thank you, Randall. Randall works with us all the time in meetings in all the states doing legislation. We talk on the daily. Thank you, Randall. You're welcome. Thank you. So these are really incredible advocates out there that work tirelessly. And I have to say, I need to point this out, is that none of us are getting paid doing any of this. Um, there's, there's no money at all. Like we still have to try to survive. What? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, still holding our normal job while we're still doing everything True. else. Um, so go ahead, Claudia. No, I, I agree. And um, a lot of it, this is very meaningful. And, and Randall and I talk about this all the time. We talked about it, I believe earlier today, um, a lot of our advocacy is because of the experience that we, what we had, what we went through, and it's become more of um, something personal uh, to us to help parents out, um, to prevent them from experiencing what we did. Um, some of the cases are, are more egregious than others, but um, the trauma, you know, is very similar. And so we, we've used this as our, our coping mechanism to make a difference and to change these obstacles that parents will face. And um, we want to, you know, help out any way we can. So again, we always talk about that, but yeah, Ryle's right. We, we always stay in touch with, with Rando and he's helped out a lot in, in different states. So thanks again, Rando, for being here. You're, you're welcome. And thanks, Ryle. Thank <laughs> okay. She's amazing. Thank you to all of you. I mean, the, the, the world is better because of what each and every one of us is doing and um, and how we're helping other parents to duplicate what we're doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so let's go into your um, 
I guess, portion of this event. Now, I know you were involved in all of these cases. You helped yeah. these parents recover their children, fight their children, fight for their cases. Yeah. Um, so before we go into the general information about what parents should do or can do different, different kind of resources, let's touch a little bit on these specific cases. Um, if you wanted to add a little bit in each of these, I mean, we, we talked to each of these parents, but sure. you, uh, you were involved and you held their hand through the process on the side, you know, yeah. each of these cases, is there something that you wanted to share? Uh, yeah, we can. Um, I get, I'll start with Jaka's case. Um, when, when Jaka found me, the organization that I had co-founded before Shine the Light, Jaka could not handle too much. And I heard him out. Um, I actually heard some new pieces even today that I think I probably forgot. Um, but I, I had him do one thing at a time. We, we like to say we come alongside. We're here to empower. And with Jaka, he could handle one thing. I gave him one task. That was to go to his local police station with where he lived. He had a court order. It said sole custody. Um, I call them three aces. If you have a demand to return the children, if you have sole custody, and if you can get a... Uh, a police incident report and Claudia has helped me to understand we need a felony police incident report. Those three things are like the ACE cards that that will help to facilitate. It's not the golden ticket, but if we can get those three tools and we talk a lot about a tool bag, um, if we can get those tools in our bag, we can work to diligently try to reunify. And, and every child abduction, be it domestic and specifically internationally, is going to originate somewhere. And so from a, and, and I'll, I'll just add this and we'll, we'll hit on some of the other cases, there's going to be what we call in a criminal sense, a point of incident. So in Jaka's case, what was really unique, really remarkable, was that the point of incident was over in Indonesia. It wasn't here. There was no reason under the sun that that Harris County, Texas Sheriff's Office should have given him an incident report. There was no reason. They shouldn't have, you know, in, in rational sense, it, it just didn't make sense. But I had Jacka start there because if there's other moves, it's a chess game always. And, and there's always a move. It, it's, it's just in some of these moves, and that didn't cost him any money. He just had to go do it. And the door opened. When the door opened, he had the other three, two pieces then it was off to the FBI. And the FBI taught us a new model in that they didn't file federal charges. They worked with a legat in an embassy, our US embassy in Indonesia, and they would, they would facilitate a communication with the mother that helped to facilitate the return. Um, at that point, there were no criminal charges. It was still an investigation stage. Right. I um, wanted to point out, though, I wanted to kind of highlight um, yes. a very important aspect there where, um, so Jaka was beaten up and, you know, in Indonesia, completely blindsided, never realized that there was any marital problem, let alone his children were going to be abducted. Now he's got beaten up, left to die, come back emotionally he was completely destroyed he was he lost distraught. His yeah, yeah and he he actually blamed himself he felt he guilty for not yeah. fighting more for his children even though he yeah. injured and ended up in the hospital so he's emotionally was destroyed and so i just want to point out 
how important is your work where you were there holding his hand yeah. and you you understood the trauma that he went through yeah. and you 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 made it easy for him by okay. saying let's just focus on one thing at a time That's and it. this is a priority yeah yeah That's so yeah he he'll, he'll forgive me for saying he was a basket case he just could not move and that happens a lot we've all been there or and there's a lot of times too we'll talk about a roller coaster you're going to have highs and lows in these situations and it's about what i call to staying in the game you've got to stay in the game if you're gonna see light at the end of that tunnel you got to stay in the game so many parents will just give up and not stay in the game and again you can stay in the game sometimes it doesn't we're so focused on money in our society it's not always about the money um it's about literally trying to do something it may not be this week it might not be next month but if you're moving forward to that you've got a shot and and yeah we 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 uh I mean, and I, with Jaka, Jaka, I think has called me almost every day since, literally. And there's times he needs, he needs to hear my voice and he'll say that, or he'll call and just see how I'm doing. It, we're family and family takes care of each other in the good and the bad, in the, in the happy and, and, um, you know, but that yeah. then we would start moving, you know, he was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And right. I and, mean, and I think that we see that a lot with parents yeah. is, is devastating. I mean, what else oh, totally. more, could be more devastating than losing your children? Yeah. So if we understand parents, we do understand that you might be devastated and you might feel like giving up and and you might feel like you just but it doesn't matter how small the step that you take to exactly. one foot in front of another, yeah. another, just yeah. doesn't matter. You know, there are days that it just right. seems like it's a tiny little thing. Yeah. And then someday you feel a bit better and, and you, but if you can just yeah. keep the momentum going, like what oh, Randall yeah. just stay in yeah. the game, then, yeah. you know, there are days that you will feel so much stronger. And, and again, I can't, just not emphasize the need of building a network of a, a support sure. system around you. It's yeah. so important. It is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the, in in uh, and I'll just add this. I, I went through a house fire in 06 and my banker at that point, the my kids were just uh, six and four and a half at that point. Um, she she told me to take baby steps because everything pretty much was lost and just take baby steps. And it's in, in helping parents and going through what I've gone through, it's those stepping stones, those building blocks that help me to keep moving too. Because it, it just takes increments. Um, a lot of times th there'll be, there's a dad from Chicago. It's a story you're not aware of, but I'll just add this. The, the other week he called just to update his case. And he's like, you know, I just, I listened to what you said to do. I went and did it, put my head down, kept going. He didn't look back. And in his case, it was pretty much legal. And I pointed him in direction of an attorney in the country he was facing the abduction and um and and it took almost two years but he was able to reunite um i know we're i don't know if we're pressed for time but uh how about if we look at jp's case a moment okay please okay yeah, go ahead um, oh sorry i just wanted to mention claudia oh, no mentioned problem. in the chat room um she said my children may be watching so know that i love you and i'm always thinking of you both and helping these parents has helped me yeah 
Yeah. And and JP said Randy is is a rock star, and seriously, you 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 truly are a rock star. We we so grateful for you, uh, you, for helping so many parents out there. Um, and yeah, I'm grateful to Claudia. I'm grateful to Rayal. You guys are incredible to have. Like I'm I'm so grateful to have this partner in this journey because really you guys made a huge difference and you guys all empower me. You know, so really thank you. Well, you're empowering us, Petra. And I, you just add this, I mean, I don't know your, your whole story, but I've done a little digging over the last week. I was, I was blown away. If, if anybody goes to the victim to hero page, check out the other groups in there you got a lot of groups in there and they're it's focused on different aspects of this issue and it's not just the united states and i know she's alluded to that today uh, but you had a page to canada and <laughs> canada parents have a much more difficult challenge than we as Americans. And I have a heart for those parents. My kids were taken to Canada. At the same token, I've helped to mentor a group in Canada as well. It's, they're mirroring this same pattern to help parents empower them. And, and, but Petra, I didn't even know that. I didn't know you had those subgroups and there's resources available. Uh, nine years ago, when I started to really advocate, but let me back up my, you know, just add this real quick. My kids were taken in 2012. It took me 18 months to find another parent like me going through the same thing. I hope a parent doesn't have to wait that long anymore in that there's enough messaging out here that something's going to trigger and in a good sense, and they're going like, holy crap, here's somebody else going through what I'm going through. And, and we're here to help the parent. We're here to empower them. And um, so, excuse me, just a moment. Um, <clears throat> uh, Rael, I think, yeah. Rael, you were going to say something? Oh, that's so sweet. I saw Desiree said Petra has pulled me through some of my darkest times. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I saw. I was yeah, just going to jump in and, and yes, yeah, sending, you know, sharing the same thing for sure. I was just so lucky to sort of fall into this and, and to learn from you. And it is amazing. And no one knows the kind of stuff that you're going through to right. do all this work in all the other realms all the stuff behind the scenes is is yeah. is really unbelievable i don't it is. you know i thought it was hard to keep up with claudia and it's you know impossible to keep up with you but you well, know you keep soaring and you and you left us here with this job and, and we're doing our best to uh yeah. fulfill it but i you know i i'm personally internally grateful eternally grateful yeah. for you know just yeah. welcoming me through and, all this and, and thank you. i am too i mean for our organization for our parents and more importantly for the kids and the awareness will help the children and and just a few thoughts there too so parents understand uh, and i'll focus to to the united states we have american children held in 115 nations around the world according to the u.s state department um, there, this law, this crime's been on the books for over 40 years. And the State Department estimates about 1,200 
cases a year. Now that fluctuates up and down. There's another organization that that has spoken of numbers. They're, they're hesitant to put them in writing, but this was in 2014 and they estimated 70,000 cases a year. Um, again, the data, the true data is really hard to come by. But even if we take the 1,200 cases times 40 years, that's 40,000 plus children. It's the size of a city, a, a medium-sized city in the United States that's just disappeared from our demographics of humanity. It's a, it, it's a crime and it's, it's lives. And today you focused on those lives, those children and what, what, what I've heard over the last few hours. And, and um, there is a cost and um, parents um, that, parents that stay in the game, parents that keep fighting are true warriors for their kids. And uh, just to add that, um, if you don't mind, I'll circle back to JP. So it's just one second. Um, oh, go, you go ahead. The... Yeah, you probably want yeah. to catch. Yeah, sorry. No, I just wanted to insert something because you mentioned about yeah. the number. Um, I do yeah. want to mention that we've, we've been working on um, this particular study uh, and Claudia and Gael and the team has been amazing uh, in filing for public information requests um, because what we're trying to do is to do a study on interference of child custody and kind of get some numbers. Uh, I apologize that I just been having a lot of things going on, but as soon as I can, um, I'm going to work on doing the analysis for it. We have some uh, certain idea for the model of the analysis, sure. but um, we are looking to publish that in a peer review scientific, like academic journal, um, because this is a big problem. And I don't think anybody recognized that we had a legislator right. come on today and said, I don't yeah. know what the number is. We have a sheriff yeah. officer who have been in the yeah. law enforcement for 29 years and, and said, I don't know what the number, right? People, these are the people that should know how big the sure. problem is. And, and and it's not their fault that they don't know no. but so so yeah so i i really the team has been working so hard like a lot of stuff you see out there but there's a lot of things behind the scene and they've been trying to collect a lot of different data um so so yeah so we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get that study out soon um we, we have to analyze the number a bit and we need to get a little bit more of data but i just wanted to add that but the number is huge so for example san, san antonio the city of San Antonio, because I think someone earlier I, I said, uh, I heard he mentioned, he thinks that it has to be thousands of cases a year. Well, San Antonio is one city in the state of Texas, and there's a thousand cases a month, a thousand calls a month to do with interference of child custody, a month in one city. So talking about in the whole country, yeah. massive number. Yeah. So I just wanted yeah. to bring that up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please go ahead and go back oh, to okay. JP. Okay. So um, JP's case is extremely complicated. The focus is his son and where his son is, we don't know. I wish we did know. I wish, I wish that he has been recovered by now, alive. And, uh, and, and I'll, Claudia asked me earlier today to, and I, I've got to be real here. Um, you know, is there a concern for his life? Absolutely. And this is, this is what we deal with literally in every case but some situations are more severe than others. And um, what I would say is um, if, if the mother's watching this, please turn yourself in, please. Um, she knows who I am. I've had conversations with her and, um, and, and um, 
it's time to humble yourself. And every abductor will get to a point where they have to humble one way or the other. And um, I've seen it over and over. And but the children matter. And I I'm not I'm probably a little I'm a little hesitant to go into some specifics. Um, but but that cry for his life, he matters and he deserves both parents in his life. And and um, this has gone on for way too long, way too long. And um, um, you talk to Maggie. What hope? What hope? Um, you know, we met her kind of in the chaos and again, came alongside. She had a lot of questions and the Hague hearing happened quickly after we met her about a month. And um, I'd ask her how the hearing went. And she'd share it with me. And of course, she had to wait for a decision. Um, and, and, and the going back there was the focus of the hearing. What did Maggie share about? What did dad share about? And there was a difference. And Maggie was focused on her son in that discussion, in that hearing. Of course, the habitual residence was a, it's always a key question. Um, and she got an award to return her son, which was the appropriate decision made by a judge. And thankfully, the father complied. They, they don't always, parents don't always comply, as in Jay's case. Um, and, um, and speaking of Jay, Jay has been resilient. Um, beyond words, beyond words. Um, we have had hours hundreds of hours of conversation. And um, he has been able to be creative using his talents and abilities, first with his love for fly fishing and turning that experience and what, ex and, and the, and the, uh, experience he had with his son before he was taken he had a lot of footage and he's blended that together uh to incorporate his son focus on his son it's about the kids but blend that together to end up with an award-winning mini movie that just recently orvis sponsored on their own website Orvis, you never know, you never know. Um, and, and, and that using those tools, using that ability really has come almost after midway through the last four years. It wasn't in the front part. It's been from about 21, the, the fall of 21 to now. Creative application of how we can express our love for our kids that someday Brian's going to know. He's going to know what his dad has done for him because he matters, because he loves him. And I'm, I'm praying my kids can see what I'm doing for them because they are loved beyond measure. 
and hence shine the light for abducted children. Thank you so much. And actually, it's a perfect time to bring back the, the attention on your organization, which is Shine the Light for Abducted Children. So um, let's talk about that. Um, what kind of things do you guys do? And then um, let's talk a little bit. I know that you don't want to go into too much specific. And also, uh, there's certain things that are different for each cases. But let's talk about what are the things that parent, resources that parents should be aware of and, you know, things that they can add into their tool bag. Oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, um, we empower parents with respects to domestic and international child abduction. That framework. Uh, we offer a safe, welcoming, collective community of leaders and parent support. And, and supporting parents that are facing prevention concerns, but at the same token, we offer that love when a child's been abducted. If we can prevent, that's what we'd like to do. And there are some tools that our government has available and we put them to use if, if applicable. And there's a framework legally that that requires us to take a look at the court docs and and we decide again we're not lawyers but we can decipher we do have lawyers that we do consult with a lot of times parents will have their lawyers too um you know a variety of things uh, in a case recently um i didn't see the language i needed but another family member said well did you look at this it was a minute order did you look at this minute order the minute order had the language i was looking for to help help us prevent um or at least attempt to prevent um the tool bag so the tool bag is could involve your court orders uh police incident reports. Um, it, it could involve other professionals, stakeholders, politicians, state and federal politicians. If we're, we're dealing with a uh, international abduction, it's important to recognize that the legislatures, when I say politicians, legislatures, senators and congressmen, in your district where you live, they are there to serve you as a constituent. And they're there to help unblock a roadblock federally. Um, in that this is a federal crime, if, if, if we can't get the help of the FBI, they have the means by which to contact them and tried to get the ball rolling. In Jocka's case, I actually, uh, it was the same time Jocka's case was going on, or uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm blending that, bear with me. In, in a case prior to Jocka's case, I literally sat next to a congressman who told the FBI, I know what you can do, now go figure it out. And that was to bring some kids out of a Middle Eastern country. They got it done. And they got it done by using a jet. They literally put the parent on a jet and they flew to the Middle Eastern country that sat right next to the one where the kids were. And they had facilitated a way to bring those kids out. American children. They can do it in that case, they could do it in others. The model is there. And, and um, but tools, it, it, again, it could be something small, it could be something large, we just don't know. And it deep, a lot of times we find out pieces to help a parent by literally continue to have that conversation. I don't learn everything in the first conversation. I don't learn it in the second. It could be the 15th conversation. Um, 
until we until we uh, we we stumble on something or we connect a piece um, to dot together. Um, I see you put uh, the National Center up here. They are a tool. Um, they are a tool that helps in if 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 uh, you've got your court orders and if you have sole custody, you may have the law enforcement involved. They're going to be able to help with a poster, maybe with a video. Uh, they do have a support team that helps some parents, some cases. Um, they're, they're Parameters of help have gotten a little bit more stringent. Uh, we had a parent turned down last week. It is what it is. Uh, they're their own organization. Where they become very helpful is in the closing of a case, especially the international cases. They can help parents with travel expense and counseling for the parent and the child. So we have that resource person that we recommend to a parent to bring that piece together. And, and you know, then we hear back from the parents going, that was awesome because they wrote me a check for this or that. And you know, where the parent thought they were gonna have to foot that bill. Um, as, as a parent going through this, we used to call ourselves starving parents because sometimes you do. You, I, I, there was a period I, I lived on $25 a week for food. That was it. That's what I had to do. Um, but we got through it. And there were times too where other people were helping out so that I could keep going. And, um, but that being said, uh, is that helpful? Um, it is very helpful. Thank you so okay. much, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to mention to uh, let me just it, which is critical um, travel.state.gov travel.state.gov will link parents to uh, the uh, consular affairs page and they have a tab there for international parental child abduction. There's a lot of resources there, including tools for parents, for lawyers. Uh, there's, there's a country uh, module. So if it's a country where your children have been taken to, it's going to give you um, kind of some stats in regards to that country. Strangely enough, too, another great tool is actually the CIA website. Um, and then we also have U.S. Custom Border Protection with respects to uh, preventing child abduction. Uh, the CIA website actually has fact books, what we call fact books on countries, and those become very helpful in understanding fact book. Yep. Mm -hmm. In understanding, literally, um, you know, real action, what's happening in that country. Um, and, and that becomes very helpful as well in preventing abductions, uh, which does remind me too, we have given testimony in courtrooms and we do that as well um, and have been recognized as an authority on the issue. It's vast, but it's it's vast, but the unique thing too, every case has a lot of similarities, and then it all each case has its little nuances too. So and and a lot of that is really comes back to the psychological um, makeup of a case and and um, the profile is typically pretty similar. And um, and we can work with that. 
Thank you so much. I mean, that's incredible. Like, I'm so grateful for the work that you have done and continue to do. Thank um, you. And going beyond your pain to do this for other people. And that's so empowering. It and is. then um, the specific actions um, and tools that you just share is really, really helpful. Um, I think that we will post some of these links uh, later on. And there are actually more tools and, and more information that we wanted to really share publicly because at the same time, we also don't want to provide a blueprint for the abuser to be able to misuse the information. So when you do need specific help, uh, definitely reach out because we, we have more things that we wanted to say, but we are not going to say it right now in the public. Yeah. Um, yeah. Claudia, you wanted to say something. No, I, I just wanted to say thank you, Randy. Um, You're welcome. It's been an honor meeting with you and working with you. I've learned so much, um, you know, uh, working alongside you and meeting some of these amazing parents. So I, I thank you again for joining us. And this is just one of many. We know we're going to keep working together and Absolutely. keep helping parents. And um, uh, again, I appreciate it. And, and, and I appreciate you. You've taught me a lot. Um, I met Claudia through another parent who was having a problem with law enforcement. Uh, her knowledge was beyond mine. And, and I watched and listened and I'm still watching and listening and learning. Yeah. And uh, when we helped to bring those kids home yeah. because of, in part, in part because of what Claudia did, that helped, it brought some pressure. And that was the law enforcement piece. The other part of that was a good lawyer in a foreign country and a judge that got it. I mean, the, the, the Hague return can be short or they can be long. That one was almost 67 pages long and the judge had it from page one, knew exactly what was going on. And, and, um, and, and Claudia, I'll add this. You wanted, you wanted, to re, wanted me to remind, I guess, Claudia asked me this week, you know, not to forget this, um, you know, how do I get through this? Faith? family and helping others mm -hmm. those three things and and you know i you know there's no doubt parents are watching this you know whatever wherever you are in a faith walk we serve parents in all sorts of faith walks and and we love you and and have your friends have that circle of a network of people that can empower you, encourage you, and help you move forward, and and then start helping others if you can. Um, you know, Jay's helping others, Jaka's helping others, Maggie's helping others, and they're all at different spots in their own situations, but they're learning that to help others helps them in the journey, too. Thank you so much, Randall. Thank you. Really, really appreciate you. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank you. So we are now get to the final part of the program where I'm going to let Claudia and Rhea wrap this up. But I am curious, though, among the people are watching who are still here from the beginning. <laughs> really, like, can you comment and let me know? I'm curious if there's anybody that actually has started from the beginning and still here. Uh, because you guys should win an award. <laughs> Seriously, we've been going for six hours. It's now 7 a.m. my time. It started at 1 a.m. So six hours. The light has, the sun has came out. It was dark when I was started. Uh, oh, Samantha. Oh my gosh. I'm serious, Samantha. I want you to message me uh, and give me your address because I want to send you something. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, Mikey. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, leave it to Claudia and Rayel, and I will jump on right at the end to say goodbye. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody, everyone that's watched, whether it's, it was in small segments. I know this was a really lengthy um, event, but if you shared the event and you uh, gave us a couple of minutes of your time today, um, we appreciate your, your help. Um, Ryle will likely share uh, more information on what you can do to 
copy and paste our template and who to send it off to. Um, but um, if you can just give us two minutes of your time and she, if she can play the video, that would be super helpful just to hear some of the words that this mayor um, uh, spoke um, spoke yesterday in um, the city council to uh, declare um, April 8th um, interference with child custody awareness day here in San Antonio. And again, um, I did this just to see if it would, it was possible and it, and it was. And when I heard that they were going to recognize the day, it was very touching and meaningful here uh, because this is, is my hometown. Uh, this is where I experienced um, custodial interference. And um, this is where I've been pushing the movement from. So if we can share the video, that'd be great. If not, we can put the link in the chat or in the comments or you can follow us on the Interference Child Custody Coalition page and where we share a lot of the information. Um, again, this is an event that was recorded and, and will be available to you if you want to um, watch it later, or watch the segments later. Again, thanks again for joining us and uh, I'll, I'll just leave it up to Rael. Um, I do want to remind everybody there are events coming up. Um, April 25th, it's Parental Alienation Awareness Day. There is um, Operation Proclamation that's going on. So if you haven't requested your proclamation, that's something that um, you can also do. And then there's also, so also April 26th, what's International Shared Parenting Day. And there's also another event that I was made aware of. It's June 16th. Um, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an event that's being supported by Pro Se Dad, another organization that does amazing things. Uh, it's uh, National Modification Day. So just keep that in mind and we'll share a lot of that on our page. Hi, sorry. Yes, I'm gonna share that. Um, and then I actually just thought of something else. So let me pull this up first. Where is it? That's why I stopped sharing. And my dogs, of course, are barking. <laughs> As always. Um, here it is. Um, this was another parent that we spoke to earlier today. So I'm just gonna put up that poster. Uh, share. Share system audio. Okay. You're on mute. Is it still uploading? I'm not seeing the screen. Me neither. It just says it's started screen sharing. Oh, oh how does this happen sometimes? Uh, <laughs> of course. I was talking. I was saying that this, let me, we were showing this um, poster. Can you guys see that? Oh, the one yes. that missing? Okay, yes. that was a parent in Pennsylvania. I had shared this whole thing, I'll say it again. Um, that, uh, you know, that these children were abducted from Pennsylvania three years ago. Um, they might be in the Maryland area. So if anybody has any information, you know, please reach out. There's a, a, a reward for that um, as well. Yeah, we share a lot of this on our page. So, you know, we put a lot of updates on there. So. You can always get it from our page and share it on other pages or with family and friends or um, with the Maryland community. But this is a, a case that's been going on for three years and, and we did talk to this parent. So it's a very touching story. But uh, like the other parents that were um, interviewed today, they, he has a, a, a very strong uh, fighting spirit. You know, that's, that's what we look for in, in, in parents that have gone through this. And so real quick recap, all this information will be posted, but for this awareness day, that is today for interference with child custody awareness day, please go to this page, you know, copy the template, send it off. You can find your penal codes at the page. You can find your, identify your representatives. Um, and, you know, we'll, if you could CC respectfully pack, we'll be sending, you know, reward prizes to the people that send the most, but they ask your family and friends and, and get the information out. And then we'll end with this. Can you guys hear it? Let's see. I have a proclamation no, I to read. Um, I still see the missing persons. You, 
but I can hear it. Oh, you heard it. <laughs> I, why won't this play for us? I can uh, hear it. I just can't see it. You have the missing um, child, children's flyer still up. Okay. Let's see, but I'm glad you could hear it. All right, let's try this. Okay, now. I have a proclamation to read. Um, can you hear that? Did you guys hear yeah. that? Yeah, but the video is too small. So, okay, there you go. Good. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. In addition to our child advocacy that uh, this month, excuse me, today, um, we're recognizing interference with child custody awareness. And I would like to read the following proclamation. Where Whereas Heroes for Children's Rights will observe Interference with Child Custody Awareness Day on April 8th, 2023 to promote public understanding of family violence through the use of a child and increase awareness of law enforcement to support the victims of this crime. And whereas custodial interference deprives children of the right to love and be loved by their whole family, resulting in negative social psychological impact on children. And as such, it is considered a form of child abuse and whereas trusted adults in a child's life, that includes doctors, therapists, teachers, school staff, coaches, and law enforcement, be willing to speak out and question alienating behaviors such as withholding and interfering with a parent-child relationship during their non-custodial time. And whereas child abuse and neglect can be reduced by making sure each family has a supported needs and raising the children in a safe, nurturing environment. And whereas during the month of April, Heroes for Children's Rights will be intensifying efforts to promote public understanding of family violence through the use of child and increase awareness of law enforcement to support the victims of this crime. Now, therefore, I, Ron Nuremberg, Mayor of the City of San Antonio, in recognition thereof, do hereby proclaim April 2023 to be Interference with Child Custody Awareness Day in San Antonio, Texas. I'm not sure if we have any representatives here, but again, um, wanted to make that known to us. It's awesome. Yeah. Very That's awesome. fabulous. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Yeah. It says okay. it all. <laughs> it does. It really does. Yeah. Okay. Well, is is there anything else that you guys want to add? Nope. We got 14 viewers left, but we had, a, I would say, a full 30 to 40 the whole six hours. So I thought it was amazing. So thank you so much for doing this. I know that you're tired and the, the, yeah. it, the time what there is. What do you mean? I'm I'm, I'm good. <laughs> morning. <laughs> it's early in the morning. What's the complaint? It's great. And um, but thank you so much. Like seriously, I'm I'm so grateful. Desiree said she wants she wants to cry. And Mikey said it is so great. It is really so great. And um, thank you, parents, so much for watching. Whether you're watching right now or whether you're watching it later or we're rewatching this, you know. Really, thank you so much for your strength because you are going through this and yet you still have so much strength to seek out for information, for knowledge, for help, you're not giving up. So really, 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 the clap is really for you guys to really celebrate you. You are like your love giving you so much strength, like your love for your children. So don't ever, ever give up that hope. Don't ever give up. Like you are much stronger than you ever realized. Um, so if you could please help also, to help other parents is to help share this video, share the story, share the information. Um, and definitely like, reach out to other people. You know, Claudia and Rael made it so much so easy. They already draft the information, they will have all the tools there for you guys. So you can either copy and paste that, or you know, if you wanted to just go and talk to people yourself, if you wanted to just tell your stories the way you want to tell it, if you wanted to write your own wordings, you know. Anything you do is going to help. And when you channel your pain to be outside of you, it empowers you, and you don't even know it. It's really empowered you. It helped you personally so much more than you could ever anticipate. So, you know, definitely try that. Um, and just know that you're not alone. You're not alone at all. And look at the strength of these parents and what they have gone through. And all these advocates that you are seeing here, they are not just born to do this and they're not getting paid to do this. They're doing this because they were those parents as well. They're doing this because they are fighting not just for their children, they're fighting 
for your children and for other children out there. So definitely, please help spread the word. Please take action. Please become one of us. <laughs> really, we need a lot more of us. We we need much more than an army to fix this problem. And I know it's hard. You know, you're already finding your own cases. So you know, sometimes just that itself is enough. Um, so anyway, thank you so much. And I will see you guys again soon. We have a lot of different events coming up. So, uh, and we're going to do Parental Alienation Awareness Day and, and many other things. So just keep an eye out. Um, but for now, I'm going to go and get some sleep. <laughs> I talk to you guys soon. A lot of thank luck to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Get some rest. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye, Ryan. Thank you. Bye, everybody.